This is Audible. Surviving the Evacuation, Book 10, The Last Candidate, written by Frank Tail, narrated by Tim Bruce. Prologue Statement of Authenticity Annette would describe this as a prologue. Kim would say it's an introduction. I prefer to call it a statement of authenticity. My name is Bartholomew Wright. The story I told about the events leading up to the first election on Anglesey wasn't the complete truth. It wasn't a lie, not exactly. But I withheld some key details in the hope of bringing unity to our fracturing community. Only time will tell whether that was a wise act or a tragic mistake. The truth should be told, the whole truth. And that is what this account is. I don't know when you are reading this, or where, for that matter. Perhaps it is only being read by Daisy, given to her by Annette as an apology for the world that she has inherited. Either way, I shall begin with a little explanation of who we were, and what had occurred in the run-up to the election. At the end of September, in the year of the outbreak, Kim and I travelled to Ireland, we went to investigate a walled fifty-acre farm called Elysium, built by the billionaire Lisa Kempton as an apocalyptic retreat. Our interest was in the solar panels, wind turbines, and other irreplaceable equipment Kempton had stored for her people. Kim and I didn't travel there alone. Will, Lilith, Simon, and Rob came with us. Rob killed the other three. He tried to kill Kim and me. He failed. We confronted him and he died. Rob had sunk our boat, and we'd lost our sat phone, so had no way of communicating with Anglesey, nor an easy way to return. We took refuge in a bungalow. As the number of zombies outside grew, we had no choice but to flee inland and north. As ever, our route was determined by where the undead were fewest. Almost by chance, we found another survivor. Phyllis O'Riordan, a local who'd returned to her family home. She was killing the undead, burying all that she slayed. I say we found her almost by chance because O'Riordan had been an employee of Kempton's and one of the occupants of Elysium, who'd fled when that refuge had been overrun. At the time, we didn't have any questions we wanted to ask O'Riordan, and she was too consumed by her own demons to come with us. We left her and continued north, making for a house in the village of Palace Kenry. We'd found the address on a list that Rob had taken from Elysium, and gone there out of sheer curiosity. We found the house empty, though a live-in guardian had previously occupied it. There were few clues as to his identity, but we believed he'd left when someone else arrived at the house. I think that someone else was Soraka Locke. Kempton's representative in Ireland, if not on Earth. From Palace Kenry, we headed the short distance to the Shannon Estuary and followed the coast east towards Limerick. We came to a long line of traffic, the occupants killed by some chemical weapon during the early days of the outbreak. We still don't know who was responsible, though either that location was chosen by accident or the real target was the warehouse a few miles further along the coast. The warehouse was a dummy, camouflage for the jetty that ran out into the estuary, at which was moored a giant yacht the size of a cruise ship called the New World. Ship, jetty, and warehouse all belonged to Kempton. The craft was another part of the billionaire's plans to survive the end of the world. Her plans failed. The only member of the crew still on board, Captain Tamika Keynes, was undead, but she'd kept a brief audio diary. Her crew had all left, seeking the sanctuary of Elysium. She'd also recorded that Soraka Locke had reached the ship, but left again, heading to Belfast. The last recording told us that another employee of Kempton's, Sue Dawson, had reached the ship, and it was in rescuing her that Captain Keynes had become infected. The New World 
at a small launch which came and I took north. Though we found a few unoccupied islands, we saw no one but the undead, until we saw smoke. We found other survivors, though arrived hours too late to save more. They were Colum, a boxer from Belfast, Dean, Lena and Callie, three teenagers he'd saved from that city, Siobhan, a police officer from the Irish Republic, and three children, Billy, Charlie and Tamara. With the extra weight, we no longer had the fuel to reach Anglesey, so we aimed for Malin Head. There had been a community there, one that Siobhan and Colum had quit, but which had had fuel and sailing ships. Malin Head had been abandoned. We followed the coast east, hoping to be spotted by a ship sailing from Anglesey to Svalbard. Almost out of food and fuel, we arrived in Belfast. A cruise ship had been sunk in the entrance to the harbour, so we took refuge on a container ship, the John Cabot, anchored just outside the city. We thought it was safe to go ashore to search for food and fuel. We thought we were alone in the city. We were wrong. There was one other person in Belfast, as dangerous and dark a soul as any I've ever met. Callie was shot and critically wounded. Though we managed to get her back to the John Cabot, we were unable to do much beyond extract the bullet and bandage the wound. Colum, Siobhan, Kim and I went back into the city. We weren't hunting for our ambusher, but hoping to find food, fuel or medical supplies. We split up, and I found the shooter. I killed her. We found the woman's lair in a warehouse bearing the same name as that of the building on the Shannon estuary. The woman had been stockpiling fuel, emptying every vehicle in the city simply to keep a generator running. She'd been killing every survivor who'd found their way to Belfast so she wouldn't have to share her food. Beneath the warehouse we found a fallout bunker. It was a small affair with room for a handful of people, but we found a book, a journal of a sort. In it were the words, I am Soraka Locke. After that, the line, I am alone, had been copied over and over on every page. We also found a photograph of a group of ten women and two men dressed in ball gowns and suits. In the middle was Lisa Kempton. The captain of the ship, Tamika Keynes, was at her side. Behind her was O'Riordan, the woman we'd found digging graves in the southwest of Ireland. Also in the picture was the woman who'd shot Callie. There was enough fuel for the launch to reach Anglesey. Kim set out alone. A few hours later, our rescue appeared in the form of a giant icebreaker, the Amundsen. Kim hadn't needed to depart, because help was already coming to us. Lisa Kempton had her own satellite network. Sholto had gained access to it years before and regained access soon after we arrived on Anglesey. We'd used those satellites to reconnoiter Elysium before our trip, though we'd failed to spot the undead lurking within the farm's walls. Sholto had redeployed the satellites over Ireland, and the life raft we'd been using to travel from ship to shore had been seen. The Amundsen was commanded by Admiral Gunderson, formerly of the USS Harper's Ferry. Though they rescued us, and proper medical treatment saved Callie, their primary purpose in coming to Belfast was the plane at the International Airport and the fuel tankers that had been parked nearby during the early days of the outbreak. If the tankers still contained fuel, the plane still worked, and the runway could be cleared, the plane would depart for Anglesey. That was a lot of ifs, but it wasn't my concern. That was a mission for the U.S. Marines and for the pilot Scott Hickson. My concern was for the election that was due to be held on Anglesey, which would select a cabinet and a new mayor to replace Mary O'Leary, an election that I was meant to be organizing and which should have been taking place at the end of November. The date had been brought forward. The candidates selected, and none of them were ideal. That's an understatement. 
from what Sholto had told me. Whoever won, humanity would lose. Chapter 1 City of the Dead 14th of October, Day 216, Belfast That's not a zombie, Sholto said. Are you sure? I asked, nudging the corpse with the tip of my sword. There's not much I'm certain of in this hellish world, but this I'd put money on, Sholto said. It wasn't the answer I'd wanted. Sholto and Admiral Gunderson had sailed into Belfast the day before, partly to rescue us, mostly to send a team to the International Airport twenty miles west of the city. The runway was covered in debris, but there was one plane, still half in its hangar, which looked airworthy on a satellite image. Getting a plane into the air took a lot more than getting a pilot into close proximity. Today, the team would inspect the fuel tankers, parked in an industrial site a few miles to the south. If they still contained enough fuel to get the plane to Anglesey, a route would have to be found from there to the airport. Before the tankers were hot-wired, the runway would have to be inspected and enough debris cleared so the plane could take off, assuming, of course, that it was still airworthy. It would take at least two days, but more likely three before the plane was in the air. Until then, we were all stuck in the city. With a surfeit of electricity provided by the icebreaker's working engines, that was no great hardship for anyone but Callie, who was recovering from a second operation. We didn't know much about Soraka Locke, the woman who'd shot her, except that she worked for Lisa Kempton, a billionaire who'd helped fund a conspiracy that created the undead. Kempton had created apocalyptic refuges across the world, one of which was in Ireland. Locke had fled it and made her way to Belfast. Q forward a few months, and after she'd shot Callie, I had confronted Locke. I killed her. There's not much more to be said. We'd done our best for Callie with what few medical instruments we could improvise. Our best wasn't enough. The teenager's condition had been worsening when Kim had taken the motor launch out to sea, hoping to reach Anglesey. Instead, the icebreaker had found Kim. The Admiral, a doctor and former Surgeon General of the U.S. Navy, had operated. With proper treatment, sterile sheets and plentiful blood donors, Callie was recovering. Colm, Siobhan, and the other two teenagers, Dean and Lena, and the three children, Tamara, Charlie and Billy, were luxuriating in electricity and running water. Electric lights didn't offer much comfort to me. We left a frustrated Annette to watch over Daisy, while Kim, Sholto and I went ashore. Our primary goal was the warehouse in which Soraka Locke had taken refuge. I wanted to retrieve the hard drive from the bunker hidden beneath the building. Our other goal, one that was left unspoken, was to confirm whether or not the undead were actually dying. For that, we come to Shore Road. I stared down at the corpse. Are you sure he wasn't a zombie? But even as I said the words, I knew my brother was correct. Sholto raised a hand to his face, thumb and little finger extended in imitation of an old-fashioned phone. That's William of Arkham, he says he's busy shaving, but as soon as he's finished he'll lend you his razor. Very funny. It's just that they look so ragged, I said, stubbornly refusing to abandon the sole ray of light in our dismal world. Don't be fooled by the clothing, he said. We didn't look any better when we emerged from that tunnel in Wales. The corpse wore red jeans and a once white denim jacket, though both were so covered in mud it had taken me a minute to identify the original color. His right boot was laced with string, his left held on with tape. Strips of the same tape still clung to the jacket's sleeves. His face was bearded, his hair long and lank, and matted with as much mud as his clothes. It was the bullet holes in the chest, I said. That's what first made me think that this man and all the other corpses, I added, waving at the scores of bodies nearby, were the undead. No, it wasn't, Kim corrected me without lowering the rifle from her shoulder. 
At first, you thought these were survivors gunned down by Locke. It was only when we saw that zombie die that we started to think that these might also have been the living dead. They weren't, Cholto said. You see the corpses with their heads staved in? Those are the zombies. The rest are very definitely people. A battle was fought here. Survivors against the living dead. Locke came in at the end to finish off those that were left. I count nine people and forty-two zombies between that house and that shop. So, figure four times that number in total. About forty people, about two hundred undead. The exact number doesn't matter, Kim said. No, no, it doesn't, I agreed. Why do you think they fought each other? Why not assume that Locke killed them all? There's too many, Sholto said. Imagine it. Imagine it was you. Look at the number of crushed heads, the number of bullet-riddled bodies. You'd have to carry a rifle in one hand and iron bar in the other. How'd you reload? No. This was a battle. He shook his head and began picking his way through the uneven rows of corpses. As to why they fought? There was a trap. Zombies and survivors were lured here simply so one could kill the other. Then this woman, Locke, killed the rest. Did you know her? Kim asked, following my brother. Who? He asked. Saw her Locke, she said. No, I didn't know her, Chalto said. I didn't know of her either. I'd heard of Captain Keys, though. Keens, I said, finally turning my back on the corpses and following the other two down the street. Captain Tamika Keens. What did you hear? Kim asked. That she was an actual captain, Chalto said, and the U.S. Coast Guard. She had a distinguished record and then a dishonorable discharge. She broke the arms and legs of three fellow officers, all their arms and all their legs. He wouldn't say why. They said it was unprovoked. Read into that what you will, because I didn't have time to dig further. There were too many conspirators, too many leads, none of which led me to the answers I needed, not before it was too late. What else do you know about Captain Keynes? I asked. That Kempton gave her a job running her ship, Shelto said. That's about it. It's a similar profile for a lot of Kempton's employees. Not so much waifs and strays in need of a second chance as criminals who were on their last one. There was a programmer I knew, a very good one. I managed to get her a job with Kempton, though without anyone knowing it was me who'd done it. She got caught hacking into NORAD. Kempton's accountant had spent five years in federal prison for tax evasion, a driver had worked for a Baltimore street gang, and her PR director worked as a speechwriter for the president before last. Like I said, she liked to employ criminals. He was trying to lighten the mood, but it was the wrong setting. It makes sense, I guess, Kim said. If you're planning for the end of the world, you want to recruit those who can triumph in the face of adversity. But at the same time, you want people who owe you everything. She looked at the carpet of corpses blanketing the road. Those survivors must have been like Siobhan and Colin. They would have had grand plans to farm and fish, but the undead made it impossible. Out of desperation they came to the city hoping to scavenge enough food to survive just one more day. How did Locke lure them here? Music? Or the sounds of someone calling for help? Either would have lured the undead too. I suppose we could look for the sound system, but to what end? No. Whoever Locke once was, what she did here tells us who she became. She killed these people, and she shot at us, all so she wouldn't have to share the city's supplies. All so she could stretch out her lonely existence for a few more desperate days. Yes, that tells us all we need to know. And it is all we need to know, but we might as well get that hard drive anyway. The warehouse is about a mile east and north of here. She pointed towards the driveway of a semi-detached house. We'll cut through the back gardens. Glass crunched against gravel as she walked up the drive. The ground-floor windows were intact, 
but those on the upper story had been shattered. I wasn't worried about the undead. We'd been talking loudly enough that if there were any nearby, they would surely have heard us. No. My concern was more for the state of humanity. I suppose you could say that I'd led a sheltered life before the outbreak. Certainly it was a privileged one, though I'd rarely thought so at the time. I'd had little contact with the worst aspects of our species except through the prism of the news or the filter of fiction. Crime was a statistic that had to be reduced. Tragedies were events for which a heartfelt statement had to be written. Evil was a philosophical concept best left to the Lord's spiritual. Since the outbreak, I'd gained a far more personal experience of the visceral depths to which people could sink. As I took one last look at the open grave on Shore Road, I realized that people could sink a lot further than I'd yet imagined. All the dead survivors were adults. Where were the children? The old? The sick? When this group came to the city searching for food and sanctuary, they wouldn't have wandered the streets in one large group. The infirm and the young would have been left in some refuge on the city's outskirts. Precisely how Locke triggered her trap will remain a mystery, but she had lured the adults to Shore Road, and that meant the rest of the group had been left undefended. Locke would have found them. She would have killed them. Perhaps they were the people who'd taken refuge in Belfast Castle. Perhaps not. Perhaps that was another group of survivors the woman had destroyed. Bill? Shalto called. I turned away for the final time, knowing that even if the undead were dying, it had come far, far too late. A trellised fence ran along the rear of the back garden, a brighter shade than the fencing at the side of the house. It must have been installed at the tail end of the previous year. Below the fence was a flower bed from which nothing sprouted except a neat line of withered stems and plastic labels. In the corner, between the garden and the neighbors, was a forty-foot-tall oak chestnut. The fence detoured around the trunk, placing it entirely in the neighbor's garden, along with the cost of pruning it. At that curving section, the panels already bowed outward, and came free after a few seconds' work with sword and machete. Beyond lay a row of terraced houses narrower and stockier than the grand home we'd just passed. You see the door? Kim asked. The lock was broken, and the door was held closed by a length of rope running through the handle of a rusting lawnmower. Kim slung her rifle and took out the tablet. She brought up the photographs of the road map that I'd found on Soraka Locke's body and flipped through the images until she found the right page. If this is the house I think it is, then we're a little further south than I thought. Locke marked this house with the annotation C.F. Canned food, do you think? Charlie was hoping the C stood for chocolate, I said, giving the handle of the lawnmower a tap with my sword. The metal rung dully, but loud enough to be heard inside the house. We listened. Nothing, Charlto said, and unlooped the rope. His suppressed SA-80 Held close to his shoulder, he pushed the door. It swung inward with a creak. The rope hadn't held the door completely closed, and I don't think that was its function, but a way for Locke to know whether the undead had forced their way into a house. Months of rain had slackened the rope, allowing the door to swing an inch from the frame. That same rain had found its way inside. The welcome mat was spotted with white mould that was creeping onto the hall carpet, but hadn't yet made it into the kitchen. On the kitchen table was a plastic box, the lid weighted down with a pair of blue ceramic elephants that almost matched the design of a row of mugs on a shelf by the sink. From the trio of marching pachyderms printed on the box itself, I assumed it belonged to the owners. Kim carefully lifted the elephants off. C.F. could be canned food, she said, looking inside. 
There are two tins of pears in juice, a pack of spaghetti, and some herbs. Can't remember the last time I saw a pear, I said, putting the tins in my bag. Take the spaghetti too, Kim said, picking up one of the elephants. No, she added, putting it down. Not yet. Not yet what? Sholto asked. I was thinking of taking the elephants, Kim said. One for Daisy, one for Annette. But we're not at that place yet. Which place? I asked, closing my bag. The one where we collect souvenirs, she said. Taking food and clothes and other things we need, that's one thing. Taking statues, it's... it's too soon. It'd feel more like we're grave robbers or something. She cleared her throat. So, do we think CF stands for canned food? Probably, I said. We'll check a few more houses on our way. How long do we have? Another hour before we have to call in, he said. Oh, we can do that when we get to the bunker. We left through the front door. The road outside wasn't empty. Unlike on Shore Road, this zombie was still alive. It squatted, motionless by a red post office van two doors down. The rear wheels were on the road, the front wheels in the driveway almost on top of a fallen moped. I don't think the zombie had been a driver of either vehicle. It was too small. It had been too young. Kim sighed a deep and mournful exhalation at the cruel indifference of the virus. She raised her rifle. No, I said, giving a sigh of my own. If ammo is that scarce, we really shouldn't. The undead child had heard us. It wore dungarees that once had been pink. Probably a girl, though it was hard to be sure. Hair only remained on the right-hand side of her head and it was chopped short. Not hers. It's. I turned my eyes down, away from its eyes, watched its feet as it staggered closer, listened to its teeth as they snapped up and down. I raised the sword across my body, looked up, and saw dead eyes in what just for a moment I couldn't help but imagine was Annette's face. I hacked the sword down, slicing neatly through bone and brain. The zombie fell. I sighed again. Damn this world. How bad is the situation with the ammunition? Kim asked, speaking as a distraction as we walked away from the corpse. Not as bad as Marcus makes out, Sholto said. But it's not good. Most of the volunteers are lifelong civilians. A few had fired a hunting rifle or shotgun before, so they know which end to point at the target. But that doesn't mean that they can hit it. George's training regime requires everyone to fire at least a hundred rounds in practice, with one magazine on fully automatic, so that they can get used to the recoil. A hundred rounds? Doesn't sound like much, Kim said. It adds up when you've got a thousand new volunteers, Sholto said. Some people can fire a thousand rounds into a barrel of fish and still call themselves an animal lover. It's not just the ammo expended in practice. There's no point giving people a rifle if you don't give them the bullets to go with it. The first time people go ashore, it's often the first time they've ventured into danger since the outbreak. They jump at shadows. When they have a loaded weapon, they shoot at them, too. It's another few hundred rounds expended usually to no purpose except some broken windows and an occasional ricochet. No one's been killed by friendly fire yet, but we've had a few minor injuries. That's more grist for Marcus to mill. The key point, though, isn't how much has been expended, but how much is sitting in ships like the Amundsen, there to resupply the teams ashore. Whether it's in Dublin, Elysium, or Bangor, that's ammunition that can't be quickly reissued to somewhere else. Can we make more? Kim asked. I'm sure we can. George has some people looking into it, Sholto said. But is that the best way to apply their knowledge? Do we make propellant? Or do we make fertilizer? Because it's the same people tasked with both. It would be easier if we could find a supply dump.
That's the real reason that Miguel went to Dublin. It wasn't just about investigating those lights. But they turned out to be people is fantastic news. But it's the only good news he found. We thought that with all those European military units flying into the city at the request of the Irish government, they would have left some weapons caches behind. They didn't? Kim asked. Not that they found, Chalto said. Well, Miguel came across a ton of discarded casings and spent bullets in some overrun warehouses that someone had tried turning into a fortress. Of course, he burned through a lot of ammunition discovering that. It's the same with the Marines who cleared out Elysium. Every bullet counts, Kim murmured. And Marcus has made this part of his election campaign. The cornerstone, Chalto said. His slogan is, stay put, stay safe, save resources, save lives. He's preaching isolationism, more or less. What's the less part? Kim asked. Banger and Carnarfon. He wants to seal the roads leading into them, then systematically empty the two cities, stockpiling everything that's there right down to the bricks. Now, the Jones is already doing that, so I think it's just a sop to gain support from the people in Menai Bridge. It's the more that I'm concerned about. He's promising a return to the old world. Everything we've lost we can have again. Movies, restaurants, holidays, the whole nine yards. He's preaching a paradise there for the taking, but only if we stay on the island. The contradiction is staggering. But it's also beguiling. Save resources. Save lives. Save our lives, Kim said. And let everyone else who might be out there, all the Tamaras, Billies and Charlies, die. Yep, Chalto said. And if you were our candidate, that's precisely what I'd tell you to say. Tell us again. Kim said. How did the election all go so wrong? I wouldn't say that it has, Shalto said. Not yet. We've still got another couple of weeks until the event. That's a long time in politics, right, little brother? Hmm? Oh, yeah. I threw a glance back down the road, but could no longer see the body of the child. Part of me wanted to bury the undead girl, but I knew that once I started... I wouldn't be able to stop. It would be one corpse, and then the next, and then I'd end up like the grave digger we'd found in the Irish southwest. Her name was Phyllis O'Riordan, and she'd been another one of Lisa Kempton's followers. We'd only spent a few minutes with her, but she was utterly insane. She'd escaped from Elysium, Kempton's apocalyptic retreat in Ireland, and returned to her family home. There, O'Riordan had stayed, killing the undead and burying them in shallow graves. Even with her as a cautionary lesson, I could imagine myself doing the exact same thing. I forced my feet on, one after another, following Kim and Sholto away from the dead child. You know what I mean, Kim said. How did we end up with such terrible candidates? And no smart remarks about how all candidates are terrible or anything like that. Okay, Chalto said. The short answer is that I underestimated Marcus. He's not as clever as he thinks he is, but he's a little cannier than I gave him credit for. I think he's been planning for this since Mary first announced there'd be an election, back before we arrived on Anglesey. What was meant to happen? Kim asked. There are eleven positions that'll be contested, Sholto said. Ten cabinet posts and one mayor. The cabinet positions were divided up among Sophia Augusto, Mr. Mills, Heather Jones, Dr. Knight, Leon, and all the other leaders of the larger factions. That way we didn't have them all contesting one single position. It's continuity, he added a little defensively. If they're standing for the cabinet posts, they can't run for mayor, I said. Didn't you have a contender for the top job? I did, he said. It was meant to be Kim, and the election wasn't meant to be until the end of November. I think Marcus must have guessed the first. He publicly demanded to know why we were waiting. 
It was a valid question, and one I couldn't answer with the truth. He got other people to ask the same question, and at the same time. It was a demonstration close to being a riot. The election was brought forward to November 1st. Therein lay the problem. Candidates had to submit their nominations in person. That was another one of the rules you wrote in, Bill, and with both of you in Ireland, Kim couldn't stand. Believe me that we're going to circle back to why you thought I wanted to be the leader, Kim said. But why couldn't you put your own name forward? Because I was left organizing the damn thing, Chalto said. That was another one of your rules, wasn't it, little brother? The guy planning it couldn't be a candidate. Anyway, I suggested Marcus run for a cabinet post, Minister of Culture and Entertainment. I thought that was a nicely vague position that would give him the illusion of power while not giving him any responsibilities. He said that he was happy being a bartender. You believed him? That should have set alarm bells ringing, Kim said. That might have done if I hadn't been sifting through hundreds of nomination papers, Shalto said. Four hundred and sixty-two, to be precise. And that was Marcus's doing. He got everyone he could to nominate themselves for mayor. Why? Kim asked. To make sure that nominations were closed early, Shalto said. He was worried that either you'd return, or that I'd figure out what he was up to. We announced that the nominations were going to close. Marcus put his own papers in a few minutes before they did. About an hour later, the other candidates began to drop out and publicly endorse Marcus. These are people who've spent the last six months on their boats avoiding work and danger. They get their own vote and probably no one else's. That didn't matter. It was the optics of them, one by one, publicly endorsing Marcus, what he did next, I'll admit, was clever. He'd had dummy candidates stand for the cabinet posts. He told them to drop out as well. Then he and they publicly endorsed Mr. Mills, Sophia, Dr. Knight, and the rest. He took control of the narrative, I said. Precisely, Chalto said. And since we haven't codified which powers lie with the cabinet and which with the mayor, if he wins, he can circumvent the others. Now, you've asked why he got all those people to stand. A better question is how. They had to be paid off with something. And all he's got to offer is beer and promises. And he's got to be running out of the former. It sounds like a mess, Kim said. But you must have had a candidate. Donnie O'Leary, Shalto said. He's got the right name, the right support. He's likable, young. Ordinarily, I'd say too young, but people would know that Mary and George would be guiding him every step of the way. He would have represented continuity, confirmation that the mayor was a figurehead, and that power would be spread across all the cabinet rather than just the person sitting at the table's head. Why is Donnie not standing? Kim asked. He, uh, took a tumble on one of the green ships, Shalto said. Ended up in the hospital with a concussion and a fractured skull. You think it was deliberate? Kim asked. I'm certain of it. Captain Devine couldn't find a single piece of evidence, Chalto said. Not one fingerprint or grease stain on that ladder, not even Donnie's. You know what that tells me? Someone tidied up after themselves. You don't do that if it's an accident. Can't prove it, of course. More importantly... We can't prove it was Marcus. Which leaves three candidates, Kim said. Right. Marcus, Bishop, and Dr. Umbert, Chalto said. I met Umbert, Kim said. You did too, Bill. Remember the psychiatrist who helped look after Daisy? Sure. Seemed stuffy, I said. Overly fond of his qualifications. Not a politician at all. He'll do for now. Chalto said, he'll have to. Who's Bishop? Kim asked. That's not his real name, Chalto said. He's one of the group on Willow Farm. The pacifists? I asked. I wouldn't call them that, Chalto said. Not anymore. If I had to pick a word, I'd choose fundamentalists. 
though he's picking the fundamentals from any religion that takes his fancy. Peter Bishop isn't the name he arrived on the island with. As far as I can tell, that was James Harrison, and he listed his original home as being in Sunderland. He didn't exactly stretch himself coming up with a new name, I said. Well, he's not our problem. He'll get the vote of the people on his farm and no one else. I went to Willow Farm, I said, as far as the gate, anyway. It's the place near the house David Llewellyn had, the one in which he was murdered by Paul. There were only a few dozen people on that farm. There's a few hundred now, Chalto said. I'd be sure precisely how many as few of them ever come out again, except for the couple of dozens who take out one of their two boats. They claim a grain ration for two hundred. Let's say they have twice that number who are living on what they grow. Willow Farm is going to be a problem, one we'll have to deal with next month. This month our problem is Marcus. Can Dr. Umbert beat him? I asked. He doesn't need to, Sholto said. There's one polling place, and I'm the one who printed the ballots. You're going to rig it? Kim asked. I'd say this is too important not to, Sholto said. Okay, look, I don't want Marcus to win, I said, but there's not much point having an election if we're going to pick the winner. That's a travesty, the worst part of a shh, Sholto hissed but it was too late. We'd spoken too loudly. The zombie had heard us before we'd seen it. The creature was an adult, male, broad-shouldered, and abnormally long-armed. At least, the one arm it still had was longer than average. It hung low, the claw-like fingers almost level with its knee as it swung in a pendulous twenty-degree arc. The arm had to be dislocated, and probably broken in at least two places. The other arm was missing somewhere above the elbow. The ragged remains of a waxed shooting jacket hid the gory stump. Nothing could hide the savage hole in its cheek. Teeth snapping, arms swinging, it staggered out of the smoke-blackened ruins of a burned-out house. The creature stumbled on the broken tiles that had fallen from the collapsed roof, but kept its footing as it lurched towards us. There was a soft hiss from the rifle as Kim fired. The bullet smashed through the zombie's face. It fell, collapsing onto the shattered bricks and fractured tiles, with a clatter that rang far louder than the gunshot. How much point saving bullets if we're going to end up running a dictatorship, Kim said, and not much point going back if the alternative is ending up like Donnie. Fury radiated from her and I felt the same. It wasn't directed at Sholto. Not exactly, and not entirely. I won't say that what I did before the outbreak was rigging an election, I said, because you stuffed the deck, Sholto said before I could continue. You picked the candidates, and I did the same. I didn't actually rig any election, I continued. No, he interrupted again. What about the by-election in Dorking? I sent you those emails and you had a word with a Tory candidate, didn't you? You got him to drop out a week before polling day. What, did he say the reason was? A hard condition? How's that not rigging an election? That's not the same as... Quiet! Kim said, please, let's just... 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 Get to the warehouse. Chapter 2 Congregation it took another hour, mostly due to the undead. We came across three small packs, each clustered in familiar roads. They had to have followed us during our trips to collect the fuel from the warehouse. We fought the first two, but skirted round the third group, and ended up almost lost in the warren of close-packed residential streets before we found the building. Be quick, Kim said, pushing the door to the warehouse closed. I will. Chalto said, taking out his torch. It's down there. The hatch to the bunker was open, just as we'd left it. The warehouse was much the same. We'd already picked through the bric-a-brac that Locke had collected and discounted most of it as worthless. I went upstairs to the rooms that overlooked the road. Kim followed. I think we've ten minutes, I said. 
as a zombie lurched along the street outside. It was moving quickly, or quickly for the undead, but I don't think it had seen where we'd gone. Another appeared from the ruins of a fire-ravaged building a little further to the east. Maybe five? I stepped away from the window. Kim reached for the sat phone we'd brought with us from the ship. Better call in, she said. We should have done it half an hour ago. She pressed dial, and I turned away, barely listening as she gave a brief report to the American sailor on duty. She put the phone away and came to join me at the window. Remember the last time we were here, and all we had to worry about was Callie bleeding to death? She sighed. This election, Bill. If Marcus wins... You heard Sholto. Marcus won't win. You sound bitter, she said. I am. Bitter, frustrated, angry at myself as much as anyone else. When Mary asked me to organize the election, I didn't see it as an opportunity to elect a new leader. It was meant to be a chance for the community to come together. We'd give an official mandate to those people already running the island. It would provide a framework around which a state could be constructed. This election would give us a stopgap government while we took stock of our lives, counted heads, discarded who we were, and worked out who we wanted to become. We'd spend the next couple of years debating taxes and laws, whether we'd need a dedicated fire service and what subjects should be taught in school. The structure was important, not the candidates, certainly not the race. The mayor was just meant to be a figurehead. I thought that Mary and George would stay on in some advisory capacity, and most of the work would be done by the cabinet. Most importantly, I thought that the decisions would be taken slowly. Of course, it wouldn't be democratic, not in the way we idealize the concept, but it would be fair and free, and thus the opposite of the future that Quigley wanted. You saw it as a foundation, Kim said, a precedent for the future, rather than a president for the present. You had a dream of the great and wise gathering in the market square to debate a constitution that's unwritten and unthought, but others had their own dreams. So what do we do if Marcus wins? He won't, I said. If Sholto can rig a U.S. presidential election, he can engineer this one. Except that Marcus has won so far, hasn't he? Kim said. He's outmaneuvered your brother, and Marcus's scheming won't have stopped there. As I see it, that makes it fifty-fifty that he'll win. But okay, what if he doesn't? What if Umbert wins and turns out to be just as bad? We need a plan. You mean, we need a destination? I said. Pretty much, she said. When I left Belfast, when I was alone on that launch heading towards Wales, I had my own vision of the future. Mine was a world in which the undead were dying and the entire planet was ours. We could go anywhere, absolutely anywhere. I felt like that before. It comes in a sweeping wave, a desire just to get away. This time was different. This time, I knew that though we could go anywhere, wherever we went, we'd never leave. It would have to become our home. There are ten thousand people left in our little corner of the world. How many left on the planet? Twenty thousand? Thirty? I imagined us sailing into an isolated harbour, and before I set foot on land, I threw my rifle into the sea. It was a nice vision, until I remembered Siobhan. Even without the undead, her group wouldn't have survived the winter. Even without the undead... I echoed. But the undead are still a problem, and might be for months to come. Maybe longer, Kim said, picking up a dusty DVD from the stack by the equally dusty television. I suppose, wherever we go, we might manage to rig up a wind turbine to a car battery. We could watch old movies on special occasions. But would we want to? Would we really want that vivid a reminder of all we've lost? I was talking to some of the sailors on the ship. People have been leaving Anglesey. Boats go out. They don't return. No one really notices because, for the most part, 
These are people that never really came ashore. If we left, people would notice, and some would follow our lead. We'd scatter to the four winds and form our little communities, our little countries. We'd each hold on to our own little pieces of knowledge, but forget so much more. The dark age will come. But if it's going to come anyway, let's not waste our lives trying to hold back the night. Let's go and enjoy as much of it as we can, as best as we can. Somewhere we don't have to fight and kill just to get by. If Marcus wins, I said. Maybe even if he doesn't, Kim said. We need a good farm with good land. Is Anglesey the best place for that? Like I said, we can leave. But wherever we end up, that will be as far as we and our children will ever get. But if we don't leave soon, we'll never have the chance again. It'll be Anglesey for the rest of our lives, and that wasn't your dream, Bill. I don't think it's mine. There's... there's something I... Got it! Cholto called from below. I looked at Kim, wondering if she'd continue. It's something to think about, she said instead. Two zombies out there. Looks like they've stopped moving. She left the room and headed to the stairs. I followed but hadn't reached the bottom before Kim had opened the warehouse door and stepped outside. Everything all right? Sholto asked. Just trying to plan for the future, I said. Have you got the hard drive? He tapped his bag. I'd design that bunker, he said. I'd say it was a hasty piece of work. I'm not entirely sure how much radiation it would have stopped. It hardly matters, does it? I asked, going outside. Kim stood level with the front wall, rifle raised. She fired. Once. Twice. I saw the first zombie drop, but not the second. It was obscured by the angle of the building. Kim began to lower her rifle, then raised it and fired again. I hadn't seen the third zombie at all. More coming, she said. At least two. Probably more behind. You want to hurry it up? I pulled the door closed. I didn't think we'd return, but left the key in the lock anyway. Experience has taught me that you never know when you might need a refuge. We took a circuitous route back to the harbour, avoiding the roads we'd used to get to the warehouse. But one house is much like another, one street the same as the last. Some buildings were burned out, some trees blown over, some windows broken, some roads occupied by the undead. I swung the sword savagely down, slicing through bone and tendon. Black blood oozed from the outheld stump as the zombie's forearm fell to the ground. It staggered forward, and I stepped back, bringing the sword up. I lunged, spearing the bulbous blade straight at its face. The point pierced the skin between its eyes. I grabbed the pommel with my left hand and pushed as the zombie lurched forward. Bone cracked. I twisted the blade, destroying its diseased brain. It fell. I looked for another threat, but there wasn't one. I think there are more of the undead than there were last week, Kim said, loading a fresh magazine. Locke must have been keeping their numbers down, or luring them away, I said. Except at Shore Road we've not seen that many corpses. Maybe she was coaxing them out of the city, trying to get them to wander the countryside, in the hope that would help keep survivors from coming to raid her stores. That woman just gets worse and worse, Kim said. Is that church on the map? Sholto asked. Which church? Kim asked. Which map? The one Locke had, Sholto said. You see the doors? It was a new build, but with a grey stone façade, designed to imitate the ancient churches and other parts of the city. The front had the usual thick wooden double gates, and those were firmly closed. Sholto was pointing his rifle at the narrow door at the right-hand side of the building. Again, it was made of wood, varnished almost to black. There was no window, and it didn't look as if it had a lock on the outside. It did have a large metal handle that matched the handrail of the steel ramp leading up to it. Between the metal handrail and the door's handle 
ran a padlock chain. No, Kim said, swiping at the tablet. There's nothing on this street. Maybe she didn't mark it off, I said, taking a step closer. The padlock hasn't rusted. So, was it put there by Sarka Lock? Sholto asked. There were no cars in the parking lot, and not many in the street. What do you think? I think we walk away, Kim said. It's not like we're going to find food in there. No, I said, but we might find ammunition. That's what was missing from the warehouse. There were a few thousand rounds, but Locke had to have had more. And used it, Kim said. Look for a key. She left the one for the warehouse near a drain pipe. No drain pipe here. Maybe somewhere near the base of the ramp? As I bent down to look, Sholto walked around to the wide wooden doors at the front of the church. There's no key, I said. Then leave it, Kim said. We'll note the location and return tomorrow or later. Sholto tapped the wooden door and then reached for the ornamental iron ring on the left-hand side. It turned. Looks like we don't need a key after all, he said. The door flew open, knocking him to the ground. Two small zombies tumbled out. As Sholto scrabbled backwards, Kim raised the rifle, firing two quick shots. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the furthest zombie's head blown apart. The other zombie was too close. The bullet hit it in the shoulder just as its hand grasped around my brother's boot. I slammed my foot into the creature's skull, pitching it onto its back. It lost its grip on my brother's ankle, but it wasn't dead. The creature opened its small mouth and snarled, exposing a mouth missing half its milk teeth. I almost hesitated. Almost. I stamped my foot down on that tiny, lesion-ridden face. The bone didn't crack. The sound was softer, one that I know will stay with me to my dying day. I helped Sholto to his feet, but Kim hadn't stopped firing. I turned to face the doors, raising the sword, peering inside at the undulating shadows. Kim kept shooting, but there were no clear targets until she stopped to reload. A trio of zombies, almost walking in line abreast, staggered through the doorway. The creature in the middle was bent double, and that brought it down to the height of the other two. I stepped forward, and to the extreme right, raising the sword up above my head, before slashing it down at the small creature. It raised an arm up, not in defense, but grasping towards me. The over-sharpened blade sliced cleanly through those clawing fingers before it slammed into its skull. You're in the way! Kim yelled. Here! Chalto called. He'd drawn his machete and approached the zombies from the other side. He hacked down at the other undead child as I swung the sword down on the exposed neck of the doubled-over creature. The zombies fell. Back! Kim yelled. Get back! The fury in her voice wasn't aimed at us, or the lumbering procession of decrepit and young staggering through the open double doors. I think she was screaming at time itself. Sholto and I stepped back but kept our weapons ready as Kim fired. Shot after measured shot, each hit its target. The bodies fell without a scream, without a cry for mercy, though each dull thump came with a silent demand for a justice that we could never give. Finally, there was no more movement inside the church. The old and the young, I said, that's who they were, locked inside a church with the infected and with no one to protect them. They must have been with the adults who died on Shore Road, left here without any defense, while those others went to rescue a will-o'-the-wisp. Either that group of survivors or a different one, Chalto said. But someone locked them inside. Damn her, Kim whispered. Tears ran down her face. Damn her, she said again. Chapter 3 Breaking the Ice it was with genuine relief that we reached the checkpoint the Admiral had established at the entrance to the harbour. There was attention to the small group of uniformed soldiers, an agitation 
whose origins lay in the cluster of fresh corpses lying on the road. It does look like there are more undead in the city, I said, by way of greeting. One of the soldiers, one of the few with a name tape attached to his uniform, gave a vague nod. You saw a lot of them today? Sergeant Conrad asked. A few dozen roaming the streets, I said, then realized what he was really asking. None heading this way. Conrad gave another nod, this one more precise. He had the stars and stripes on his shoulder. As I noticed that, I realized that the others all had two flags on theirs. Each bore the standard of the United States, but the other badge was different on each of the sailors. I recognized Cape Verde, Egypt, and Germany. Those flags gave an indication of where they'd been a year before, the stars and stripes, how they'd survived the last few months. Under other circumstances, that might have given me some flash of pride or hope. After what we'd seen, I just wanted to get back to the relative isolation of our cabin. At least the checkpoint meant the last leg of the journey was made in relative safety. We travelled with weapons ready, where the only real danger came from the risk of one of the bombed-out buildings collapsing around us. Though we heard a few distant panes of glass come crashing down, and a few more of the smoke-blackened girders crack and creak, we reached the ship unharmed. As Sholto went to find a computer into which he could plug the hard drive, Kim and I went looking for Annette and Daisy. Both were in the icebreaker's command center with the admiral, a radio operator, and an older male officer, John Whitley. He was helping Daisy color in a picture, a wistful look on his face. As Daisy saw us enter, she jumped down from her seat and ran over to Kim. Whitley's face dropped, as the moment in which he could imagine Daisy as his own daughter vanished. Careful, Kim said, I'm not clean. Daisy made a point of holding her nose, then she laughed. It was a wonderful sound that did more to dispel my gloomy mood than all the lights on all the screens in the room. How's your day been? I asked Annette. Busy, she said, indicating the book in front of her. Where Daisy had been coloring, Annette had been learning. What's that? I asked. Distances, Annette said. By sea. You know, because if you traveled in a perfectly straight line, you'd sail straight into space. You have to do tangents and remember the horizon. It's tricky, she added, but good. I was impressed. Did you get the hard drive? Admiral Gunderson asked. We did, Kim said. Cholto's gone to plug it in. There are more zombies about than we saw last week, but otherwise not much else to report. She didn't mention the bodies on Shore Road or in the church, and I decided not to either. Not in front of the girls, nor in front of Whitley or anyone else who didn't need to know. I found my gaze going to the large screen on the forward bulkhead. There were other smaller screens on either side, and a few gaps where screens had been destroyed during the battle to reclaim the ship from the undead. Two of the smaller screens displayed slightly grainy images I couldn't quite make out. The image in the large central screen was clear enough. It was the top-down view from a satellite. Are those the fuel tankers? I asked. Yep, Annette said. Eight can contain up to 22,000 litres of fuel. And that is the Admiral prompted. Annette's face crinkled as she tried to remember. Rule fingers, remember? Whitley whispered. Divided by four. Oh, yeah, about five thousand and something, Annette said, which is different from normal gallons. I don't see why we can't just use liters. Intransigent parochialism, the Admiral said. What's that? Annette asked. Politics, I said. Are all those tankers full? Sadly, no, the Admiral said. They've marked four that are at least half full. They contain between, uh, Annette? Oh, right, at 10,000 to 14,000 litres, and I'm not converting it, she added. They gave it a sniff test and think it's aviation fuel, the Admiral said. They'll have to analyse it for impurities, though. 
All being well, it's more than enough. What about the runway? Kim asked. It's a mess, Annette said. Mr. Higson wasn't happy. You should have heard what he called it. But he thinks it'll be okay. He was happy with the plane, but he's got to go back tomorrow to check out the, um, the wiring or something. Evianics, the Admiral said. But yeah, all is on schedule. Then we'll leave you to your lessons and go and clean up, Kim said. Annette's face fell as any hope of being saved from the rest of her mathematics vanished. Whitley's face lit up, though, at a few more stolen minutes in his own personal fantasy. Kim and I had a cabin all to ourselves, next to the one that Daisy shared with Annette. Our room even had an ensuite cubicle. As Kim showered, endeavouring to use up the ship's entire stock of hot water, I made do with a sink and a change of clothes. Leaving her filling the cabin with steam, I went to the medical bay. My first impression on my first visit to Cali after her first proper operation was that it was better equipped than the hospital in Hollyhead. That impression had been confirmed by the Admiral, but it made sense. The ship had originally been a rescue and support vessel deployed in the Arctic, for sailors, explorers and those foolhardy enough to venture above the 66th parallel, the ship represented a difference between certain death and possible salvation. Chavorn was standing by the closed door to Callie's room. Her eyes were half closed. They opened as I approached. Callie's asleep, Chavorn said. Is well? I asked. I think so. Getting better. She'll be fine in time. And how are you? I asked. Siobhan looked up and down the narrow corridor. Adjusting, she said. Callum's managing it better than I am. Where is he? Over on the John Cabot with Dean, Lena and the children. They're sorting through the containers, helping catalogue what might be useful. Well, no. What they're really doing is getting some fresh air. It wasn't helping them being stuck in that small cabin with Callie, and it wasn't helping her either. Are you going ashore today? We've been, I said. Already? What time is it? About three, I said. Ah, oh, I lost track, she said. Um, she gave the corridor another look up and down. The Admiral spoke to me, she said, her voice lower than before. She asked, if he wanted to go to Elysium. Who's we? I asked. Me, Colm, the kids, Siobhan said. She meant, did we want to stay in Ireland, to build our lives here rather than on Anglesey? Oh, right. I wasn't sure what else to say. When was this? Today, an hour ago. No, probably longer ago than that. It was after Colm and the others left. Right. Okay. Did she say anything else? Just that they'd cleared it of zombies. The solar panels work, and they'll have the wind turbines online by the end of the week. By then the walls will be repaired. I think she's planning to move there herself. Right. Again, I was at a loss. What did you say? That wherever we go, we'd need to know it was properly safe, Siobhan said. That we'd spent the last seven months going from one apparently safe refuge to another, only to flee each one in turn. You didn't know about this, did you? I wondered. Because you mentioned something about setting up refuges in Ireland, I, I thought this might be part of your plan. But it's not, is it? No. I said, this has nothing to do with me, I... I better go and have a word with her. The Admiral was still in the command centre, as were Annette and Daisy. We're still waiting for them to finish the test, Annette said. One of the privates dropped a sample. She grinned. Mr. Higson, those are some really cool swear words. I'm sure you'll teach me them later, but I need to have a word with the Admiral. About Elysium, I said. Let's take a walk, the Admiral said. We went to her cabin. It was smaller than I was expecting, neater too, completely absent of any homely touch. I wondered whether her personal belongings were still on the Harper's Ferry, 
or whether she was keeping them in store because she didn't plan to be on this ship for long. Well, talk away, the Admiral said, sitting down at the desk that took up most of the room in the chamber. You're claiming Elysium? I asked, sitting in a solitary chair opposite her. I wouldn't use that word, she said. It's a good spot, I said. You've got farmland inside the walls, an electricity supply, and a deep harbour at Kenmare Bay. I assume you plan to seal the peninsula. Yeah, it might be a good spot. Not as secure as an island, but there isn't much choice, is there? She just shrugged. What about America? Aren't you planning to return there? I asked. I am, but we don't know what we'll find. She said, we need a safe harbour. It's possible that we'll only need it for a few months. But you might need it forever. Anglesey won't do? She tapped her fingers on the desk. I thought she was going to evade the question. I was wrong. Marcus will win, she said. He has bribed and barred his way to being the front runner in what is almost a one-horse race. Can you prove that? Prove it to whom? She asked. Yeah, I'm certain that he's paid people off, that he's buying support with beer and more with a promise of whiskey tomorrow. But who is to say this invalidates his candidacy? To whom would you demand that he be removed from the race? Whose authority would he respect? The court in which we tried Rachel for Paul's death does not have the weight of precedent behind it. Considering what happened to Donnie, Mary O'Leary would be seen as a rival acting out of bitter revenge. If an attempt is made to remove Marcus from the race, he will cry foul and engineer a riot. No, Marcus will win. And when he does, your society will crumble. It won't happen overnight. But as his impossible promises remain unfulfilled, as conditions steadily worsen, people will leave. News of the undead dying will only hasten their departure. The entire world lies before us all. It will belong to whoever goes out and claims it. But it is a large planet. There is enough for each of us to have all that we wish. Kim and I were talking about that very same thing, I said. That's why we need Anglesey. If we're thinking about the future, the long future, then we need a place for knowledge and technology to be remembered and taught, a place that can become a bastion against the coming darkness. I agree, she said, but that won't be Anglesey. I doubt it'll be a fifty-acre farm on the southwestern tip of Ireland, I said. Probably not, the Admiral said. It will be sufficient for now. I will reassess our plans after we've reconnited the American East Coast. How much time and effort will that waste? I asked. How much will be lost because of it? If you feel so strongly about it, why not take part in the election? Why not try to stop Marcus? And take power by force? That's what it would come down to. Yeah, I could do it, but it wouldn't be a riot. It would be a coup and not a bloodless one. People would die. Good people. Your people. Yours too, she said, and it wouldn't stop the exodus, but only hasten it. No, this way's better. There's no need for bloodshed. There is no need for violence. I see. I stood. Well? What? Aren't you going to invite us to come with you? I asked. She smiled. There's no need, she said. I've known people like you all my life. The restless, questing sort who can never be still. No, oh, I don't need to offer you an invitation. You'll come with us. You won't be able to stop yourselves. In that, she was probably correct. How many people do you plan to take to Elysium? I asked. I think there are some details that are best not discussed, she said. It's more than just this ship and your crew, I asked. Of course it is. It's Svalbard as well, isn't it? That's the price you paid for this icebreaker. They gave it to you in exchange for you protecting their sovereignty, if you can call it that. Which means you've struck a deal for the oil. What use do you have for the oil on Anglesey? She asked. It was a good point. One that I discussed with George and Mary. 
They were quite happy to let the Admiral have Svalbard's oil, and equally happy for the Admiral to use it to seek out survivors across the world. Giving it to her was very different to her taking it, however, particularly when those survivors wouldn't ultimately be brought to Anglesey. So Marcus gets into power, I said. Whatever he plans, he no longer has the oil from Svalbard. I can't imagine he'll be happy with that. What if he tries to take it? With whom? We're rested and resupplied, and we will have the oil. There's the vehement, I said. Mr. Mills's submarine still has its Trident missiles. Captain Mills won't launch them, she said. Of course he won't, I said. But what if Marcus gets hold of the keys? He won't, the Admiral said, with absolute certainty. You've spoken to Mr. Mills? Like I said, I don't think it's wise to discuss the details, she said. Mills is meant to be standing in the election, running for one of the cabinet posts, I said. If Marcus wins and the first thing that Mr. Mills does is up and leave with you, that'll make the whole system collapse. The Admiral shrugged. It might. It might not. My first priority has to be to the future of our species, my second to those who sail with me. In this case, I think both priorities are best served by removing myself from Anglesey along with any future threats. I... I, I see... There was no point debating it with her. Not then, not there. I left her cabin and went back to our room. Should we be surprised? Kim asked after I told her. Though I suppose my first question should be whether you think this cabin is bugged. I hadn't considered that. I looked around the suddenly small-seeming space. I don't think so, I said, and I don't think it would matter if it was. It's not like she can't guess what we'd say. Then stop pacing and sit down, Kim said, patting the bunk next to her. It's hurting my neck having to keep craning up at you. The bunk itself was little more than a metal tray affixed to the wall. The mattress, like most of the hard-to-clean soft furnishings in the ship, had been removed. The squares of foam padding that replaced it looked like they'd been cut out of car seats. I sat. It's weird, Kim said. Essentially, the Admiral is offering us what I almost want. My daydream could become a reality. We get to see the world. What I really want is to see something other than the same stretch of farmland. I was wondering whether my wanderlust is a desire to escape Britain, and in doing so escape the past. Oh? I asked, somewhat nonplussed. Our lives are going to be hard, and they'll be short. Because of the radiation, none of us know how short they'll be. Add that to a distinct lack of happy memories associated with Britain, and wanting to get away is natural, right? After a moment, I realized she was genuinely asking. I suppose so, I said. You know who'd be the one to ask. Dr. Umbert? I don't think so. I think this is a case where the cause doesn't matter so much as the effect. The Admiral has persuaded Mr. Mills to throw his lot in with her. From the sound of it, I said, how many others will go with her? Not Heather Jones, I said. She fought her way back to Anglesey and fought the undead to liberate her home. No, she'll stay on the island. Francois will go to Paris, Kim said. I don't know whether he'll take anyone else with him, or where he'll go after that. But well, that's what he was talking about on our trip to Svalbard. If Leon goes with him, so will the rest of their special forces, and the new recruits and hangers-on that they've acquired. That'll include Dr. Knight, and anyone she's gathered under her wing. Sophia and Miguel might recross the Atlantic. They might not, but they won't stay on Anglesey. George and Mary, they're key. If they stay, others might do the same, but I think... Yes, I think Mary will do what's best for Donny. From what Sholto said, it sounds like Marcus tried to kill him to stop him being a candidate, so... Well, they'll leave, won't they? Maybe. Possibly. Probably. The people who'll leave 
They're the most capable, Kim said. They're the people who fought and struggled these last few months. I'm sure that they'll survive. The question is whether without them the people left on Anglesey can. A more pressing question is whether we should go with them, I said. Is that really a question? We'll go with the Admiral or we'll follow George and Mary. It's the children, Bill. Annette, I didn't realise, but she seems happier on a ship than on shore. I wonder, maybe it's for the same reason I prefer it. She knows the undead can't get her. No, if they're abandoning Anglesey, we'll be on the first ship to sail far, far away. Hmm. So Mr. Mills is leaving? I think so. I mean, his crew as well, she said. The engineers from the vehement keep the nuclear power station running. If they leave, presumably they'll shut the power plant down first. I hadn't thought of that. So there'll be no more electricity. Marcus will like that less than losing access to the ship oil. That's something to double-check, Kim said. It's one thing abandoning Anglesey. It's another leaving them to die. Your mind's made up? I asked. If it all comes to pass, as the Admiral described, Kim said, if she and George, Mary, Mr. Mills and everyone else are leaving, then yes, so are we. I'm deciding for all of us. Just imagine what Anglesey will be like. No electricity, no easy escape except by sailboat. I feel sorry for Heather Jones, Lorraine and all the others who might stay, but... I wonder. What? I asked. Well, I wonder if the Admiral has a deeper plan. She's rigged it so that Anglesey is effectively being left to Marcus and Heather Jones. Forget the election. The result of that won't matter in the slightest. But if Marcus wants to hold on to power, he'll have to launch some kind of military expedition to Elysium. I can't see Heather Jones going along with that, I said. Exactly. Elysium isn't far from Anglesey. Marcus could reach it in a sailing ship. And if the power plant has been shut down, the oil supply cut off, presumably the ammunition taken as well as a good portion of the food stores, then he'd have to retaliate or hand power to Jones. After the Admiral and her crew of professional military sailors have sunk Marcus's expeditionary force of sailboats, the Admiral will have to retaliate. Basically, I'm wondering if that's what she's setting up. She's arranging it so that Heather Jones will seize power on Anglesey, supported by the American soldiers and sailors. She said she didn't want to tell you all her plans. I bet this is part of it. In a short few days, I said, we've gone from worrying about holding the first election of a new era to foreseeing the last civil war of the old one. What a world. And it's a future we can't stop. Not if the Admiral leaves with Mr. Mills and his crew. If that happens, we have to go with them, if it happens. And it won't, if Marcus doesn't win the election. Which means we have to get Dr. Umbert elected instead, I said. The first thing we need to do is find out what kind of man he actually is, what kind of leader he might become. Is he better than a civil war in which hundreds will die? He might not be. We can't do that until we get back to Anglesey. If it's going to be as bad as Marcus, we might as well let the Admiral have her way and sail off in search of the sunset. But if he isn't, Kim said, if Umbert is a better alternative, how do we make sure he wins? Speak to my brother, I said bitterly. Better a rigged election than a civil war, Kim said. Would it work, though? Stuffing the ballot boxes? Possibly. Honestly, I'd be worried that we're leaving it a little late. Marcus will want his people watching the votes being counted, and if they watch too closely, we won't be able to switch out the real ones for the fakes. More than that, if that's the price of democracy, is it worth paying? Could we even still call it a democracy? It would be better to wash our hands of the whole business 
and make sure we're on the first boat to leave. No, if Dr. Umbert is a good and honest man, or at least if he seems like a competent and sane one, then I'd rather win him a legitimate victory. How do you do that? Not by being on this ship, I said, standing up. There needs to be more than a speech or two. I'll have to think about it. How did you used to do it? She asked. Leverage, I said. Sholto's strategy was to find the lever that would trigger a candidate to withdraw, or that, when published, would destroy their candidacy. I'll admit that I did that, too, on occasion, but what I really tried to do was find the policy that could be a lever to move a marginal group within a constituency, the hospital that was going to be closed, or the— I was interrupted by a knock on the cabin's door. It was Sholto. He had a laptop in his hands, a tired look on his face. What is it? Kim asked, reading his expression quicker than I. It's not entirely bad news, Sholto said. That doesn't sound reassuring, Kim said. Let me show you, Sholto said. He set the laptop down on the narrow shelf that did for a table in the cramped cabin. This is from the hard drive we took from the bunker. I've not been through all the files. Some are encrypted. Of the rest, there are survival manuals, maps, that kind of thing, but mostly it's security camera footage. There were cameras inside the warehouse and outside. That was what the computer was for. So someone in the bunker could watch anyone who approached, and so someone far away could monitor who was inside. I didn't notice any cameras, Kim said. Nor me, Chalto said. It must be built into the wall. The salient point is, well, this. He pressed play. On the screen, a woman sat at the small dining room table in the bunker. In front of her was a closed book. It was the same journal that I'd found, and which now lay half forgotten in my pack. The woman opened the journal to the first page. She bent over it and began to write words that were now etched into my brain. I am Soraka Locke, I murmured. I am alone. That's what she wrote, Sholto said. And that's all she wrote for the next few minutes. Let me skip forward. The image jumped. The woman was still writing, furiously scribbling those same words over and over. I am alone. Not far enough, Sholto said. He skipped forward again. The image jumped. The woman was on her feet, staring down at the book, as if she was re-reading the three words she'd filled its pages with. She grabbed the book and hurled it out of frame. Sholto hit pause. The image was grainy, indistinct. Hang on, he said. I took a still. You could have shown us that first, Kim said. We don't need the theatrics. But when Sholto brought up the still image, I was glad that I'd seen the video. That's not Soraka Locke, I said. It is, Sholto said. That's what she wrote in the book. He pointed at the screen. That woman is Soraka Locke. And that's not the woman I shot, I said. Kim crossed to my pack and took out the photograph we'd found in the bunker. In it, Ten women and two men stared somewhat distractedly at the camera. It wasn't a staged photograph, but a quick snap, taken while they were otherwise unawares. They were all smartly attired, though the backdrop could have been from an opera house, political fundraiser, or some luxury hotel. In the middle of the group, a few inches off-center, was Lisa Kempton. The woman I'd shot was in the picture, but so was the woman in the video. That's her, Kim said, pointing at the photograph. Yes, that's Soraka Locke. Then who did I shoot? I asked, taking the photograph from Kim. The answer to that lies a little further on, Sholto said. I can't tell you exactly when this was, because there's a bug on the computer's internal clock. It resets to January 1st each time it's turned on. I assume that so if the bunker was discovered by the authorities, the footage could be challenged in court. Here. He pressed play. 
the woman was sitting at the table again. In front of her was the photograph. Next to that was an MP5 similar to those we'd found at the house in Palace Kenry. It's impossible to know what she was thinking in that moment. Perhaps she was stealing herself to venture out into the wasteland. Or maybe she was contemplating suicide. Whichever it was, her plans were interrupted by something. She looked up. Give it a moment, Shalto said. A woman appeared in the doorway of the room. Locke stared, stunned. The woman took a step forward. They were talking, but the image wasn't clear enough to see more than that her lips were moving. The woman looked up, pointing towards the camera. I saw her face. It was the woman I'd shot. Cholto hit pause. That, I think, is the end of the footage. I think the arrival of this second woman is when they redirected the power from the generator. It's her, he added, tapping the photograph. That's the one you said you shot, right? That's her, I said. You didn't kill Soraka Locke, Kim murmured. What does that mean? According to the suicide note we found in Elysium, Soraka Locke was Kempton's representative in Ireland. According to the recording Captain Keynes left on the New World, Locke ran charities as a cover while she gathered evidence on Quigley. I doubt either of those is more than half true. So did this other woman kill Soraka Locke? Or did Locke escape? Shalto asked. I'm no longer willing to guess, I said. We'll take the photograph back with us, ask around, see if anyone recognizes any of the people. You already know those two, Kim said, pointing at the photograph. That's Captain Keynes, who we found on the ship The New World, and that's O'Riordan, the grave digger we found near Killarney. Maybe we could go and ask her. No, I said. We'll ask the Admiral to send some of the Marines who are in Elysium, I sighed. Doesn't that just make it all the more complicated? So we know what happened to O'Riordan, Keynes, and the woman I shot. What happened to Locke is a mystery, as is what happened to Kempton. We know Kempton's not an Anglesey, Shalto said. She's too famous, too recognizable. Since we know that Locke, O'Riordan, and the woman I shot were in Ireland, and that Keynes came to Ireland, what are the chances these others were here too? I asked. If they escaped Belfast, they did it by sea. They would have headed south. They knew about the risk of nuclear war, so they wouldn't have headed for England, but even if they planned to sail all the way down to South Africa, they'd have passed Anglesey. They would have seen the fishing boats. They would have gone ashore. It doesn't change much, Kim said. We can ask Donny, George, and Heather when we get back. Maybe ask Scott Higson, see if any of them went into his bakery or ask Marcy, in case any went to the hospital. We'll ask around. Maybe we'll find them, but whether we do or not, it doesn't change much. I don't know, I said, my eyes flitting between the photograph and the screen. It feels important. No, the Admiral's important, Kim said. What about her? Shalto asked. There's something we need to talk about, I said. She wants you because she wants me, Sholto said, after I'd explained what the Admiral had said. And she wants me because I got the access codes for the satellites. I added an extra layer of encryption, he added. Why? Kim asked. Because for most of my life people have wanted me dead, he said. That's forced a habit more than anything. Those satellites are valuable more so than almost anything else we have on this planet. I got the impression that there was another reason, but I was too tired to press the point. It's not important, Shalto went on. The Admiral can bluster and threaten, but Marcus isn't going to win. If he did, Anglesey would collapse, and it's too important for that. Which is what we were talking about before you came in, Kim said. We need to find a way for Umber to win. Well, that's already in hand, Shalto said. I don't want to discuss it. I said, not any more, not now. Not until we get to Anglesey. Then we can speak to Umbert, take the measure of him, decide if he'll make for a half-decent politician. 
Until then, let me see that video again. Chapter 4 Happy Families The 15th of October, Day 217, Belfast Dean gripped the arrow and pulled. There was a damp snap as the shaft, still partially buried in the zombie's skull, broke. Told you, Lena said. I know, I know, Dean said. Cut, don't pull. It was the first zombie we'd had to fight, though not the first we'd seen. But those had been safely distant, staggering along the shore as we'd rowed past. Siobhan, myself and the two teenagers, had taken a boat up the river Lagan. It wasn't a life raft, but an honest-to-goodness reinforced RIB launch that still bore U.S. military insignia on the sides. There had been a few hairy moments getting the craft past the sunken ship at the mouth of the Victoria Channel, but after that it had been plain sailing, or rowing, at least, and for that we had two sailors to assist us. It hadn't been a pleasant journey up the river. The water level was low, the banks high, and frequently all we could see were the tops of tall buildings. Many were glassless skeletons, smoke-blackened monoliths that reached up to the sky. Those that remained whole were worse, acting as a reminder of how many had once lived in this ancient city, and how the two teenagers with us represented a sizable proportion of all who'd survived. We left the boat near Orma Park, under the guard of the two sailors, and after they'd given us another lesson in how to use the radio. They had a mission of their own, one the Admiral hadn't shared with us, and which they clearly weren't at liberty to. From their shovels, it was easy enough to guess. The Admiral wanted to know the condition of the soil in the park, whether this was because she planned to occupy the city, or to plant some low-maintenance crop that could be left untended, I didn't know, and it didn't matter. Until the zombies were all dead, planting anything there would be a wasted effort. Dean carried the broken arrow to a litter bin on the other side of the street and dropped it in. He glared, daring us to comment on such an obviously futile act. Good habits are important to keep up, Siobhan said, especially now, and at least until we come up with better ones to replace them with. Yeah, I guess, Dean said, that's this way. Just let me check the map, I said, taking out the tablet. You don't think I'd remember? Dean asked, with a return of the sullenness that had been his defensive strategy since I'd first met him. It's not that, I said, though I wasn't going to tell him the truth. When we'd let Dean lead Kim and I to Belfast Zoo, he'd instead led us to the home of his old piano teacher, and in doing so we'd almost been trapped by the undead. We found a church yesterday, I said instead. It was recently padlocked, but not marked on Sorokas. I stopped. I mean, it wasn't marked on the map made by the woman I killed. Are there other properties like that? Was the map half finished, or were places deliberately not included? I want to familiarize myself with the area we're going through, so that by the end of the day, we might have an answer. I'll admit that I was curious about that though after what we discovered in the church, if we found a padlocked but unmarked building, there was no way I'd let the teenagers inside. They were the real reason that we had come into the city. They wanted to go to Callie's old home to retrieve some of the injured girl's possessions. Personally, I was against it. Actually, I'm not sure anyone was in favour of it, but there was no way of stopping the teenagers from making the journey short of locking them in a cabin since that would create more problems than it would solve, it had been agreed that they could go, but not alone. It's nice to have technology again, Siobhan said, as I tapped at the screen and brought up the photographs of the map, even in a small way. To be honest, I think I'd be happier with paper, I said, but we might as well enjoy the pixels while we can. Where are we, though? Junction of Ardenley Avenue and Ardenley Gardens, Dean said. Found it. I said. There aren't that many marks on these properties. I don't think Locke came as far as... I stopped. Not Locke. I've got to stop doing that. I just don't know what to call her. Unsub? Siobhan suggested. Suspect? Murderer? Nan Nemo. 
Lena suggested. That's Latin, she added, and must have seen the surprise on my face. She gave an expansive shrug that seemed to say that, of course, she'd studied that dead language. Agatha, Dean said, that's the Irish word for someone who's dead. You mean Erica? Siobhan asked. Agatha will do, I said. It's probably a bad idea to give her a name like that, but I need to keep my thoughts in order. Anyway, there's a cluster of houses on Onslow Parade that are circled. Otherwise, there's nothing marked until we get to Castle Ray Industrial Estate, and then we're close to Callie's home. Home? Lena echoed. She started walking. I met Dean's eyes and nodded that he should follow. I've not known Lena long and she is just a teenager, but after Kim, she's at the top of the list of those I'd want watching my back. But she is just a teenager, and this city was once her home. We'd made the mistake of letting Dean loose, and that had resulted in a fight in which we'd almost died. Siobhan and I took up the rear, but not too far behind. Agatha, I murmured, don't fixate on it, Siobhan said as we followed the teenagers up the leaf-strewn road. You acted on the best evidence available, and you turned out to be correct. You did the right thing shooting her, stopping her. Did I? I asked. We know Agatha worked for Kempton, but do we know she shot Callie? We will, once we get to Anglesey, Siobhan said. I still have the bullet I extracted from Callie's side. When I have somewhere I can test fire the weapon you recovered from... Okay, from Agatha's body. We'll know for sure. The woman's dead, Bill. You've plenty of living problems to worry about. Don't I know it? Lena raised a hand as she neared the next junction. Dean stopped one step in front. Siobhan and I hurried to catch up. The storm drains on both sides were blocked by months of accumulated debris, leaving the road partially submerged. A pool of fetid, foam-covered water stretched for ten yards, but it was the undead in the driveway of a terraced house just beyond which had caused Lena to stop. There were four of them, squatting, motionless. Two wore green, and they might have been uniforms. The other two were in faded but once bright civilian clothes. None of us spoke, though I'm sure we were thinking the same thing. We were wondering whether the zombies were dead. I pointed north, indicating we should avoid a fight. Dean nodded more quickly than Lena, but waited for the young woman to start moving before he followed her. I don't know precisely what the zombies heard, but the first sound I heard was the damp rustling of cloth, followed by the creak of bone and pop of air in desiccated joints as the creatures slowly rose. Dean stopped and raised his bow. I waited until he fired before I pushed him on. We don't want to fight here, I said. There's only four, he said. There's not, I said. It was only a guess, but one based on an eight-month lifetime of experience, and it was correct. As the zombies milled out of the driveway, more joined them from around the back of the house. Two, then four, and I didn't stop to count the rest. Siobhan took the lead, walking quickly, a fraction slower than my maximum top speed. Behind me, I heard feet stagger and splash through the flooded road. I didn't look back, because ahead, I saw two of the undead stagger out of an overgrown front garden. Dean fired a hasty shot while he was still moving. The bolt sailed past the zombie's ear, thudding into a rusting car with a tinny thwack. Lena's aim was closer to true. Her arrow slammed into the zombie's eye. Siobhan raised her rifle, one of the silenced SA-80s from Anglesey. She fired a three-shot burst that blew the second creature's skull apart. Leave it, Lena said, as Dean ran to the car to retrieve the arrow. It was an odd comment from the young woman, in that it was two words when one would have sufficed. Guessing the cause was anxiety, I finally looked behind. A small pack of the living dead were following us, at least twenty strong. They trailed a path of mud and scum. We need somewhere secure, 
I said. Somewhere we can make a stand. Dean? Lena? Any ideas? Dunno. The stadium? Dean suggested. That'll do. I said, lead the way. Stadiums had car parks, and that meant space to see the undead coming. They had multiple entrances and ladders to flat roofs. A ladder would be our saviour, and we'd be safe on a roof. But should we need it, our ultimate salvation would come from the radio. My hand went automatically to my belt, checking the device was still there. Yes, an elevated position and the certainty of rescue. A stadium would be perfect. We didn't reach it. Dean was in the lead. He charged ahead, bounded around a corner, and then immediately came running back. Zombies! I didn't ask how many. It was obviously too many to fight. Siobhan darted to the right, through an alley that led between two houses. She slowed as she reached the end, not waiting for us but scanning for more of the undead. She glanced behind as I reached her. I did the same. Lena and Dean were close behind, but both vying to cover our rear. You two know the city, I said. Take the lead. Get us away from here. The stadium's that way, Dean said pointing back the way we'd come. I could see the zombies now, dozens of them, pushing and shoving at one another as they scrummed their way closer. We're not going to reach it, Siobhan said. We need to get away and get inside, somewhere out of sight. We'll work out where we are later. Hurry, go! The alley led to a small cobbled courtyard, with another alley leading southwest. Dean sprinted down it, Lena close behind, and Siobhan after her. I limped after them a little more slowly, dragging a pair of fetid bins into the alley's mouth, hoping that might impede the zombies' progress. The alley became a road, then another as Dean ran ahead, bow drawn, arrow ready except for when he loosed at the undead. He had difficulty keeping them in sight. If he'd not paused to shoot arrows at the living dead, I would have lost them. Another turning, Another dead zombie, and two more staggered out of a broken doorway as I limped past. They lunged, and I skipped sideways, bringing the sword up and around in a poorly aimed slash that cut through the belt of the first and the coat of the second. Momentum had turned me around. I could see more of the creatures following us. I skipped back a step, raised the sword. Bill! Trevorn called. Come on! She was right. There was no time to finish those undead, and no future in fighting the rest. I skipped out of reach of those grasping arms, turned around, and limped away as fast as I could. Another road, another alley, through a back garden onto another street, and I was certain Dean was lost. I began scanning the rows of houses, assessing which might be a suitable refuge while we waited for rescue from the ship. Ahead, abruptly, Siobhan stopped. She swung the barrel of her rifle left and right, then towards me. There was a brief, paranoid frisson of terror, but a far more rational flash of fear. I stole a look behind. Five ragged shapes staggered after me, but the road behind them was empty. Arms waving, hands grasping, shoulders shifting with each lurching step. They drew nearer, as I slowed my limping lope to a walk. I angled across the road, trying to give Siobhan a clear shot. She raised an arm, waving behind her and to the right. I'd no idea what that meant, but she wasn't heading for shelter, nor was she heading towards me. I couldn't see Dean and Lena, so assumed they were safe. Then I rid my mind of thoughts of anything but the undead closest now ten paces away. I raised the sword, gauged the distance, and lunged. The blade slammed into the creature's already ruined eye socket, smashing easily through bone. It staggered forward a pace as I drew my arm back, though its hands fell to its side. I swung up, turning the blade so it hacked through the zombie's chin. Its jaw broke, but it still staggered on. With a downward swing, I slammed the blade into its skull. Finally, it fell, but the other four had drawn closer. 
I backed up a step, then another, and almost slipped on a moss-covered sheet of metal. I raised the sword high, muttered a silent roar of defiance and fear, and charged. I hacked down, once, twice, splitting a skull, and stepped sideways around the zombie as it fell. I swung low, aiming at the third zombie's legs, but it toppled forward just as I got within reach. It fell almost in a dive with its arms outstretched. Its hand smashed into the side of my face. I staggered, shaking my head, trying to regain my vision. When I did, I saw the zombie was on the ground, crawling towards me. But then it was overtaken by the last two creatures. I stepped back, my sight still blurred. There was a whistle in the air. An arrow flew close enough that I could almost touch it. Another followed a moment later. Almost before the first had sprouted from one zombie's eye, the second arrow slammed into the other's temple. Both creatures fell. There was a rasp from the ground, a meaningless sigh from the fallen zombie. With two hands on the pommel, I rammed the sword down into its brain. Lena stood where Siobhan had been. She'd lowered her bow. The road we'd come down was empty. We weren't safe, but there was no more immediate threat. Sword dripping a trail of black-brown gore on the road, I limped up to her. Where's Dean? Where's Siobhan? I asked. Callie's? Lena said, nodding up the road. I couldn't see them nor any sign as to which of the small houses might have been Callie's home. Lena led the way. It was a mid-terrace, three up, two down, with a proper front garden. Two rose bushes took pride of place, rose hips sprouting from uncut flower heads. Javorn stood in the doorway and stepped aside as Lena entered. I followed and pushed the door, too. Bright splinters showed around the freshly broken lock, when I said Dean should lead us somewhere, I said, I didn't think he'd bring us here. It's Dean, Siobhan said, with a shrug that explained everything. I could hear him, upstairs. He wasn't being loud. Rather, I could tell he was trying to be careful with Callie's possessions. Lena went upstairs to assist. With Siobhan's help, I moved a lacquered table in front of the door. It would hold it closed but not against the determined undead, should they find us. I called the ship on the sat phone, Siobhan said, told them where we are. I said we'd call again when we leave, or in half an hour, whichever came first. Increasingly conscious of the trail of mud my boots left on the pale grey carpet, I followed Siobhan into the front room. Callie hadn't talked much about her home, her family, and her life in Belfast, though she talked more than Dean, and far more than Lena. From the cheerful, almost exuberant way she'd reminisced about her childhood, I'd expected a far grander house, not this starter home for a family that had never reached the finish line. She's got no brothers, no sisters? I asked, as I looked at the photographs on the mantelpiece. Only child, Siobhan said, taking up station by the net curtains. I don't know. I said, picking up a photograph of a younger Callie standing with her parents. There was a birthday cake on the table, though it wasn't obvious whose birthday it was. I wondered who'd taken the photograph. I put the picture down. I didn't ask. I try not to. Everyone has lost so many it's better not to bring up the past. That only leaves the future to discuss, Siobhan said, as that's uncertain. It offers little comfort. Above, floorboards creaked. Was it a mistake coming here? I asked. Siobhan turned around. What do you mean? Was it a mistake bringing Dean and Lena? This check was for them, not for Callie, Siobhan said. You'll note that we didn't go to where either of them lived. This is their way of going home by proxy, a way of saying goodbye without having to see their parents' corpses again. I... Uh, oh, of course. And I realized I'd never asked precisely what had happened during their escape from Belfast. 
Colum had mentioned that they'd gone to his gym because Dean's brother had worked there in an odd job sort of way. I'd not considered that his parents and Lena's and Callie's, for that matter, must have gone with them. Kim and I talked about going home, I said, or rather, well, I talked about going back to London. I wanted to see it again, but that's a bit of vanity, an indulgence. I'm curious as to what it would look like, but going there would serve no other purpose. I don't think I was ever attached to the city. It wasn't a home. Not like this. When this is all over, I'm going home, Chabon said. Not to stay. Not forever. For closure. Mark's dead. Wherever he went after Malin Head, I'll never find him now. The only way I won't spend the rest of my life thinking I should look for him is if I remembered the bad times. She turned back to the window. There were a lot of those with him. But right now, I can just see his smiling face, hear his laugh, smell that weird spiced tea he used to make. I have to remember the past as it actually was, because I'll never forget it entirely. Yes, the future is a far safer topic to discuss, gloomy though it might be. I looked again at the photographs. There was nothing remarkable about them. The same pictures of an apparently happy family could be found in almost every house in every country in the world. Yes, I said, the future is far less gloomy than the past. Speaking of which, Siobhan said, the Admiral came to speak to me again. Oh? To me and Colm, Siobhan said. She was fishing for information about Ireland, the places we'd been, the places we'd fled. She has plans, grand plans, too grand, I think, too grand for the resources she has available. That worries me. I didn't share what I knew about those plans. I trusted Siobhan, but worried the children might overhear her talking to Colm. If news of the Admiral's intentions became known on Anglesey, our fragile society would collapse before we even held the election. Anything specific that worries you? I asked. Just what she's not telling me, Siobhan said, and the general sense that she'd never tell me everything. I think, in part, she wants the children in Elysium because their presence would give her something close to a legitimate claim in Ireland. I'm not sure to whom that claim would be made other than Anglesey, nor how it could be contested, except in blood. That won't happen, I said. Not today, but next year, next decade? Like I said, the future is full of uncertainty. If I am right, and we're to provide legitimacy to a claim on the Irish Republic, that means her interest in Colm, Callie, Dean and Lena is to provide the same legitimacy for Northern Ireland. You saw the shovels that those two sailors had. You know what that means? I think so, I said. The Admiral's planning for a world after the undead, while we're still trying to survive it, Siobhan said. Afterwards, Alam and I talked. Now, that's not strictly true. We sat together thinking, because there truly wasn't much to see. We're going to stay on the ship. We'll let the children out on Anglesey. A few days running around on dry ground will be good for them, but when the ship leaves, we'll go with it. Publicly, we say it's because we want to stay close to Cali. Not that I think anyone will ask. And it's not entirely a lie. Cali will recover more swiftly if she hasn't moved. Between you and me, it's the children. I don't know what the future will bring, but if I have to choose a place for them, then I'd rather it was surrounded by soldiers and sailors. I don't know if we'll go ashore in Elysium, but though we'll go ashore in Anglesey, we won't make her home there. I'm sorry, Bill. That's not the politics. It's the murders. The... Oh, you mean the people Paul killed? I'd almost forgotten about those events of a few weeks previously. There was a creak on the stairs. Lena stood there, and I think she'd been there for a while. Have you got everything? Siobhan asked. Lena shrugged. All we need? Then let's go, I began.
I sighed. Let's go back to the ship. Chapter 5 Unpalatable Truths Kim raised her spoon halfway to her mouth, eyed the contents, and then lowered it back into her bowl. Do you think the plane will take off tomorrow? she asked. On returning to the ship, I'd learned that Scott Hickson and his team had confirmed the plane could fly, and that the wreckage on the airfield could be moved. What was left was to actually do it. The Australian had sounded optimistic, but he always did. Hopefully, I said. It'll be nice to see a plane again, don't you think, Annette? It'd be nice to have proper food again, Annette said. She didn't stop eating. That was a sign of the times. Daisy alone looked happy, but that was because she was eating some of the reconstituted military rations. And that was another sign. When ration packs were considered a luxury, reserved for the infirm and the very young. Are you sure there's no more bread? Annette asked. You ate the last of it yesterday, Sholto said. He seemed to actually be enjoying the thin fish stew. Perhaps he was better at hiding his true feelings about the food as he was about everything else. What about the jam? Annette asked, clearly not willing to give up so easily. You can't eat jam for dinner, Kim said. I can, Annette said. You just mean that I shouldn't. Daisy stopped eating. Her eyes darted left and right. Jam? She burbled. Sorry, sweetheart, Annette said. There's no jam. Daisy's face fell as she returned her gaze to her bowl. Now she looked as disheartened as the rest of us. There were enough military rations for everyone on the ship, but they were being kept in reserve. The fish had been freshly caught that morning, but there wasn't quite enough. It was being bulked out with the last of the food pellets that Kim and I had found in Belfast Zoo prior to the Amundsen's arrival. What have you been eating on Anglesey while we've been away? Kim asked. Bread, Annette said. Bread? Daisy asked, her eyes lighting up again. When we get back, Annette said, remember, Mr. Hickson's gone to fly the plane. He can't bake bread while flying a plane, can he? Daisy gave a cautious shake of her head. I don't think she understood, and wondered if she even remembered what a plane was. But Annette's tone brooked no disagreement. And we've been eating fish, Sholto added. Lots of fish, with a side of vitamin tablets for the kids. Nothing fresh? Kim asked. A little, Sholto said. Under the table, as it were. Lorraine's been helping with Dr. Umbert's campaign. Heather's been sending her care packages from Menai Bridge. Radishes, some lettuce, other greens. They've set up some of the terraced houses in the town as indoor farms. What they lack at this time of year is daylight. They've been improvising with some UV lamps. But they weren't designed for agriculture. Still, it's better than nothing. Precisely how much better? Kim asked. How much have they grown? That's the sticking point, Sholto said. Supplemented by fish and a bit of grain, it's enough for everyone in Menai Bridge. Without the supplement, they can support half that number. It'll be more if they can crack the potato problem. That's only about fifty people, isn't it? I asked. Fifty? Annette grinned. You're out of touch, Bill. That's closer to a thousand now, Sholto said. They've been recruiting. That's the good news. I actually brightened up at that. It was good news. Enough food for five hundred people, and using a method that could be scaled upward over the winter months. Come spring, we could transfer the plants outside, letting them grow wild, perhaps even on the mainland. After all, if the Admiral was planning to grow food in Belfast Park, why couldn't we do the same in the golf course in Carnarfon? And then... I remembered the election. My face fell, my eyes returned to the bowl, and I saw it for what it was. A half ration of wheat gruel bulked out with irreplaceable vitamin-enriched food pellets. How much is being grown elsewhere on the island? Kim asked. 
At the moment, not much, Sholto said. It's the wrong time of year. But there's the potential for more than our needs. The Parsons have about the same number of people on their farm as there are in Menai Bridge. They're focusing more on larger-scale agriculture, on plowing and clearing land for a spring planting. The chickens are doing well, Annette added, keeping them as less efficient than if we were to eat the feed ourselves, Chalto said. There's the possibility of a cull, which would at least give us some meat to eat this Christmas. Things are that bad. What about Willow Farm? Kim asked. Annette made a face. They're weird. And secretive, Chalto said. They claim a grain ration for two hundred, but say they're feeding the rest of their people on what they grow. Whatever that is. They don't share it or their knowledge on how to grow it. That's about the sanest leg of Bishop's campaign platform, that he knows how to keep his people fed. Not knowing precisely how many people there are or how he's doing it, that's not much use to us. They're not a drain on resources, I'll say that much. The Parsons were arable farmers. Long term, the skills they can teach us will be a real boon. With little breeding stock, we'll have to rely on potatoes, wheat, and oats for at least the next decade. Though, they say not to expect much until the harvest after next. Two years? I asked. Sholto shrugged. We returned to our bowls spooning in a metallic-tasting dish. I told myself that was the iron with which the food pellets were fortified, and that it was good for me. I still threw a covetous glance towards Daisy's now empty bowl. Two years before we could stop worrying about food. Two years if everything went as planned, of course. Even then it wouldn't be a varied diet, and we'd replace our worry over whether there was enough with worries over blight destroying the crop. There would be fishing and we could trap birds, but the last reserves of the old world were almost gone. If the undead did stop, and I was on the it'll-never-happen swing of that particular cycle, then there might be hunting on the mainland. Maybe. Hunting what, I wasn't sure. Lions around Stonehenge? It would take years for whatever animals had survived to regain sufficient numbers that their populations would support us hunting them. Even then, they would be too far from Anglesey for that kind of meat to be anything but a luxury for teams scavenging on the mainland. Assuming that the elements spared enough of the old world for such looting excursions to be worthwhile, and assuming that the undead did stop. I watched as Daisy drew a finger through a spilled patch of her much thicker stew. Willow Farm is going to be the real problem, I murmured mostly to myself. We'll sort Bishop out after the election, Cholto said blithely. I kept the rest of my thoughts to myself. It was the secrecy surrounding Willow Farm that was causing me concern. The idea that it was becoming a state within a state before we'd properly established the first one. Cholto was right. It was a problem to be solved after the election. Then there were the other problems, like Soraka Locke. Kempton, and the rest of her refuges. We suspected that the survivors of those had all fled to Elysium, but that video Sholto had found proved suspicion wasn't enough. We might survive the election, deal with Willow Farm, and solve the food crisis only to discover Kempton and her people fortifying some island fastness just over the horizon. Daisy took a tentative lick of her finger, decided she didn't like the taste of cold table stew, and began drawing a shape through the spilled mess. It might have been a circle. It might have been a square. Don't do that, Daisy, Kim said. Wipe your hands. She held out a handkerchief. Instead, Daisy wiped her hands on her top, leaving sticky finger marks behind. I almost dropped my spoon. Fingerprints, I said. What? Annette asked. That's how we confirm that Agatha was the woman who shot at Callie. Who's Agatha? Annette asked. It's what we're calling the woman I killed, I said. That's a longer story. 
Well, I'd like to know there aren't any more of Kempton's people hiding somewhere in the city, waiting for us to leave. There was only one person living in that warehouse, Kim said, if you can call that living. Even so, I said, better we know now, and I would like to know. I'd like to be absolutely certain that we're not leaving a problem that'll develop into another crisis a few months from now. To confirm that Agatha was the one who shot Callie, all we have to do is take fingerprints from her corpse and compare them to... to... Uh, I'm not sure. The plastic crates she put the food in? Kim suggested. But what about somewhere near where she ambushed you? Perhaps she touched a car windscreen or something. Of course, she might have been wearing gloves. She might, I said, though it's worth checking. We could all do with a little certainty in our lives. On our way, we can collect some of the food she left in those boxes. Proper food? Annette asked. Sounds good? She pushed her bowl away. When do we leave? Chapter 6 Nevermore The 16th of October, Day 218, Belfast The deck was eerily empty as Kim, Siobhan, Colum and I stepped into the wire cage at the ship's side. Children, sailors, new recruits, everyone was watching the satellite feeds of the international airport, waiting for the plane to take flight. Everyone but us. You don't need to come, I said for the third time. This is my obsession. Nah, you're all right, Colum said. I want to say goodbye to the city, he added. Lena said I should. A bunch she utters more than four syllables in a row, it's wise to listen. I don't think she meant you should do it like this, Siobhan said, as she closed the gate. The chain clanked, the gears clacked, and the cage creaked as it swung out over the side of the ship and began its descent. And you don't need to do this either, Siobhan added. I don't think this is an obsession, I said. Not yet, but I first thought that the woman who shot Callie was Kempton. I just... I struggled to articulate the fear. It's the uncertainty, I said. I'd like to know that we're right about this one thing. It might not be an obsession, Siobhan said, but is it anything more than a distraction? That's what I said to him, Kim said. The cage jolted as the rubber pads hit the hard concrete of the key. It'll be good to get some food, if nothing else. Colum said, something to make the next leg of our journey palatable, even if it's not that comfortable. Then first we'll go to Agatha's corpse to collect fingerprints, Siobhan said. Then we'll head north towards the zoo, visit some of the properties marked on the map, gather prints from the plastic boxes, then look for some more prints at the site where she shot Callie. Call it three hours? Kim asked. Add another for safety, Siobhan said and we should be back by midday. That was when the plane was due to depart. Even if we weren't back by then, it wouldn't matter. The aircraft's flight path wouldn't take it over the city. Instead, Hickson planned to fly northeast, turning southward only when they were over the Irish Sea. You think this'll be the last time? Colum asked, as we followed the increasingly familiar route through the harbour. Going through Belfast? I asked. No, the plane, he said. Everyone was talking about this being the last time we get to see one take off. I'd rather see it land, I said. If it manages that safely, then I suppose we'll fly it again. I mean, now we've got a plane, we might as well use it. And again, I don't think we'll find a clear runway anywhere in Europe, and I can't see the point in sending an expedition inland to clear one. Then if it is the last flight... Colum said. I'm glad I'm not watching it. There were three sailors on guard at the harbour's entrance. I recognised Sergeant Conrad from the day before, and he was at the entrance with a woman who bore the single red-striped flag of Cape Verde on her tunic. The third was a sniper, crouched on top of a stack of shipping containers. Where are you going? Sergeant Conrad asked. We've business in town, I said. Didn't you want to watch the plane take off? He didn't answer the question. It's dangerous out there, he said. Our orders are that no one goes past this point. That's not your city, Colum growled. 
There was a quiet menace to his words that I had not heard in his voice before. We'll be back before the plane takes off, Siobhan said, offering the sergeant a way out. The man weighed that up, shrugged, and stepped out of the way. Kim took the lead, and we travelled with weapons ready. The streets were empty, at least of the moving undead. Near the harbour were the corpses that we and the sailors had killed. The bodies thinned, replaced with the slowly decaying creatures killed in the months before we arrived, and the even more occasional skeletal corpses of those who died while still human. It was only when we reached Greymount Road, near where I killed Agatha, that we saw the first of the living dead. The creature's shoulders were slumped, its head extended with its nose an inch from a brick wall stained by an overflowing gutter. Alive? Column half said, half asked. I wasn't sure, until the zombie's head slowly pivoted. Its jaw dropped open as Column stepped forward, hefting his axe to shoulder height. The creature's mouth shook, but its jaw didn't close. It didn't look like it could. The zombie banged into the wall as it tried to turn around, but before it pivoted more than forty degrees, Colum swung his axe. The heavy blade slammed into the zombie's skull, splitting it open before taking a chunk out of the damp brick wall. The corpse fell, splashing into the slime-filled gutter. Alive, Colum said, or not any more. This is how it's going to be from now on. Each one will see. We'll wonder if it's the last. We'll hope it is, until that hope is dashed by the sight of another. There's time for you to get all philosophical later, Javon said brusquely. It's too late to go back, so we go on, but remember why we're here. I know, Palm said. I'm here to say goodbye. I think it was a bad idea. Who wants to remember their city like this? I remembered the bad times he added, setting off down the alley. The Troubles? <laughs> what a name. That doesn't even come close to... But I didn't catch the rest. Siobhan hurried on, stepping past Colum to take the lead. I fell into step next to Kim. We shared a look, but said nothing until we'd almost reached Agatha's corpse. Two more of the undead were on that street, lurching westward towards us. One wore a duffel coat, Somehow, the hood was still up, hiding its wizened features from view. The right sleeve was missing at the shoulder, the arm nothing but a dark, dripping stump. The other zombie was a woman, or perhaps a girl. It was hard to tell. She'd been undead long enough for her skin to crack, her hair to thin, her lips to recede exposing rotting teeth. She'd unwittingly donned a T-shirt and cargo shorts as the clothes in which she'd died. That suggested that she dressed sometime during the height of the summer heat. On the T-shirt, the word Nevermore was picked out in shiny silver letters. The final E had been sliced through. That was the beginning of a savage blow that ran from armpit almost to waist. It was a blow that had cut cloth and sliced skin, but which hadn't killed the creature. I remember that T-shirt. I remember thinking that the word emblazoned on it was probably the last thing that the person who'd wielded that blow had read. The zombies staggered closer. Kim angled across the road, rifle raised. I spared a glance behind, but there were no undead there. Siobhan had her own rifle raised, the barrel moving between the two lurching creatures. Colum stood his shoulders slowly moving with each heavy breath. Don't fire, I said loudly, and more so Colin would hear a human voice than as an instruction to the two women. Save the ammo. I stepped forward. As I passed Colin, I glanced up into his face. His eyes looked distant, his jaw tight. I've got it, I said. Nevermore was faster than Duffelcoat possibly because it was more recently turned. It was hard to know, and dangerous to guess. I raised the short sword so the tip of the bulbous blade was level with Nevermore's eyes. The zombie staggered closer. I raised the blade a little higher, tilting it to a forty-five degree angle. 
the zombie swiped its arms forward. The motion caused it to sag at the waist. As its head dropped, I hacked the sword down. The blade sung through the air, slicing through the zombie's matted scalp and into its diseased brain. As it fell, I stepped back, quickly raising the sword again, expecting Duffelcoat to be only a few steps away. It wasn't. It had stopped ten yards from me. Its one arm hung loose by its side. Its face was in shadow beneath the hood, but I was sure that it was undead. It had to be, didn't it? A black-brown pus dripped from its arm. It had to be undead. It had to. Yet it didn't move towards me. I glanced at Colum and Siobhan and realized I was no longer facing the threat. Hurriedly, I pivoted to face the zombie, but the creature still hadn't moved. I took a tentative step forward. There was a vague shake to the zombie's shoulders, then a soft retort. The creature crumpled as a bullet flew under its hood and into its brain. Probably dying, Kim said, as she lowered her rifle. Probably, but not quickly enough. The plane will take off at noon, and if something goes wrong— and they do have to fly over the city. We don't want to be under the flight path. Fingerprints, remember? Agatha hadn't become a feast for the crows, mostly because it was seagulls that sat on the rooftops. They'd taken the woman's other eye and part of her cheek, presumably so they could get to her tongue, but otherwise left her alone. How quickly do birds learn? I asked as Siobhan opened her pack. Learn what? Kim asked. They don't eat the undead, I said. I think that's why they didn't eat the bodies of the survivors we found on Shore Road. The birds couldn't tell which were human and which were zombies. I was wondering how long it took them to learn, and how long it might take before they try eating the undead. How long will it be before all the corpses are picked clean? Otherwise, what are we going to do with the bodies? That's the problem we always come back to but burying them is no solution. That zombie in the duffel coat was dying. It has to have been. So it's a problem we need to address. Not right now, Kim said. Not until they're all dead. Except we won't know for certain that they're all dead, that they're no longer a threat until long after the fact, Colum said. What is it they say? Knowledge as power. I've always preferred the one that says a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. But does that make a lot of knowledge safe? Yeah, Lena thought this would be a good idea, but she was wrong. Say goodbye. I saw enough over the last few days, and that should have been enough for me. But I needed to see a little more. <laughs> well, I've seen it now. You mean those zombies? Kim asked tentatively. Yes. No, not really. There was a clothes shop near the gym, Colum said, that had hair and makeup, soft furnishings, that kind of thing. Nothing expensive, but it was all bright colors. Dress happy, be happy, that was their motto. Three women ran it. They'd come up with the idea in their final year of uni and opened it the day after graduation. Not sure where they got the money. Credit cards, probably. And again, they opened up around the corner from my gym so the rent wouldn't have been high. Personally, I'd have said it was the wrong location. Actually, if I'm honest, I'd have said it's the last place in the world three young women should open up a clothes shop. But this ain't busy enough. After they opened, I always made a point of working home past their place, just to check the doors and windows were locked. It's not the... well, it wasn't a great neighbourhood and the people who came to my gym might have been on the road to rehabilitation. But that's a road paved with temptation. Anyway, that was just before Christmas, last Christmas, around nine in the evening. Dean's brother was the only guy who'd come to the gym that night, so I'd locked up early and sent him home, mostly to see if he'd actually get there. Like every night, I went home the long route, past their shop. The lights were on, like I said. It wasn't a great neighborhood. I said they should lock up and I'd walk them home. It took a bit of persuading because they'd just taken delivery of their spring collection. 
They were taking a turn for the political, without being overt. I was going to be a new politics for a new generation, they told me. I've heard that before. I know it's a line that's been used in Ireland for longer than we've been divided, but I didn't say it. I didn't want to dampen their spirits. He stopped and took a step towards the dead zombie. They showed me what they were going to sell, and pride of place were T-shirts with never more printed on the front. You knew that woman? Siobhan asked. Er, no, I don't think so. Hard to tell, isn't it? No, but that's where the T-shirt came from. I blame Lena. She was wrong. Up until now, this last week, I've been able to walk these familiar streets as if it was a different city. Now I can't help but remember the people I knew. I'm glad I'm saying goodbye to it, but this is goodbye. After today, I'm not coming back. Never say never, Siobhan said. I've got fingerprints. I just need to take a photo, and then we're done. A photograph? Of her face? Kim asked. There's not much left. Not her face, Siobhan said. I want to photograph her feet. She took a smartphone from her pocket. I got this from your Annette. She filled it up with music. It's a bit poppy for my tastes, but it's nice to hear music again. No, fingerprints won't be enough. Nor would DNA, if this was the old world. Boot prints certainly wouldn't. None alone will paint a complete picture, so think of each as the paints. If we're lacking a tone or two, the rest will give us the shape of the whole, and from that we can guess the rest with absolute certainty. Done. She stood and looked at Colum. You okay? Sure, he said. That's not far. This is it, Siobhan asked, gesturing at the bullet-riddled minivan. That's it, I said. That's the bungalow we sheltered behind. Agatha was up there. I pointed up the road, just as a zombie staggered out of the undergrowth, about where that zombie was, though that was the last time I saw her. When she first started shooting, she was a little further up the road. Kim raised her rifle, tracking the creature as it stumbled towards us. She fired. The retort was muffled, though louder than the sound of the distant zombie collapsing. And the annals of crime scene contamination, that's a new one, Siobhan said. You three stay here. Can't we help? I asked. And risk destroying more evidence? No. Though you can make yourself useful and find another bullet. We've the one I extracted from Callie, but a few more won't hurt. Kim climbed onto the minivan's roof to stand watch. Colum sat on its bumper, and the car creaked in protest. Kim staggered and almost lost her balance. Sorry, Colum muttered. He laid his axe between his feet, turning and twisting the shaft so the head dug into the soil. I levered the door open and looked in the footwell for a spent bullet. Jack Dempsey lived near here, Colum said. Who's he? Kim asked. No one, really, Colum said. An impresario of a sort. Organized fates and fairs and small-scale concerts. Knew which permits to submit. How much clerks to file them with? I knew him, when I was young, when he was just starting out. You know how it is. You keep track of the people you're at school with. You follow their lives with a mixture of jealousy and pride. I didn't, Kim said. You're too young, Colum said. If the old world had gone on for a few more years, you might have done. Siobhan and I talked. She mentioned it, I said. You're going to Elysium. We're not sure about that, he said. But we're not going to settle in Anglesey. That isn't about what we want. It's the kids. And it's the dead. Sister Mary Teresa and all the others who died to protect the children. That's our job now. Mine and Siobhan's and Dean, Lena and Callie's. As much as protecting those three as our task as well. Six of them. Three teenagers. Three children. It's easy to talk about some sense of nationalistic duty to centuries of history and tradition, but that's only fireside talk to keep us entertained during the dark months ahead. You're staying in Anglesey? To see the election through, I said. It's unfortunate that it's played out this way, 
but I think something can be salvaged from it. Unfortunate or maybe inevitable. Either way, we can't leave yet. If you leave, wherever we've gone there'll be a welcome for you, Hollum said. Uh, there was a metallic clatter from behind the bungalow. Colum stood up. Kim jumped down. Sword raised, I edged towards the side of the wall. Something small and furry darted from behind the house and into the undergrowth on the other side of the road. A cat, I said, or maybe a fox. That was too large, Colum said. Considering how close the zoo is, I'd say it was something far more exotic. There was a whistle from further up the road. Siobhan was heading towards us. I got a palm print from the side of a parked car, photographs of some boot prints, and this. She held up a plastic carrier bag. What's inside? I asked. An empty magazine and a few spent casings. The magazine will give us a print. The casings will match the spent magazine to the gun that fired them. That's more than enough evidence to convict. Time to go back, then, I said, looking towards the undergrowth. I hoped, whatever it was, that there was a breeding pair. Time to go back, and go back to Anglesey. Time to get this election over with. What about the plastic boxes? Siobhan asked. Didn't you want to get some prints from those? Yes, I, uh, I was about to say that there was no point, that this search for proof was just displacement, a distraction from the far more pressing challenge ahead. But we had come all this way, and the food the previous evening had been particularly revolting. Why not? I said. We could do with some variety in our diet. Chapter 7 Oncoming traffic. I took a quick look at the photos of the map I'd taken from Agatha's corpse and picked Arthur Road. There were three properties marked with CF and a fourth marked PF. More importantly, it was close to the bombed-out shopping centre in Newton Abbey. We travelled close to there just before I'd shot Agatha, and I wanted another look. Though my current obsession was for the election first, food second, we would need other supplies soon enough. Belfast still presented the easiest opportunity to get them. Of course, what was left unsaid was whether those supplies would be for Anglesey or for Elysium. Arthur Road crossed the motorway at a bridge, and we were halfway across when there was a strangely alien beeping from Kim's pack. Was that phone? Colum said, almost with wonder. Kim took out the phone and handed it to me. Hello? I asked hesitantly, though I'm not sure why. Where are you? Sholto asked. You sound odd on the phone, I said. Bill, where are you? He repeated, his tone utterly serious. On a bridge over the motorway near Arthur Road, I said. We're Listen, he cut in. There are two fuel tankers heading towards you. They're driving them back from the airport. They're using the motorway. Understand? I didn't. Not immediately. I looked northwest up the length of the road. I couldn't see any vehicles. I could see a few spindly outlines of the undead gathered near a rubbish lorry driven half into the ditch at the motorway's edge. How long? I asked. How long do you have? I don't know, Shelto said. Five minutes? Ten? The undead are following the trucks. Find somewhere to shelter and call us back. You heard that? I asked. I have some questions, Kim said. But they can wait. Where can we shelter? How about the first house we come to? I suggested. It wasn't quite that. But five too long minutes later, we were outside a house that offered a clear view of the cemetery and the roads approaching it. The door was already broken held closed with a trio of wedges lodged into the jam. Probably Agatha, yes, Gollum said, as he worked them free. Zombie, Kim said, only one, I think. I glanced over my shoulder. It was heading towards us, but was still two hundred yards away. Kim knelt, but waited, holding her fire until Colum had the door open. She fired. The zombie crumpled. Only one she said again. 
we went inside and pushed the door closed. From the plastic crate on the kitchen table, it looked as if Colin was right. The house had been searched by Agatha, but it wasn't marked on the map. I wonder if Agatha did create this map, I said. In fact, I wonder if the map was made before Agatha got to Belfast. Maybe by Locke. Maybe by someone Agatha or Locke killed. The fingerprints will tell us, Trevorne said, opening her pack. She paused. I assume we're staying here for a while. Speaking of which, Kim said. She took out the sat phone, then went to stand by the window for a clear signal. I followed, trying not to look at the young couple and infant in the photograph strategically placed so that anyone coming into the house would see them. Opposite a cemetery is an odd place for a young couple to pick for their first home, Kim said, as she dialed. I wonder if it was because it was quieter than most roads. Less noise for the baby. Or was it because it was cheaper? Hello? Sholto? I leaned close so I could hear. Are you safe? Sholto's first words were to the point. Yeah, pretty much, Kim said. We're indoors. Can't see any undead. Not now. What's going on? What's wrong with the plane? Nothing, Sholto said. The plane's gonna take off in about twenty minutes, give or take. They took two tankers to the airport. Another two were heading to the harbor. Why? Kim asked. The Admiral wants the fuel, Charlto said. There's too much for the plane's tanks, so she's ordered her marines to drive half of it straight here. Why? Kim asked again. Yeah, good question, Charlto said. He sighed. Look, I, uh... Hang on, what? He asked, though he wasn't talking to us. Right, okay. Kim, you there? Still here, she said. I need to reposition the satellites. You said you were on Arthur Road, over the motorway? We're about three hundred meters northeast of that, Kim said, in a house opposite a cemetery. Then sit tight. The tankers will be driving past in about four minutes. Give them another twenty to get to the harbor. We'll see what the undead are doing, and then we'll find you a safe route out. I gotta go. Huh? Kim said, as the line went dead. She looked at the phone, then at me. The Admiral didn't say anything to you about bringing back fuel, she asked. Nope. Then again, I didn't tell her where we were going, I said. I'm not too clear who's at fault here. Her, Kim said, definitely her. She peered at the silent road, and then went into the kitchen. Cholto didn't have much to say, she said. Not more than what he'd already told us. We're to sit tight and wait, she summarized the call. Why does the Admiral want fuel? Colum asked. I guess to fly the plane, I said. Or maybe it's for the helicopter on the Amundsen. We can ask her when we get back, Shimon said. The food's spoiled, she added. Nothing in here we can eat. The box contained a few cardboard packets and a lot of fuzzy green-white mold. Looks like that was a chocolate pancake mix, Colum said. That's a shame. The kids would have... The phone beeped again. All four of us leaned in to listen. The first tank has made it through, Sholto said, his voice loud over a background of raised voices in the ship's command center. It's nearing the harbor. The other truck acted as a diversion. Major Lewis drove it into a... probably some kind of playing field or park. Can't really tell. It's bogged down. Where? Colum asked. Major Lewis isn't sure... You can see a sign above a shop that reads Bright and Light. Bright and Light Furnishings, Colum said. That's in the Valley Retail Park. That's about a kilometer from here. Right, Sholto said. At the moment, they're on the roof of the tanker, in a playing field opposite. You're going to have to sit tight. Hang on, I said. The roof of a tanker doesn't sound safe. How many people? Two, Sholto said. The Major and Private Kessler. On a metal container filled with flammable fuel, I asked. Valuable fuel, too, Siobhan said. I looked at Colum. Give me that tablet. Let me look at those maps. How many zombies are there? I asked Sholto. About fifty at the moment, he said. The Admiral's putting a team together now. We'll be there in half an hour. How many zombies followed that first tanker? I asked. 
because you'll have to fight your way through them if you want to travel straight through the city. Don't do that, Colum said. Bring a boat north to Hazelbank Park, where we brought the boat when we first went to the zoo. Tell him to ask Dean where it is. You heard that? I asked. I did. And you? Sholto asked. I looked to the other three. Colum nodded. Chavon shrugged. Kim gave a rueful smile. We're the help that comes to others, I said. Chapter 8 The Help That Comes Colum took the lead, Chavon and Kim close on his heels, while I struggled to keep up. Fear returned as they ran, and I loped through the empty streets. It was that same fear that had kept me in my London flat for so long, a tight knot of terror about heading into an unknown danger. But we are the help that comes to others. The Admiral came to our aid, albeit bringing news of new problems, but we couldn't not help. Whether that is who we are, I believe it is who we must become. Kim pivoted and spun, raising her rifle and firing a shot before running onward again. Ten seconds later, I passed the front garden, saw the corpse, but there wasn't time to stop and see any more. The street became a crescent, and Colum gestured ahead. We slowed as we approached the alley leading to the back garden. I listened. The birds were absent, but I couldn't recall if I'd heard or seen any since we'd left Agatha's corpse. The gate was already broken open, the splinters dull. Cautiously, we went through. There are some warehouses, Colum said, pointing at the fence. Then it's the leisure centre. Grass, tennis courts, football pitches, that kind of thing. Then you got the retail park. So, open space? Kim asked. Then we should see the truck before the undead see us. Ready? I don't think any of us truly was. The fence broke easily, and we trekked through and out the other side. The silence was getting to me. It was like a slow wave, rising and falling and filling my ears with nothing. The silence grew in volume until I realized it was sound, the sound of the undead ahead of us. We reached the edge of the leisure center's grounds and saw a zombie trudging across the dull green grass. It didn't turn around, but it forced us to hurry because where there's one... We took cover behind a concrete all-weather shelter at the end of an unmarked pitch. Wish I'd brought the rifle with me, Kim said, lowering the sniper's scope from her eye. But I'm glad I brought this. Take a look. Around forty of the undead were gathered close to the tanker. Two figures moved back and forth on top of it. I didn't hear the gunshot, but I saw a zombie fall as one of the figures fired a suppressed round into the mass of the undead. I took out the sat phone. We can see the tanker, I said when Sholto answered. Can you connect us to them? I can't reach him, he said. They're not answering. You can see him? Yeah, they're there, I said. We're still fighting the undead in the harbor, he said. A boat's on its way. It'll get to Hazelbank Park in about fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes to Hazelbank Park? We'll call you back. It'll take them another half hour for them to get here, Colum said. Assuming they don't get lost or get delayed fighting the undead, Siobhan said. I don't think those two have that long. The tanker was shifting, shaking as the undead battered into it. With each second more zombies arrived, the first of the long tail that had followed the tanker from the airport. Can't shoot them, Kim said, taking the scope back and putting it away. A 5.56 millimeter round will go straight through the undead and straight into the tanker. The second shot will create a spark, igniting the vapor. I assure you of that, Colum asked. She shrugged. Sure enough that I won't risk it. I think they're out of ammo, Javon said. We're running out of time. Kim sighed. She began unscrewing the silencer from her rifle. We should have planned for this, she said. We should have had a strategy. Some, I don't know, some flashbangs or something. As it is, we've got the rifles. Siobhan, take the silencer off. 
We're going to be the prey. We'll lure the undead away from the truck, or at least stop more from coming. Bill, Colum, you go in. Get the Marines out. Lead them away. When you're a safe distance, fire a shot from your pistol. My hand went to the belt where the sidearm was holstered, and often forgotten. And you? I asked. Kim eyed the expanse of the leisure center. It's a large building. There'll be plenty of exits. Worst case, I'll fire a few rounds into that tanker. If I can get it to explode, that should be loud enough to distract all the undead in this entire county. Unless you've got a better idea. We've no time for arguments. Good luck, I said. Same to you both, she said. Siobhan? Together they jogged towards the leisure centre. Well, this isn't quite how I thought I'd be saying goodbye to the city, Colum said, flexing his wrists. How long do we give them? Until we hear the first shot, I said. Then I guess we start walking. Colum's lips moved, as if he was trying to find something to say. Finally, they curled in a smile of regretful resignation. What an odd life the city has led. A minute quickly passed, then two, then five. Then came the shot, loud and clear, echoing across the park. A second followed soon after. I didn't see where the bullets hit, nor could I tell if Kim and Siobhan were even aiming at the zombies. But I saw some undead heads turn, while other lurching creatures abruptly stopped. I think that's our cue, Colum said, and we started walking towards the tanker. For the first few feet, I waved the sword above my head. My arm was already growing tired from having carried it for so long, so I let it fall to my side. The Marines would know we were alive soon enough. I'm trying to think how many times I've done this, I said. Kim's right. We need a better way, better tactics. We need for people not to be driving trucks through unfamiliar cities, Colum said. As we drew nearer to the tanker, more of the undead that had followed the vehicle became visible. It wasn't a horde, but more like a series of long, thin lines that, as the firing continued, slowly changed direction, heading towards the leisure center. So were some of the creatures near the tanker, but not all of them. I could see the undead coming from the direction of the retail park and along the road to the west. In five minutes, maybe less, there would be a hundred undead surrounding the vehicle. More immediately, two zombies that had been staggering towards the truck turned towards the shots and saw us. Colum picked up his pace. His walk turned to a jog, and then a sprint, as he swung his axe up and around his head in a giant arc. He brought it down, cleaving through the first zombie's neck. Its body crumpled. Its head fell, bouncing into the long grass. Colum didn't stop moving. He twisted, pivoting with a grace that belied his size, bringing the axe up and around until it was over his head. With a shallow leap, he brought it down on the second zombie's skull. The blade cleaved through skin, brain, and bone, cutting deep into the creature's throat. Still moving, he dragged the dead zombie for three paces until the weapon was free, and then he kept running. I hurried to catch up. More shots came, and I no longer looked to see if they hit. There were four zombies in the hundred yards between us and the truck, another eight immediately next to it, and far more on either side. Colum, already twenty yards ahead of me, swung the axe high, smashing it into a creature's necrotic face. He swung it low, brute force smashing the next zombie's legs to splinters. Left and right, he hacked and hewed, never uttering a word. I had to pause, stabbing the sword down at the zombie whose legs he'd broken. I looked at the truck. The two marines had crossed the vehicle's far side, hopefully to lure the zombies away from the direction we came. Colum reached the truck and hacked at the creatures pushing and clawing at the vehicle's side. There was a dull crack as the weapon smashed through bone and brain, then a sharp grinding screech as the blade rasped against the metal tank. Hey! I yelled, finally breaking my silence, hoping that Colum would hear me as much as the two marines. I ducked under the outflung arm of a zombie in a trench coat. 
I stabbed the sword up and under its chin. The zombie went limp. As I wrenched the sword free, I looked down the length of the truck. There were dozens of creatures, an endless sea of snapping mouths and clawing hands. Hey, jump! Come on! It was all I could think to say. It was enough. There was the sharp crack of an unsilenced shot, but it didn't come from the leisure centre. It came from the roof of the truck as one of the marines, an older man I assumed was Major Lewis, fired his sidearm down into the undead. Four shots came in quick succession, followed by an echoing trio from Kim and Siobhan. The Major grabbed the private and half threw, half lowered her down the side of the vehicle. I hacked the sword low, aiming for the next zombie's legs. When I turned around, the Major had already jumped down. He had his pistol in one hand, the other clutching the private's collar. Which way? he yelled. That was a very good question. I'd wanted to lead them away from the shooting, but right now the only direction we could travel was away from the truck, and that meant heading towards the leisure center, the same place that the majority of the undead were lurching. The leisure center, I said. Column? Column! I had to grab the back of the boxer's coat, and then duck as his arm came around in a surprisingly fast swing. Time to go, I barked, and pushed him after the two marines, one of whom I realized was limping. The major hadn't been dragging the private. He'd been supporting himself on her. Colum pushed her away, swung the major's arm around his neck, and helped the man on. We were moving faster now, but not as fast as the undead. We weren't going to outpace them. The leisure center, I called out. We need to get inside, get through. Get out the other side. If they can't see us, they can't follow us. I looked over at the private. Her eyes were glassy, almost unseeing. She still held her rifle, though, clutched in a white-knuckled grip. Any bullets left for that? I asked. She didn't seem to hear. Private, your rifle, any ammo left? Sir, no, sir, she barked. This isn't Paris Island, though even I wish it was. I pulled a semi-automatic from my holster and shoved it into her hands. Hope you're a good shot, I said, but I'm certain you're a better one than I. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, she stammered. But her eyes were more alert, her gaze going left and right. Hostiles ahead! Save the ammo, I said, as two zombies staggered around the edge of the leisure center. We were close to the building now and there was no obvious way in. There was no easily climbable scaffolding, no support struts or ladders leading up to the roof. There was a fire door, set in the middle of a row of opaque windows. The major raised his gun, in a hand far steadier than his feet. Don't fire, I called out. The fire door, twenty yards, one o'clock. The zombies staggered closer. Another one appeared around the side of the building, with three more immediately after it. Immediately behind us came the undead from the truck. It seemed like hundreds, seemed like thousands. I don't know how many there were exactly, but it was more than we could fight. Doors locked, Colum said, letting the private take the major's weight. He gave the doors another shake. The windows, I suggested. I realized that it was a while since I'd last heard a shot from Kim and Siobhan. I couldn't remember how long. The zombies were getting closer from both directions. Colum swung his axe into the glass. The axe cut through, but the glass coated in paint and plastic didn't shatter. Colum pulled as I raised the sword, and the two marines readied their guns. Colum tugged his axe free, then chopped again at the glass, cutting through the bottom corner of the pane. Spiderweb veins crinkled the laminated coating. He pulled his axe back and shoulder-charged the window. This time, the glass broke. He staggered inside. Go, go! I barked, in unison with a the major, then hacked the sword at the legs of the nearest creature. The blade sliced through rotting cloth and decaying flesh, and I drew it back just as the zombie's arm swiped towards my hand. The motion caused the zombie to topple. As it lay between me and the rest of the growing pack, I backed away, 
turned around and ran into the room. Mirrors covered each wall. The interior was filled with exercise bikes. I pushed one over and then another as I forced my way through their narrow ranks towards the room's only door. The major stood there, the barrel of his gun pointing unwaveringly at the undead thrashing their way into the room. As I reached the doorway, I heard a clatter behind me. I didn't need to look around to know that the undead were knocking the bikes over. The major's hand moved left to right from one target to another. He didn't fire, but limped back through the doorway. We pushed the door closed, but with the lock now broken, there was no way of securing it. We've got twenty rounds, the major said. Down here, Column called. It was halfway down the corridor. It was about ten feet wide, covered in posters exhorting athleticism. I was more interested in the dead body halfway between us and Colum. Did you do this? I asked the Major as we passed it. The creature had been shot in the head, and recently, judging by the fresh gore dripping from its cracked skull, it was already dead, the Major said. Must have been Kim or Siobhan, I said. More saliently, it meant that the undead were already in the building, and where there's one zombie... Height? Colum said, as we reached him. That's what we want, right. Somewhere to wait for rescue. The door was windowless, as was the stairwell beyond. I pushed the door to, drew my knife and wedged it in the gap at the bottom. It wouldn't hold the door for long, but it might be long enough. You don't have your sat phone, do you? I asked as we climbed the stairs by torchlight. Colum first, then the Marines, then me. I— The private began. We lost it. The major cut in. You got yours? Kim's got it, I said. Our sniper. You want to find a sniper? You look for the high ground, the major said. Of course, they'll see you long before you find them. Come on, Kessler. We're on the home stretch. Yes, sir. I had questions. Quite a lot of them. Most of which concerned precisely why they were driving a tanker full of fuel through the city but this wasn't the time. There was a banging below us as the undead reached the door. Shh! The Major and I hissed in unison. The banging came again, but it didn't sound like a concerted effort to get into the stairwell. It was possible, just possible, that the undead didn't know where we'd gone. We reached the first floor landing. Let me sit down, the Major said, pushing himself away from the private and collapsing onto the stairs. There was a clatter from his gear as it hit the cold concrete. You okay? I whispered, listening to the sound echoing from below. I'll be fine, he said. You guys go on. Get her home. We don't leave anyone behind, the private said. Come on, sir. The major waved her off. Let me see your leg, I said, bending down. By the light of my torch, I saw what I should have noticed long before. It wasn't a sprain. The man had been bitten just above the ankle. It wasn't a deep cut and it wasn't bleeding much, but enough skin had been ripped away that the man surely had been infected. Are you immune? I asked. Oh, so, he said. Gollum pushed open the door to the first floor corridor. Seems clear out here, he said. Go on, the Major said. We don't leave people behind, either, I said. Column, see if you can find Kim and Siobhan. We need that sat phone. Private, give me a hand. I reached for the Major. His skin was cold. You're going to be fine, I said. I met his eyes, and he knew I was lying. Ever been to Virginia? He asked. Beautiful country. Make sure she gets home. Promise me. I glanced at the private, then looked at the major, but his eyes were vacant. I pressed my hand against his throat. I found no pulse. I took a step back. The major's eyes flickered. The lids closed. They opened. The man's mouth dropped. He snarled. Before I could raise my sword, there was a roar, a gunshot that echoed up and down the stairwell. 
The bullet took the major in the head. The private lowered her steady hand. It's what he... I... I snatched the major's pistol from the step, grabbed the private's shoulder, and hustled her through the door. As it swung shut, I heard thumping and thudding in the stairwell below. I wished the private hadn't fired, hadn't alerted the undead to where we were, but my abiding feeling was gratitude, that I had not had to kill Major Lewis myself. The worst part was still to come. Colum had heard the shot and was hurrying towards us. He wasn't alone. Kim and Siobhan were with him. Where's the Major? Siobhan asked. Infected. Dead, I said. I called in our position, Kim said. The boat's almost at Hazelbank Park, but if we can reach the other side of the building, I think we can get out of here. We're not surrounded. Then let's do it. Lead the way, I said. I had to push the private along, but even so, and even with my legs slowing us down, we reached the fire escape on the far side of the building and made it safely outside. Kim and Siobhan had reattached the silencers to their rifles, Despite the noise of the gunfire earlier, they'd only used thirty rounds apiece. There were undead in the car park, where the two women shot one, and then the next, as Colum and I hustled the private away. Within ten minutes, we were back among the residential roads of suburban Belfast. Ten minutes after that, we ran into the rescue party. That was the worst part. Less than an hour after the Major died, we were on a boat, safe. If he'd not been in that truck, if he'd not been bitten, if he'd only been immune, if, if, if. Chapter 9 Postmortem Do you drink? the Admiral asked, opening a cabinet at the side of the desk. Not today, I said. The Admiral shrugged and closed the door without taking out a bottle. She sat down on the other side of the plain desk in her plain stateroom. What is it, Mr. Wright? she asked, leaning back in her chair. Where to begin? I replied. The ship rocked as it ploughed through the waves. The motion was unfamiliar and unsettling, but at least we were returning to Anglesey. Why do you want the aviation fuel? I asked. There's little point in having the plane or the helicopter sitting on the deck behind us unless we have fuel. Wasn't that your original plan? To gather fuel from the airport to power the vehicles on the island? Sure, before we learned of Svalbard, I said. That doesn't really answer the question. Do I owe you an answer? She asked. The death of Major Lewis is my responsibility but the justification belongs to my crew, to his friends. The Major's body was still where it had fallen. The undead were too dense a presence around the leisure centre for it to be removed, or for the tanker to be retrieved. Twenty sailors and marines had stayed in Belfast on the John Cabot, the container ship in which we'd sought refuge after arriving in the city. Ostensibly, they were there to retrieve the corpse after the undead had dispersed. I saw them as something between an occupation force and settlers. The trip to the airport was simply a ploy to get people to leave their boats, I said. When they went ashore to look at the satellite images, the mission should have been cancelled. I would have cancelled it. You weren't there, and you aren't in charge. I raised my hands in surrender and found my eyes drawn to the stubs of my missing fingers. When did you last lose someone? I asked. To the undead? Cape Verde, she said. But well, we lost Hendricks the night that your people found our ship. He disappeared. It was probably suicide, though I didn't record it as such. But he was the only suicide. The rest of us had given up hope that anyone was left on Earth. He was the only one shocked to learn that the truth was almost that. Hendricks had held on to a belief that America was still there, that a few million might have died, but the rest and his family would be alive. 
This won't be the last suicide, and the Major won't be the last death, I know that. When we reach America, when people see familiar storefronts, familiar houses, albeit in unfamiliar towns, they will remember their families and the unjust fate that befell them. No, Hendrix won't be the last, nor will the Major. But what would you have us do? Hide on Anglesey like Marcus once? You know what I did a year ago? You were a naval doctor, I said. I was a doctor, she agreed. That has been my life. Not a physician in a hospital, but a surgeon on the battlefield. Soldiers and civilians, shot, bombed, burned, stabbed, raped, gassed. I've seen it all. I've seen it all on the same day. That's what I did. I refused to let it be what defined me. Then came the outbreak. Now? Now all we have left is a veneer of military discipline, our flag, and a memory of the country for which it flew. It's a hard road you've got to walk, I said. I appreciate that. It's as hard as anyone else's. That being said, I'd still like to know what you plan to do with a plane. Fly it, the Admiral said. What's the range of a VC-10? I asked. A few thousand miles? Four and a half thousand, the Admiral said. That'll get you from Anglesey to the Channel Islands and back over England and Wales a few times. It'll get you over the continent and even North Africa at least once. You won't find anywhere to land, so why go twice? Why did you want the tankers as well as what went into the plane's fuel tank? There are no airfields unless we clear them. To do that, we have to send people there overland, in which case, why bother sending the plane? Why indeed? America? I guessed. You've made it clear that's your destination. I just can't see why you'd want the plane. It's not large enough for all your people, even if they traveled without their gear. No, she said, seeming to weigh up how much to share. No, you're right. A plane's primary purpose is to travel between places quickly, but it can be put to other uses. I've no interest in Europe. America is my home, our home. I promised my crew that we would return, and it is that more than anything else which keeps order. What do we do when we return? After we have seen the ruins of some coastal city and confirmed it as bad as our worst expectations, what then? I will not have our expedition simply be one in which I allow my people to go home to die. No. There needs to be a purpose to our journey. And there is only one purpose left for any of us. We must ensure that there is a future for our species. It is not an Anglesey. But wherever it is, we will need more people. How do we find them? As you say, a thousand people came ashore on Anglesey and examined the satellite images of Ireland. Along with your group, three survivors were found in Dublin. That's a week's work by a thousand people to the net gain of eleven souls. Thirteen, if we count yourself and Kim. But do we also subtract those who died? No, when we get to America, we will not repeat the mistakes we made here. By using the plane? People in coastal communities might be watching the shore, but what are the odds they're watching it precisely when our ship sails by? We can set up searchlights, but they will only be seen for a few miles inland. Winter is coming. It will be hard for all of us, harder still for those scrabbling for survival in the American interior. How do we let them know that there is a sanctuary worth them abandoning their refuge and risking a dangerous trek through ice, snow, and the undead. We need a sign, a signal, and what better one than a plane flying overhead? That is why we need that plane. We may not find another. What did you say the range was? Four thousand miles. That won't get you to the U.S. That's enough to reach Canada, she said. Is there an airfield? I don't know but we can clear a stretch of coastal road if needs be. We'll carry the fuel from the tankers in our ship, we will refuel the plane, and then we will fly over New England. 
After that, the fuel will be gone, I said. We'll look for more, the Admiral said. Well, there would hardly be any point if we didn't have a plane into which to put it. We'll find some, or we won't. But we will look. We will try. What more can we do? What more can any of us do? So you fly the plane overhead, hope people see it, and head towards where it lands. We could do that in Europe. We could do it in Britain. We wouldn't even need to land, but have the plane head to the coast where ships could be waiting, ready to bring the survivors to Anglesey. That is not where my crew come from, the Admiral said. They want to go home. And they will. Whether I take them there or not, they will go. Better, it is an organized group where we'll have a better chance of making it out alive. What about Elysium and Belfast? It sounds like you're not planning to come back to Wales. I call those insurance, the Admiral said. Not for this year, but for the next five years. We don't know what we'll find in America. It might be a radioactive wasteland. The undead might not die. We might find no survivors. In which case, when the plane is out of fuel, we may need to return and... But she stopped. I took a guess at what she was going to say. If you don't occupy Elysium, Marcus will. If America is uninhabitable, then you will need somewhere for your people to call home. I don't think you plan for it to be Elysium. I think you mean Anglesey. And that would be easier to seize if you begin the expedition in a safe harbour on this side of the Atlantic. My duty is to humanity and to my crew, the Admiral said. I think the two are interchangeable. How long will it take to cross the Atlantic to clear a road for the plane to land? How many people across Europe might die in that time? She shrugged. Not in indifference, but in indication that her mind was already made up. I could stop you, I said. Perhaps. But you won't, she said. If I thought you would try, then you and your family would have been taken straight to Elysium. That's why you let Annette and Daisy come with shelter. <laughs> I was at a loss for words. I mean you no harm the Admiral said, nor even your brother, who made a mockery of our most sacred institution. But as I told you, my duty is to humanity and to my crew. I won't let anything get in the way of that. Anyway, we're heading to Anglesey, and I told you what I planned because I know you can be trusted. You want a safe refuge from your family, and you know that Anglesey won't be that place after Marcus wins. You need me, Mr. Wright so you will keep your silence on this matter. I bit back my anger. For now. But I'll need something in return. What? I don't know, I said standing up, but it's always good to stockpile favors. It's a dark end to a dark trip, I said. It's not that bad, Chalto said. You're only saying that because you want to go back to America, Kim said. What have we really achieved this last month? Simon, Will, and Lilith are dead at the hands of Rob. That he died hardly makes up for it. We found some survivors, but could have found more if we'd arrived only an hour sooner. There were the ponies on Connemara and a tortoise in Belfast, but other than birds and whatever it was we saw near the zoo, they're the only animals we've seen. Elysium is habitable but less so than we thought, and now it's occupied by marines. The same can be said for Belfast, as long as you count a rusting container ship in the harbour as being in the city. And forget Major Lewis, I said. I won't, Kim said. No, I don't think I'll forget that in a hurry. And there's the ammunition expended, the rations used, the ship oil, and time, of course. We've got a plane, Shalto said. The Admiral has a plane, Kim said, and she has Elysium and Belfast and a scheme to take all the fuel from Svalbard. What do we have? A place with her, if it all goes wrong, Shalto said, but it won't. Marcus won't win the election. 
which won't stop the Admiral from leaving, Kim said. So we let her, I said. We make her departure and that of the plane seem like it was the plan all along. I'm sure we can come up with a rationale for that. I don't know if I believe her. Does she really want the plane to find survivors in America? Or is removing the plane from Anglesey like the oil, ammo and shutting down the power plant a ploy to further force Marcus into a suicidal attack? Probably both. But the bigger issue, the one we've not really addressed, is whether Umbert will make the kind of leader we'd want. I'd say he's all right, Chalto said. Not the greatest candidate, but not the worst. What's he like as a man? Kim asked. What's he going to be like as a leader? What's... The door opened. Annette came in. You're going to miss it, she said. We're getting close to Anglesey. Chapter 10 Homecoming The 17th of October, Day 219, Anglesey Though we'd sailed through the night, and we had to wait until dawn to approach the harbour, and that approach was made agonisingly slowly, it was gone ten o'clock before we stepped off the ship. I wasn't expecting a welcoming committee, I said, but it looks like I wasn't disappointed. But I thought a few people might have come to meet us. It's the signs, isn't it? Kim said. You expect there to be customs and police, baggage handlers and smiling ferry staff welcoming you to Wales. Instead, the ferry terminal at Hollyhead was echoingly empty. The signs were still there, but it felt as abandoned as any ruin we'd seen in England or Ireland. The only clue that this was the entry point to what remained of civilization was the trio standing in the otherwise empty lounge. Mary O'Leary sat in her wheelchair. George stood next to her, his arm still in a sling. A British sailor stood behind. I don't know the man's name, but I recognized him as one of the Veerman's crew. After what had happened to Donny, I wondered if the man was a bodyguard as much as a driver for Mary's wheelchair. Kid Millefelcher, Mary said warmly, and loudly enough to echo around the cavernous chamber. Aren't you all a sore sight for weary eyes? Yes, you're very welcome here, very welcome indeed. Tamara, Billy and Charlie took a step back under the onslaught of such an effusive greeting. Siobhan stood her ground, but only just. How do you do? Colm said. You'd be Mary O'Leary. Now how did you guess that? Mary replied with a smile directed at the trio of children. But weren't there more of you? Dean and Lena are staying with Callie for now, Siobhan said. Ah, the poor girl who was shot, of course, Mary said. Behind us, sailors began streaming past. Well, we can't stand here getting in the way. Come, please, we've clean clothes, hot water and warm food waiting. We'll go with you, Kim said. I know I could do with a hot shower. Come on, Annette. I was going to go with Sholto, she said. Kim raised an eyebrow. Fine, Annette said. She handed Daisy to my brother. Come on, then, she said to the children, took a step and turned towards Mary. Where are we going? Mary laughed. Let's give them the tour. Daisy struggled in Sholto's grip as the group processed from the room. The flow of sailors slowed to a trickle, and soon it was only Sholto, Daisy, George and myself left in the hall. A longer trip than you planned, George said. It was, I said. I'm going to leave you two to discuss it, Sholto said. Come on, Daisy, let's get you home. There was a depth to his tone that suggested he was glad for the excuse to leave. How's your arm? I asked George. Ix, all the time, he said, walking over to one of the wide windows that looked down over the harbour. How about yourself? How did the leg hold up? My brain forgets I can't move as fast as I'd like, I said. What did you think of the pike? The, oh yeah, I left that at Elysium. It was good, a little too long in the shaft. It seemed like an age since he'd given it to me. The harbour seems quiet, I said. That's what's missing. I didn't notice it as we were sailing in, but the boats are gone. Not gone. 
George said. Oh, we did lose a few. Had a storm a couple of weeks ago. Had another last week. Lost twenty souls. At least I think it was twenty. There's a margin of error because we don't know how many were on the boats. Not exactly. That's the real tragedy here. Twenty gone, I echoed. No, about twenty dead, George said. Another fifty or so who upped and left. Their boats never returned. Don't know where they went, but the seas were calm, so we assume they made it. What about the rest? Where are the other boats? I asked. Around the coast. Most people have come ashore. The weather did that. Mary was right. The first whiff of winter caused everyone to dart for dry ground. Some have harbored their boats near their new homes. The rest of the craft had been beached along the shore. Most of those were on the verge of sinking anyway. My concern is for the sailing boats that are being used for fishing. If we lose them, well, one problem at a time. Chief Watts wanted a word with me. I know it won't be good news. I know that there's nothing I can do to fix today's problem. But the chief is a man who likes to spread bad news around. We can walk and talk. He turned his back on the window. You missed the plane's arrival. Everyone came to see it land. Well, most people. The farmers on the Parsons' farm were too busy with a ploughing contest. Three teams, three fields, and a prize for the quickest, straightest furrow. You should check them out. There are some good ideas there. Willow Farm didn't turn out either, but that was in protest at the technology. That man, Bishop, he went as far as holding a rally in the evening. There were some fishers at sea, a few surgeons who were operating, a mother in labor, and another two who, well, all told there were about six thousand people gathered at the airport. It was quite a sight. Six thousand? I wish I'd seen it. Yes. I don't know whether we'll see the like again, George said. Marcus gave a speech. He did? To all six thousand, George said. It wasn't meant to be him, of course. I'd arranged for Dr. Umbert to say a few words. While Dr. Umbert was walking out onto the runway, Marcus started talking from his spot in the crowd. It brought a loud hailer. He's not the most gifted of public speakers, but he talked for a long while about the future and the past, about what we could have again. The man even promised we could fly people home. You know, those people who weren't originally from Britain. Madness and nonsense, but the content wasn't important, because he kept talking until the crowd grew bored. Umber tried to say a few words, but people drifted away while he was talking. Did you hear what happened to Donny? Someone attacked him. Not quite. Someone undid the screws, holding a ladder in place. We told everyone that he slipped and fell, but it was definitely sabotage. Captain Devine's certain of that. We didn't want it widely known. Of course— Partly because we've no idea who did it, and partly because we're not too sure whether Donny was actually the target. Then who was? I asked. Well, now, that's the question, George said. Donny was over on one of the grain ships giving them an inspection. That's not his job, of course, but it was a duty he'd taken on himself. I'm not entirely sure why, and he can't remember. That sounds bad. It's not. Not really. He can't remember the day it happened, and his skull was fractured, but beyond that he's fine. Or he will be. Until we know why he went to the ship, we can't be sure that anyone else knew he was going there. Thus we can't be certain that he was the person being targeted. The captain's investigating, of course— Whoever the target actually was, it's still an attempted murder. We're just not sure that Marcus was behind it. 
That's one more problem to be dealt with. After the election, George said, and as Mary keeps reminding me, we should leave the detective work to the police. Do you think Marcus is going to win? I asked. After that stunt at the airport? Probably. Get the door, would you? No, not those. We managed to restore electricity to most of the harbour, but no one can figure out how to get the automatic doors here to work. Use the emergency door to the side. I pushed the door open and was immediately struck by the smell of fish and smoke. It was very different from the earthy peat of rural Ireland, the damp decay of Belfast, and the salty spray of the sea. The smell of life, I said. The sound, too. That had been muffled inside the terminal building, but Hollyhead seemed noisier than before. That might have been a function of being surrounded by so few people for so long. A handcart was being pushed along the street, the back filled with an odd assortment of pipework that must have been stripped from some nearby house. George raised a hand and got a perfunctory nod from one of the three pushing the cart. They're meant to be expanding the industrial laundrette, he said as they passed. We're running low on clean clothes, and I don't want to waste time sending an expedition for more. Better we clean what we have although that's a lot of pipes. I wonder if they're building a still on the side. One more thing to check on an increasingly long list. We'll take the scenic route. Yes, Marcus is a problem, but he's not my problem. Captain Devine couldn't find anything illegal going on in that pub of his, at least nothing that could be directly pinned to him. He walked past another old pub that was being cleared out. Morning, Prudence, George called to the woman scrubbing the windows. How long until you open? Any day now, George, the woman replied. Any day now. George didn't speak until we were out of earshot. Now that, he said, is either blind optimism or blinkered stupidity. I can't work out which. She wants to open a restaurant. Fair enough, says I. Trouble is, we don't have a currency or an economy, and soon we won't have any food. Is there something wrong with the fish? Oh, we'll have fish as long as we have boats, George said. But there's a problem with the grain. A mould took root in one of the cargo carriers. Maybe it was a fungus. Do they root? Anyway, a spore must have been carried into the other ships. It spread. We'll be out of grain by Christmas. Christmas? I stopped in my tracks. George didn't, and I had to hurry to catch up. We'll be out of grain in a matter of weeks. Hence the ploughing competitions, and Heather Jones dragging people into Menai Bridge. She's been setting up indoor greenhouses. They're sort of halfway between hydroponics and a hothouse. The potential is quite impressive, but the present reality is that it'll give us the seed stock we'll need next year, but only a small supplement to our diet this winter. Yes, uh, Sholto mentioned the work going on in Menai Bridge, but what are we going to eat in January? Well, if we have boats, we have fish. I don't think we'll starve, but it's going to be short rations for a long while too short to justify a restaurant, but Prudence always dreamed of opening one. I told her that she shouldn't, that it would be a wasted effort, but I couldn't tell her about the impending crisis. That meant there really wasn't any reason for her not to give it a go. She'll realize her mistake soon enough, though probably not before she starts writing the menus. <sighs> I mulled that over. I heard food was tight. Didn't realize it was quite that bad. No, son, George said. You didn't realize how much we've been relying on the old world. Not just for food, of course, but for everything. We're like an upside-down pyramid, resting on the quicksands of time. The question is whether we sink before we topple over. 
That analogy sounded like one of Mary's. Do you know about the Admiral? I asked. What about her? She's claimed Elysium, and Belfast too, by the look of the way we left things. Is there much there? George asked. In Belfast? More than in Bangor, I said. But not enough. Not much food to speak of, nor any fuel. So you do know. What about the deal with Svalbard for the oil? It's not like we have much use for it, George said. I know, I know, we could find a use. But why go to the trouble when the Admiral's got one on the table? She left about twenty people in Belfast. We lost a Marine. Major Lewis. I got the radio report, George said. A pity, but most deaths are, always have been. Now with so few of us, the cloud of grief isn't spread so thin. You know, she asked me and Mary to go with her. To America? I asked. To Ireland, George said. Mary's always wanted to return, but the island she wanted to return to died in February. If you ask me, the island she wants to return to is the one from her youth, and I know too well that you can't go back. Are you thinking of going to Elysium, then? George stopped. I was an old man, ready for the grave, he said, all joviality gone from his voice. I met Mary, and she gave me a new lease. Then there was the outbreak. That certainly extended my lease on life, but I was borrowing it from the only end available. He tapped his slung arm. The bullet took that away. We're old, Mary and I. We're an old couple who escaped a retirement home. I drove a bus and then dabbled with middle management. Mary was a teacher. We're not leaders. We're not generals. We're not politicians. You are. You wanted to be prime minister. That was your goal, wasn't it? You planned on getting Jen Masterton to number ten, and then you planned on following her there. Well, this was your shot. This was your chance. This was what you wanted. A chance to lead. You were meant to be the candidate, not Donny. He's still just a kid. And look what happened to him. He started walking. You were meant to be the candidate, he repeated. He stopped again. Seriously, did I have to spell it out for you? You had the book, didn't you? What book? A playbook? I asked, confused. Every politician who wants to lead writes a book, George said. Everyone read your journal. Everyone knew you. They knew the worst of you. All you had to do was prove that you were now the better part. The journal? Wait, did you put a net up to it? Did you get her to copy it? Me? Not me, he said. Mary, then. Your destiny came knocking, George said. You knew there was an election. I told you to organize it, and what did you do? You wrote into the rules that the person running it couldn't be a candidate. And then you left for Ireland. I only went because Sholto twisted his ankle. Yeah, right, George said. He walked up the hill. Consciously or subconsciously, you knew what was being asked of you. How did you respond? You ran away. What we have now is a mess of your making. That makes it your problem. Yes, we're running out of food, of ammo, of people, of time. Mary and I have less of it left than anyone else. After what we've done, we've earned the right to enjoy a few months of peace. The question is whether we'll find that peace here. Now, I've got to speak to Chief Watts about the power plant. You better speak to your candidate. You didn't pick him, but he is yours. I watched George walk slowly up the hill. 
and then turned around. The old man wasn't telling me everything. It seemed like everyone had their own schemes and plans, and if Dr. Umbert was going to win the election, I needed some of my own. I went to find the candidate. Chapter 11 The Third Candidate Ah, Bartholomew, Dr. Umbert said cheerfully. How are you? How are the children? The children are fine, I said, as I took in the tea room that had become Umbert's campaign headquarters. Most of the tables had been pushed together, making room for eighteen people to sit down. The chiller cabinets had been covered with a hand-painted poster that read, Our Choice, Our Future. Children can be remarkably resilient, Umbert said, but it's important to remember that resilience is often only skin deep. Is Daisy sleeping through the night? Um, not the last few nights. Four hours, I think, was the most, I said. You are on a ship. Unfamiliar surroundings can play havoc with a child's routine, and routine is important. How is Annette? Does she still have the nightmares? We're all fine, I said. But I didn't come here to talk about the children. Don't you think there should always be time to talk about the children? Umbert asked. Maybe, I said, not willing to get drawn in. I'd met him a few times during our early days on the island, when he'd been treating Daisy and Annette. From the first, I felt that he was analysing everything I said, and with that analysis came a judgement he never shared. You're back, a woman said, in a familiarly soft Scottish brogue. I turned around and saw Lorraine come through from the back of the tea room. Shockingly, she wore a suit of dark maroon with a flash of black along the skirt's hem and the jacket's collar. Perhaps even more shocking were her heels. They were only an inch high, but it was the first time since the outbreak I'd seen anyone dress so impractically. Hi, Lorraine, I said. Nice outfit. I thought I should dress the part, she said. And what part's that? I asked. I'm the official clock watcher, she said, also known as campaign coordinator. Sholto said you've been helping out, I said. Huh. She gave a dismissive grunt, which, considering Sholto's plans, I could easily interpret as meaning she was running the campaign while he was plotting its subversion. What about you, Dr. Umbert? Why aren't you in a suit? I asked. Umbert wore a pair of dark combat trousers, clean but unpolished boots, and a blue woolen jumper. It wasn't quite wasteland wear, but it wasn't candidate casual either. Please, call me Lionel, Umbert said. As for my clothes, Marcus wears a suit, a three-piece with a lightning blue lining. The level of ostentation is interesting, betraying the man's own deep-seated insecurity. He doesn't know how to be a politician, so he tries to look like one instead. It's obvious that conflicts with his desire to take advantage of these extraordinary circumstances and dress in a fashion that he has always admired. I imagine it comes from his childhood. Uh, Lorraine gave a loud cough. Ah, yes. Umber changed tack, returning to topic. This is my Man of the People outfit. He looked uncomfortable, with a tone to match. But he didn't look out of place. Smart move, I said. Lorraine relaxed fractionally. How's the campaign going? Slow and steady, Umbert said. Aye, Lorraine said. Give us a year, and we'll win over everyone. Is there really no way of getting the election pushed back, even just to the end of the month? Sholto said there wasn't, but, um... We thought that since you originally wrote the rules, uh, you might have put in an escape clause of some kind, Umbert said. George, I realised was right. I'd been asked to organise an election, but what the old man had meant was that I'd been tasked to arrange a victory. Instead, and whether it was a subconscious decision or not, I'd run away to Ireland. Sorry, I said, with what I hoped was a reassuring smile. We can't change the date, but I don't think we need to. What's your strategy been so far? All politics is local, isn't it? Dr. Umbert said. I heard that given as an excuse when a favoured candidate lost. However, I know that popularity is key to gaining support in all avenues of life. 
We've been holding small gatherings, convincing electors one at a time. Not quite one at a time, Lorraine said. We gather between ten and twenty people, about a third of whom are already our supporters. When they leave here, they are all our supporters, and their minds don't change. Most leave having offered us their support, Umbert said. As to whether that support is unwavering, only the ballot box will tell. Lorraine rolled her eyes. How long are these sessions? I asked. We manage two or three a day, Lorraine said. What about speeches? I asked. I'm not the most adept at public speaking, Umbert said. It doesn't come naturally or easily, not to a crowd. I had many patients who suffered from workplace-associated anxiety. My advice was always that they should play to their strengths. Mine is talking to individuals and small groups. I thought your speciality was children, I said, as I pulled out a chair and sat down. It wasn't always, Umbert said. Besides, one can't treat a child without treating their parents. Again, I felt like the patient and wished I'd remained standing. To hide my discomfort, I took in the room. Opposite the now-defunct register was a blackboard. On it was a long list that began with Scottish pancakes and ended with Welsh rarebit. You hold these meetings here? I asked. Oh, yes, Lorraine said. And you serve food? I asked. They both followed the line of my gaze. Wishful thinking, Lorraine said. A reminder of the simple things we once had, Umbert said. It poses the question of whether we wish to have them again. Personally, it was just making me hungry. Do you have any experience of politics? I asked Umbert. Only as a voter, he said. So why did you put your name forward? I asked. Why do you want to be the leader of humanity? That's what this job is. Considering the alternative candidates, he began. No, I interrupted. As I understand it, when you put your name forward, there were hundreds of candidates. You didn't know it would end up with only you and Marcus. And Bishop, Lorraine added. And him, I said. So why, Lionel, did you stand? We don't need a leader, he said. We need an administrator, a coordinator. How much do you know about farming? I know which end of the shovel goes in the ground, I said. Which is more than some of us, he said. You should go to Menai Bridge and see the indoor farms. You've heard of those? The terraced houses have been turned into greenhouses for growing salads, I said. Oh, it's far more than that, Lorraine said. Heather's done marvels, though most of it was done by the Duponts. You can't just put a tray of plants inside. You have to take out the carpets, moderate for moisture, monitor temperature and light. She sounded wistful. A lot of it's experimental, and a lot of the experiments have been a failure. But as long as we have electricity, we'll have enough seeds to plant across the entire island next spring. Not only salad, but wheat and oats, potatoes and cabbages, maybe even peas. But we should leave the farming to the farmers, Umbert said, in what was a clear echo of George and Mary. A politician's interference will only consume time we do not have. Do you know about fishing? Beyond throwing a hook into the water, I mean. No, nor do I. Leave the fishing to the fishers, the fighting to the soldiers. I imagine that is an area in which you have become an expert, but do you know how to train another to be just as good? What do you know of medicine? Do you know how to make medicine from the precursor chemicals? What do you know of making those chemicals from the raw elements, and do you know how to refine those? I don't. Others on this island do. We are an island of adults. Each person in growing to maturity becomes an expert in some field or another. Even the most esoteric of those can be put to some use here. Thus, in order to thrive, we must focus on our own area of expertise and let others do otherwise. Agreed, I said, but by your own admission you're no expert in politics. What is politics? he replied, but a manifestation of the collective will of the people. I know people, I know how they work, and I know what breaks them. I know how much they can endure and how they can recover. We've been through a great trauma, 
and that is what currently binds us together. From the moment the election was announced, I listened to how people discussed the future that would come after. That future was remarkably similar to the past that we lost. To give you an example, when word spread that a radio antenna might be built, it soon became a common belief that we'd have broadcast television again. Seriously? I asked. Marcus started that rumour, Lorraine said. I don't know if he started it, Dr. Umbert said, but he watered the seed of belief with a speech saying there was no reason that we couldn't. Technically, he is correct, since we have the technological know-how, but the same could be said for many things that we will not see again for centuries. The upshot, though, is that people began stockpiling televisions. It wasn't many people, only a few dozen, but they intended to get rich on the resale of the equipment in a few short years. No matter that the televisions were all digital, and we've not yet built an analog station. A little daydreaming is healthy, but not when it becomes a fantasist's excuse to reject reality. Then Marcus began buying up all of the old analog radio sets, offering beer in exchange. Now, he saw the real future before us, but his actions compounded the problem as much as they gave us an insight into his true plans. I never imagined he'd run for office. He is really not the type. He might buy a candidate, yes, but not stand himself. I entered the race to bring a little realism to an otherwise unreal affair. You should have heard what some of them were saying, Lorraine said. The ones that Marcus got to drop out. They spoke like we were going to get back everything that we lost, and more. Like we were going back to space, even. Like we could turn back time. Precisely, Umbert said, and that is dangerous. You know people have been leaving, taking their boats out and not returning. Everyone might like to believe that they are seeking their fortunes elsewhere. A different description would be that it was murder-suicide. That's a grim conclusion, I said. Yet as valid a theory as that they sailed off into the sunset seeking the new world, Umbert said. They are not the only suicides. We are averaging at least one a day. Sometimes it is someone with a chronic disease exacerbated by exposure to radiation, but chronic is not the same as terminal. And terminal doesn't mean that you will die today. That is the reality of our situation. That is what we must face. Yet no one is. I know what you mean, I said. I try not to think about the radiation and what that's done to our life expectancy. At any other time that approach is sensible, but not while we are planning the future of our species. There is a theory, only a theory, and a controversial one at that, but it was widely believed that humanity faced such a near-extinction event 75,000 years ago. There is evidence of a genetic bottleneck. As I say, it was only a theory— but it suggested humanity had been reduced to around 10,000, and is given as a reason for the absence of genetic diversity in our species. We have similar numbers now, but individually we don't have the skills to survive. Collectively we might, but it will be a close-run thing, a contest that will be waged over the coming centuries. Yes, this is about the future of our species, that's why I put my name forward. I didn't think I'd be a contender. I thought I'd get the chance to give a speech or two, perhaps drag the contest a little towards the practical. Yet now I am the only voice of reason against two thoroughly unreasonable men. I wish I wasn't, but so it goes. I told Heather that she should have run, Lorraine said. Why didn't she? I asked. Lorraine shrugged, unwilling to share. I turned to Umbert. What are your plans when you win? If I win, he said. If you don't think you'll win, then you might as well give up now, I said. Believe in yourself, or no one else will. I would never tell someone that, he said. I would say that it is best to believe in yourself, regardless of what others think. Either way, I said, you're going to win, so what'll you do then, broadly? Continue with what we're doing now, he said. We have a fragile society, but remarkably little crime. 
Other than suicides, we have few deaths. The number of pregnancies is increasing. Disease and illness are rare, though with a caveat associated with the aforementioned radiation poisoning. In short, we need to concentrate on keeping it that way. Farming, fishing and education should be our priorities. Education for adults as well as children. For the rest, for those who don't want to toil in a field, we should continue searching for survivors. Work is important, a sense of personal fulfillment essential to the mental health of the population. There is a broader need for a sense of purpose to our community's existence. If we isolate ourselves, we will begin projecting our anger inwards. We will bicker and fight because we can't flee. It will be the end of our species, and that is what Marcus's victory will bring. To prevent that, we must look outwards, not just to Britain, but also beyond. In doing so, the unknown can be harnessed as our inspiration rather than the terror keeping us frightened, febrile, and fading. Sounds good, I said. I was honestly relieved. He wasn't an ideal candidate, but he would do. We just have to win, Lorraine said. Any suggestions as to how? A few, I said. If I had six months, I'd win you a landslide, but we don't have that long, and you won't win enough votes talking to people ten at a time. We won't get them all in the same place again, not like when the plane landed, Lorraine said. We might, I said, but we don't have to. We still have technology. Mrs. O'Leary still controls the photocopiers, right? After that incident with Annette copying my journal, she gathered all the toner, didn't she? We'll put out a few pamphlets. That won't be enough, Humbert said. That depends on the message, I said, and— And I was interrupted by a digital beeping. My alarm, Lorraine said, switching it off. We've another meeting in a few minutes. Do you want us to cancel? No, keep at it, I said. I'll have a think about speeches and pamphlets and the like. Oh, there was something else, Lorraine. I opened my pack and took out the notebook, and found the photograph we'd taken from the bunker in Belfast. Do you recognize any of these people? Here, Lorraine said. That's Lisa Kempton, the billionaire. Anyone else? No, I don't think so. Should I? What about the two men? I asked. I don't think so. What's this about? Humbert asked. You know that Kempton was involved in the conspiracy? She helped finance it, yes, Umbert said. This picture was found in a bunker in Belfast, a fallout shelter that was in a warehouse that Kempton owned. We came across a few of the women in that picture dead, for the most part. I wondered if the others in the group had some connection with Ireland, and so might have been there when the outbreak occurred, in which case did any of them escape to Anglesey? Specifically, I added, turning to Lorraine, I wondered whether either of those two men were ones you saw in Marcus's pub. Do you remember the body in Bangor? The man who was stabbed through the neck? Vividly, she said. You said you saw him with three other men. We found one of them undead in the university. What about the other two? Are either of them in the photo? She took the picture and gave it a more careful examination. Uh, no, I don't think so. It was the man's belt buckle I remembered more than his face. Bill, I wanted to talk to you about that, or Ireland at least. About Simon and Will and Lilith. About how they... The shop bell jangled. Two men and three women came in, mud still on their shoes. Later, Bill, Lorraine said, as she thrust the picture back at me. Fixing a smile on her face, she turned to greet the newcomers. Chloe, Michael, welcome, she said. I put the photograph away and got ready to watch my candidate in action. Chapter 12 New Digs Kim collapsed into the easy chair in the corner of the room. There was only one, positioned by the window in the eaves overlooking the harbour. Almost banging my head on a low beam, I moved closer to the window and tried to get a glimpse of the stars. You saw Annette's room? I said. I know, Kim said. It's bigger than ours. Bigger than Sholto's, too. While we were in Wales, we'd lost our home, 
That's how I thought of it. I've been looking forward to returning to the house on the edge of countryside. Annette and I think it was her, rather than my brother, but decided that was too far from civilization, so she had moved us to the row of houses where the satellite images were being scrutinized. It was a long terrace, close to the harbor. The ground floor had been crudely knocked through. Most of the plaster and bricks had been swept up, the furniture removed, and long tables put in their place. Screens had been set up, and even now, close to midnight, there were a score of people downstairs, flicking through satellite pictures of Ireland, searching for signs of life. At least it's warm, I said. Though that was small comfort for being relegated to the smallest room in the eaves. I wasn't sure if that was because Kim and I had been an afterthought, or whether it was a deliberate punishment for our extended absence. Head bowed, so as not to knock into one of the overhead beams, I moved away from the window and sat on the bed. At least we had a good meal, I said. I think it might not have been if Heather Jones hadn't arrived, Kim said. Lettuce has never tasted so good. That cucumber was a bit rubbery, though. Personally, I'm looking forward to parsnips, I said. What did you think of Dr. Umbert? After his meeting with voters, I brought him and Lorraine back with me, principally so Kim could get the measure of the man. The meal had been an afterthought and hastily arranged. There wasn't much in our cupboards. But Heather Jones had arrived with a welcome home basket and as many questions for us as we had for Dr. Umbert. He seems okay, Kim said. Doesn't say much, but when he starts talking he doesn't stop. Not exactly a conversationalist, very much a lecturer. Not that it matters, not without TV coverage. What do you think? That he's better than Marcus, I said. That at the very least he'll hold things together for a while. So you've only got to arrange for him to win? Pretty much. How are you going to do that? I lay back on the bed, enjoying the feel of a genuine mattress for a moment. It's about constructing a narrative. Like you said, there's no TV stations, no social media, no radio station, no easy way of getting his message out except if it's printed and distributed. I think we can manage a newspaper. Did you ever hear of the British Gazette? It was a newspaper the government put out during the general strike of 1926. Utter propaganda, of course. The unions put out their own paper, the British Worker, as a counterpoint. A propaganda sheet? Is that going to be enough? Probably not on its own, but it'll depend on the contents and the timing of its release. It needs to be close enough to the election that Marcus won't be able to put out something to refute it. The advantage of our media-free world is that it'll be easier to control the message. There are a few other tricks we can pull, things that'll fall short of stuffing the ballot. Was it always like this? Kim asked. Was it always tricks and schemes, plotting and planning and skirting the law? Not always, I said. Sometimes it really was a debate about policy. But the big ideas usually got lost among the sound bites and photo ops. This could have been different, Kim said. Could have been, but it wasn't. So we need something to put in this newspaper. Something people can read that will make them vote for Umbert over Marcus. Like what? The easiest thing would be to implicate Marcus in the murders, I said. He's already associated with Paul. But? But if we're to print that, why not print that Rob confessed Marcus was behind the whole thing, I said. No one will be able to refute it. In fact, we could go and have Captain Devine arrest him. Except that would be a lie. If we're going down that route, let Sholto do his thing and stuff the ballot boxes while we start packing our bags. My eyes turned to where they lay by the door. Annette had crammed in our few possessions, most of which were clothes, but hadn't unpacked them. The alternative is that we print something truthful for a given value of true, I said. Something about Dr. Umbert, something that makes people think he's the person they really want to lead. Something true. Like what? Has he done anything? I'm not sure, I said. But this would have to be something new. Something heroic? More or less. Like rescuing some survivors? Kim asked. 
Do you happen to know where we might find some? Besides, it's not as if there's time to go anywhere, get back, get an article written and a newspaper distributed. Forget survivors, I said. It's unlikely we'll find any. No, what he needs is a victory. Except the act of printing it in a newspaper is what will determine how victorious an act it was. Compared to Marcus, whatever we do will count. Like what, though? Like going out and finding some supplies, I said. No idea what kind, but whatever we find, we can print that we needed it. That's not too great an exaggeration. We'll add in a photograph or two of Umbert looking determined and martial. We can fill the rest of the paper with tips and advice. I'm not sure what tips or what advice. Medical, I suppose. And something about make, do and mend. Maybe add a crossword or weather report. It doesn't need to be long, just a couple of pages, but long enough that it can't be read in one go. We want people to take it home, where there's a chance they'll read it a second time. With a photo of Umbert standing next to a hall of supplies, but where are we going to find them? Bangor and Carnarfon have been searched. Going there is hardly news. The same is true for Belfast or Dublin, I said. What about the Isle of Man? Kim suggested. On our way to Svalbard, we saw a light. We went ashore and found a beacon. It had to have been set up recently. Miguel said that a boat went back there to shine a searchlight at the island. I don't think anyone was found, and it's unlikely that we'll find anyone, but we might. More importantly, it's an island. All their supplies had to have come in by sea or plane, and that means warehouses, yes? So we go ashore, check the warehouses, find one with batteries or whatever, and say that's what we went looking for. You can take a photo, and we can come straight back. The Isle of Man. Yes, we could be there and back in a couple of days. A photograph of Dr. Umbert standing by an open shipping container, and another with him standing on the quayside looking towards Anglesey. I can see the images. I can think of the text. I think that would work. Do you think that would be enough? Kim asked. I heard the scepticism in her voice. Not on its own, I said, warming to the idea. The trip will define the narrative, forcing Marcus to respond. That's when we implement the second part of the plan. Which is? I'm not sure yet, I said. But this is Marcus's first election. It isn't mine. What Kim said next threw cold water on my newfound enthusiasm. What do we do if after we get Umbert elected he turns out to be worse than Marcus? She asked. For that, I didn't have an answer. Chapter 13 The Man from Man The 18th of October, Day 220, Anglesey That's him, George said, the man on the left. I could have guessed that much, since the only other people on the firing range were Siobhan and Private Kessler. The Irish police officer and the Marine were peppering the distant target with arrows, using bows I recognised as belonging to Dean and Callie. The man at the range's other end had a crossbow that was far more laborious to load. I'll wait until he's finished, I said. Do you think that a trip to the Isle of Man will be enough to swing the election? George asked. On its own, probably not. It depends on how it's spun, I said. But that's an area in which I'm confident of my skills. Right. But shouldn't you be doing more? Like putting up some posters of your own? The range had been set up in the car park of an old supermarket, with the targets pinned to the building's wall. By the time the island was evacuated, most of the shelves were bare. By the time Anglesey was reclaimed from the undead, mould and moss had taken over. The chiller cabinets and freezers had been pushed together, and now the building had become a dump for other electrical equipment for which we had no immediate use and no time to preserve. Outside, Facing the road was a board about four feet by six feet, propped on plywood struts. The background had been painted red, white, and blue. On the front, in crude but legible block letters, was painted, Vote for Marcus, Vote for Safety. I grinned. That was a mistake on Marcus's part. How exactly is he going to keep us safe? He can't. That promise is worthless, and everyone knows it, too. 
Well, it's his name, George said. It's his slogan. One will easily discredit, I said, not by directly challenging him, but by stating the simple truth that safety cannot be guaranteed. You think people want to hear that? George asked. People don't want to be lied to, I said, and that's how we'll frame it, while we stick to the truth. The whole truth? George asked, more or less. My gaze drifted again to the private. She was loosing each arrow almost exactly twenty seconds apart. Few of the arrows hit the target, but I wasn't sure whether she cared. Trevorn lowered her bow, turned around, saw us, and walked over. She looked tired. The bullets match, she said. I'm sorry? I asked. The bullet from Callie's side matches the gun Agatha used. The discarded casings and the bullets she retrieved from the car. I test-fired them last night. That's something, I said. Thank you. She shrugged. Like I told you, Bill, you did the right thing. The only thing that you could. She looked at George, then at the private, then at me. I went to see that guy, Marcus. Oh? Why? I asked. Because of his name, Siobhan said. I thought he might be Mark, taking over a pub running in an election. Those are the kind of things Mark would do. Of course, it's not him, but I... She looked over at George and seemed to change her mind. We're heading to the grain ship next. But I thought Amber needed to let off some steam. Amber? Siobhan gestured to the private... Technically, she's my escort. In reality, she's not taking the Major's death very well. She feels like it's her fault. I guess we all feel like that about someone. Did you come looking for me? For Wilfred, George said, indicating the man who was now walking towards us. Then we'll leave you to it and go and take a look at where Donny was attacked, Siobhan said. It's good to have another police officer on the island, George said. Siobhan shrugged. I said I'd take a look. I doubt I'll find anything anyway. I, um, uh, I'll catch up with you later, Bill. She gave a nod to George and headed over to the Marine. George turned to the man approaching us. Bill, may I introduce Wilfred Jackson from the Isle of Man? Fred? This is Bartholomew Wright. Oh, I know you, Jackson said. Heard about you at least. Your exploits have become quite the talking point around our dinner table. There was a glint in his eye, a smile in his tone, with which I became familiar, implying that the conversation hadn't been entirely flattering. How's the ball? George asked. Jackson shook his head. It's uh, slow to load and impossible to aim. They'll need a lot more work before we start mass-producing them. That's a pity, George said. I thought crossbows might be the answer to our ammo shortage. Not without months more work, Jackson said. Months, George replied. That long? I understand you went back to the Isle of Man. I cut in, steering the conversation to the reason that George and I had come to the firing range. You returned to set up lights on the island. Beacons, aye, Jackson said. Didn't think anyone else would notice them until a few weeks ago. We were discussing sending an expedition to the Isle of Man to investigate the lights, I said. Kim saw them a few months ago in a way to Svalbard. I didn't know that the person behind them was known, or that it was someone here on Anglesey, until I spoke to Mrs. O'Leary this morning. Aye, Jackson said. I've been going home as often as I can. How many made it out? Five, Jackson said, and I make six. I wasn't there at the time, though hope springs that we're not the last, or at least it sprang, and that's why I went back. You said you're putting together an expedition? We were thinking about it, I said, partly to investigate those lights, partly to look for supplies in the warehouses by the docks. Jackson's eyes narrowed. What sort of thing are you looking for, specifically? Washing powder, medical supplies, light bulbs and batteries, I said. Not food, though if we found it, that'd be a boon. Belfast Harbour was bombed. Anything in the warehouses there was destroyed. There's some food and supplies in people's homes, but nothing in the quantities we need. We moved a satellite over the city of Douglas last night, 
and got a view of it this morning. There were quite a lot of clouds, but、uh, what we could see looked intact. Jackson shook his head. Did you spot these、uh, warehouses of yours? How much do you know about Man? Enough not to confuse it with the United Kingdom, I said. How many people do you think lived there? Jackson asked. How many supermarkets do you think were there? No, there were about eighty thousand of us. George was smiling. He'd already known that we weren't going to find any great stash of supplies there. I didn't give up. I couldn't. The Isle of Man was one of the few places we could reach in time to construct a narrative that would enable Umbert to win in a way that even approached fair and democratic. Well, there's an airport, yes, I said. Maybe there's aviation fuel. Jackson shook his head. The airport's gone. A plane crashed into the fuel store. Fire ripped through the buildings. It was one of the first places I looked. Ah. I decided to change tack. How many times have you been back? Eight, he said. It would have been more, but、uh, we're at the mercy of the winds. You sailed there, I. Honestly, I didn't know that anyone would see the lights. Not from the sea. They were there for anyone on the island. I found the emergency beacons on lifeboats that made it this far. But I know that people would be going past. I'd have caught a ride. I always thought our lack of clear lines of communication was a problem, George added, and I guess that was the reason he'd been eager for me to meet Wilfred Jackson. George's point was well made, but considering the time pressures we were under, this practical demonstration of the lesson could have been skipped. What about the undead? I asked. Kim saw some, but if there were only eighty thousand people on the island, there can't be too many more zombies. I don't know about that," Jackson said. "But I do know I barely made it out on the last trip, and that's why it was the last back in the summer. There's no one there. There's nothing left. You won't find a warehouse with a million tins of big beans or a village with a dozen people who valiantly survived seven months of the undead. What did you see on your eight trips? Where did you go?" I asked, refusing to give up. Ramsey first, Jackson said. You know it. It's a town in the north with a pier that needed to be repaired, restored. I thought that if people fled north, they might have made their way onto the pier, might have barricaded it, and be waiting there for rescue. They weren't. The next trip was to Castletown, that's in the south. The airport's near there, and that was the main reason I chose it. I wondered if a plane might have arrived. Perhaps bringing people home. Wherever the last flight arrived from, no one survived the crash. I went to Castle Russian and barely made it out alive. Zombies. After that, I tried Douglas, but the winds were wrong. I made it ashore a little way north of Onken, but didn't see anyone or anything. It was more or less the same on the west coast. I made it to Port Erin, though. That's the end of the line as far as the railway is concerned, and it was the end of the line for me. I returned to set up the beacons, but、uh, that was as much for me as in any hope a survivor would see them. Looks like I was right. Hang on, a railway? I didn't think the Isle of Man had one. I said, "Well, we're not talking a high-speed commuter service." Jackson said, "It was a heritage line for steam trains." Well, they had a few diesel locomotives as well. It ran in the summer months. You must have heard of it. They used the same rolling stock as when it opened a hundred and forty years ago. World famous it was. Sorry, I said. My knowledge of battleground constituencies is encyclopedic. What I know about anywhere else could be carved on the head of a pin. A steam railway, though. How many locomotives? Do you mean theoretically, or that actually worked? You heard me say that they were a hundred and forty years old. There's a museum in Port Erin, a yard where they kept them on display. Those were still there. What about the working engines? Gone, he said.、Huh. Interesting, I said. I don't like your expression, George said. Do you know how much a steam locomotive would weigh? I asked Jackson. Not a clue, he said.
I bet it's about the same as a fuel tanker, I said. If the Admiral knows how to bring one of those back from Belfast, transporting a locomotive from the Isle of Man will be straightforward. It won't, George said. Why do you want a steam train? Jackson asked. Bicycles are good enough on Anglesey. Yes, and we've got a few golf carts as well, but nothing for carrying heavier goods, I said. When we get to harvest, how are we going to move the potatoes and grain? If we're using bicycle-powered carts, that'll burn calories. So we're digging the coal, George said. Where are you going to do that? There's plenty of coal in Wales, I said. Plenty of zombies, too, George said. Svalbard, then, I said. They used to have a coal power plant and mined the fuel for it there on the archipelago. If that's too much effort, if it requires too many calories, we can convert the engines to burn wood or create some biofuel to burn in the diesel locomotives. You said there were some diesel engines. Aye, two, I think, Jackson said. It all sounds unnecessary, George said. We're not going to have any trouble harvesting our winter crop by hand. We probably won't even need more than one hand for the task. You have to think of the future, I said, but didn't elaborate. I didn't know, Jackson, or whether I could trust him. I was beginning to question how much I should share with George, since he was clearly not sharing everything with me. The arrival of the plane had been a sight that everyone had gathered to see. Marcus had seized that as the platform on which he was building his victory but he wouldn't be able to do the same for the arrival of locomotives, not if Umbert was one of the people who'd found them. And people would gather to watch their arrival. The plane and Marcus's speech would be forgotten because steam trains were something people understood. Coal went in, the wheels moved. As to where they moved, and to what purpose they'd be put, George was right. They wouldn't be of an immediate use to us. That didn't matter. Their arrival would win Umbert the election. More than that, debating how we'd use them, then cleaning and maintaining them, would provide a focus for the future. We might even get people to volunteer to mine coal, simply to provide them with fuel. With mining as the alternative, others might be less reluctant to choose a life of farming. I wasn't deluding myself. It would be a symbolic victory in every sense but one with a more lasting impact than a plane. Of course, the plane and the Admiral's plans were never far from my thoughts, and that gave me another idea. Perhaps we could get a few engines across to the mainland, I said. We could run them through Wales and into England and Scotland. The sight of a billowing smokestack might attract some survivors. It'd attract the undead, George said. I did say the locomotives were a hundred and forty years old. Jackson said. Fine, then. We use them as blueprints to make some new engines, I said. Blueprints? George said. Now there's an idea. A portable coal power station that we could move to wherever we had the fuel. But if we want a blueprint, we'd be better off looking in books and looking for something far more modern. Those ancient engines would convert coal to mechanical work, but it's electricity that we need. Brett's certain there aren't any survivors left on the Isle of Man. Risking lives for people is one thing, but this is unnecessary. We don't need trains, Bell, not now, anyway. And there are plenty of things we need more immediately that we could spend this effort on. It'd only be a day's sailing and another day's exploration, I said. Not if you can't find them, Jackson said. The locomotives weren't in Port Erin. Where's the other end of the line? I asked. For the steam railway? Douglas. Well, there's another line that runs north. Trains have to stay on the tracks, I said. We can find them on the satellites before we reach Douglas. We'll leave some people in the city to search for supplies, while we follow the railroad to the locomotives. Depending on where they are, we'll either drive them to the port, or we'll helicopter them straight here. Either way, We'll have our first service running between Hollyhead and Menai Bridge before the end of the month. You're serious? Jackson asked. You're seriously going to the Isle of Man to get a locomotive? Haven't you been lost in Ireland for the last month? I'm not saying there won't be risk, I said. 
but I think it's worth the reward. Jackson shook his head. When are you leaving? In a couple of hours, I said. We'll aim to arrive at dawn. I see, Jackson said. He looked me up and down, then at George, and then at the firing range. I'm coming too. I'll see you at the harbour. You are serious, George asked as Jackson walked away. What ship will you take? The Amundsen, I said. The Admiral owes me a favour. Taking his tail be half of it, getting the trains back will be the other half. It's not a good idea, George said. You came to us this morning with a plan to loot warehouses, and now you're talking about trains. You know what that smacks off? Desperation. We've no real use for steam trains. It's the optics, I said, stubbornly refusing to listen to good sense. We'll take a photograph of Dr. Umbert standing on the roof of one. We'll print that, and a couple of days later we'll print a picture of the train arriving on the island. We may not even need to. People will come to see the train travel across the island. They'll all want to ride on it. What has Marcus done but make a lot of promises that few can truly believe will come to pass? Umbert, though, he went out and brought back a train. If it all works out like you hope, but you're still putting lives at risk. Life is a risk, I said. How is this different to those people of yours who wandered England setting up safe houses? There's no chance of finding survivors, for one, George said. For a second, there's... He stopped. You say it's the optics that matter, the public perception. Then slow down. Take some time. Plan it properly. At the very least, let's wait until we've got some satellite pictures that show us where the trains are. Part of me knew he was right, but I saw a way of bringing order back to the chaos that I had unwittingly created. I had been given responsibility for organising the election, and I now felt utterly responsible for the disaster it had become. A newspaper, a few photographs, and transporting a steam train a few dozen miles to Anglesey, it was all within our capability. Within a week, we'd have won the election. All we'd have left would be holding the ballot. No, I said, we can't wait. Right now, Marcus is winning. This will change everything. It'll guarantee Umbert's victory, and then we can focus on the real crises, the food, the fuel, the ammunition. I looked towards the firing range. The crossbows were your idea? They were, George said. I thought it was the obvious solution, but there won't be time to mass-produce enough, not if we're going to have to redesign them. No, not enough time at all. And had I not been so caught up in a fantasy of crowds cheering a train, I might have paid closer attention to his words. Chapter 14 The Betrayal of Man The 19th of October, Day 221, The Isle of Man What happened? Dean asked. Happened? Jackson asked. To the Isle of Man? Dean asked. The quiet hubbub ceased. All eyes in the small group turned first to Dean, and then to Jackson. We were gathered on the deck of the Amundsen, waiting for the all clear from the Admiral before we went ashore. We'd sailed through the night, waiting east of the Tower of Refuge, before sailing into the port of Douglas, when dawn cast enough light to see our way. The Admiral had told her crew this was a training mission to prepare the new recruits for the return to America. That had got her a cheer so loud, I finally understood how many of them clung to the impossible hope that America wasn't as desolate as everywhere else. That wasn't my problem. Not then. And nor was securing the harbour. Our group had to wait on the ship while the marines, sailors, and recent recruits ventured ashore. Not all those on deck were taking part in the expedition. After what had happened to Donny, We'd not felt comfortable leaving Annette and Daisy on Anglesey. They were going to keep Callie company. Colum, Siobhan, and the three children had remained on the island, taking a brief holiday before a long winter sojourn on the ship. Dean and Lena had volunteered themselves for the mission, and I'd not been able to come up with a plausible reason to refuse them. They were capable and healthy, and it was only meant to be a brief few hours ashore. Sholto and Kim were both coming, as was Lorraine, 
and Jackson would be our guide. And Umbert was coming too, of course. The Admiral had offered some Marines as an escort, but that would have made our group too large to move quietly. More importantly, I didn't know how Umbert was going to react ashore. If he cracked under the strain, I didn't want a report of that reaching Anglesey. What happened to the Isle of Man? Jackson asked. It was the vaccine, that's what happened. The British government wanted man to become an internment camp. They didn't say who would be interned. That's when we barricaded our homes. When we started doing that, the vaccine arrived. People took it home. They died. By then, there were zombies on the island. Not everyone had taken the vaccine. I don't know if it was even half of the population, but too few were left to hold off the undead. Most died. Some fled. That's it. That's what happened. I went back because I... I hoped. That's all. I hoped. Aye, that's what happened. The vaccine. The undead. A betrayal by politicians that weren't our own. It's the same story as what happened to everyone else, everywhere else. There's no good to be gleaned from it. No gold gleaming beneath the muck. As he'd been speaking, the mood had palpably sunk. It hadn't been high to begin with. I don't think I'd properly conveyed the purpose of the mission, and everyone else saw it as a last desperate gamble, one bound to fail. Jackson's words had solidified that feeling. Dr. Umbert stood alone, a little way from everyone else. He had a notebook out, and I thought he was jotting his professional assessment of our little group. When I went over to him, I saw that he was sketching the low-rise rooftops of Douglas. He wasn't a bad artist. I think he might have missed his true calling. You should, uh, say something, I whispered, something uplifting. To what end? These are your people, aren't they? You want them to be yours, I said. Good morning, Umbert began. He coughed and raised his voice. There is something wonderful about a distant hill. The craggy boulders appear smooth. The sweep of green appears uniform and soft, absent of mud and briar. I have often thought that close study can ruin one's impression of a place. It's not so much that the grass is always greener elsewhere, but that even the most casual examination can confirm how barren the soil is beneath our feet. We need to locate the steam engines. If we don't, we don't. The only qualification for success is that all of us survive the day. The only failure will be in the deaths of our fellows. So, let us not fail. It wasn't what I'd expected, but it could have been worse. I guess that's the railway station, Lorraine whispered. It was an orange-red brick of a Victorian style, ringed by a matching brick wall. Either side of the road leading to the entrance were two pillars. Railway was on one, station on the other. I guess so. Dean? Lena? Get ready, I whispered. We were crouched behind an upturned flatbed that almost blocked the road. There was a broken generator dumped against the plate glass window of an empty tea room, a jumble of crushed wood and metal on the pavement, and a few discarded shotgun casings on the ground nearby. Whoever had created the barricade, something heavy had driven through, pushing the flatbed out of the way. There would be time to check the other roads in the town, but I think someone had tried to fortify the harbour in the hope that a boat might come. Before they realised that no help would arrive, one of the barriers had broken and the undead had got in. Some of the survivors had driven away, wrecking the barricade. As the rest hadn't made it to Anglesey, it was likely they died. As to what happened to the undead, at least five of them squatted in the entrance to the railway station's car park. Dean? Lena? When you're ready, I said. Tan for each eye, Dean whispered. Lena fired three arrows before Dean's second was on the string. The first four arrows all hit their mark. The zombies fell. Dean's second arrow missed, thudding into the fifth zombie as it began to stand. Lena fired again. The zombie collapsed. Forty, she said. That's pretty impressive. 
Lorraine said. She spoke too soon and too loudly. Something clattered against metal on the other side of the red brick wall, ringing the station. Where there's one, there's usually more, Kim murmured. And where there's five... She raised her rifle and moved slowly out of cover. Sholto, his own SA-80 raised, followed. Kim moved to the left, Sholto to the right, each taking up station next to the stone pillars. As they fired measured shot after measured shot into the car park, Dean ran forward. I thought he was going to run inside, but Sholto heard him and barked a warning. Dean stopped about three paces from my brother and raised an arrow to his bow. He loosed, but I couldn't see where the arrow struck, and with him now standing in the middle of the entrance, I couldn't see what lay in the railway station's small car park. From the way Kim and Sholto kept firing, there had to be dozens of the creatures, perhaps coming from inside the building itself. What do we do? Lorraine asked. Nothing, I said, not yet, just watch the road. The gap between the two pillars was too narrow for anyone else to assist Dean Kim and Sholto. Besides, if the three of them couldn't deal with the undead threat, then it was likely there were too many for all of us to face. And that was when I should have realized our first mistake. Humbert was right. We all had experience fighting the undead. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say we all had experience surviving the living dead. Either way, we knew how to hack and hew and put a bullet into a zombie's skull. What we lacked was military cohesion. There was no leader on this trip, no clear chain of command. I had given orders because it had been my plan, but Kim, Shalto, and everyone else would only take it as guidance, a suggestion rather than a command. I might have realized it, and the danger into which we were all stumbling if it wasn't for the noise that came from our right. A dull gong came from a shop window Immediately opposite the entrance to the station, it came again. I moved away from the flatbed so I could better see. Before we taken cover, the shop had appeared empty. Now there was a zombie inside with four more immediately behind it. The creature brought its hand down again. This time the glass broke. Shards tinkled onto the leaf and litter-strewn pavement, as with the window no longer an impediment, the zombie toppled forward impaling itself on the jagged shards. The creatures behind staggered towards the window. The lead zombie, its face marred by a savage cut that had removed its right eye, got caught in the thrashing legs of the fallen creature. It, too, toppled forward, further impaling that first zombie. The third creature, however, tumbled out onto the road. Lorraine had her gun raised, the barrel tracking back and forth, but before she could fire, Jackson ran forward. His own gun was slung, a crowbar in his hands, a blank expression on his face. He raised the length of metal up and slammed it down as that third creature thrashed itself to its knees. Back, a voice called. It was Umbert, and he had his own rifle raised, but Jackson couldn't hear him. There were more zombies in the window, and Jackson swung his crowbar left and right, but with him outside, them inside, he didn't have the reach to kill them. Two toppled forward onto the pavement. I ran in. An arrow whistled inches from my head as Lena fired a terrifyingly well-aimed shot. I stabbed my sword down on a zombie trying to stand, and then swept the blade up, slashing it at the face of one just inside the window. Back! I called at Jackson, echoing Umbert's too sane suggestion. There were at least ten of the living dead inside the shop, and three already outside. Jackson swung the crowbar up and around, barely missing me, though he hit the zombie square on its crown. Bone broke, and brain spilled out onto the pavement. I speared the sword forward, aiming at the creatures inside the window. Kill them inside, I said. Create a wall. At least, I think I said it aloud. I certainly thought it. Another arrow flew close. Then from nowhere a hand tugged on my shoulder. I spun around, but it was Umbert. He held his rifle one-handed and fired a shot into the gap I'd made. It missed. He raised his left hand to the barrel, flipped the selector switch, 
and empty the magazine into the shop. At that closer range, with that many targets, the bullets all hit, though few hit heads. It was enough, though, to get Jackson's attention. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, just as Lorraine and Lena stepped forward. As Umbert reloaded, they fired bullet and arrow into the pack. Jackson, returning from his grief-filled rage, unslung his own rifle and opened fire as Umbert slotted a new magazine into place. For ten adrenaline-quickened heartbeats, there was a soft crescendo of suppressed shots, and then there was silence, save the solitary wheeze of a bullet-riddled zombie just inside the shop doorway. I stepped forward, leaned inside, and stabbed the sword down into its brain. And then I remembered the railway station. I turned around. The Kim was leaning against the brick pillar, her rifle pointing into the car park, but her eyes on me. Clear, I called. She nodded, and then moved into the car park. I couldn't see Dean or Sholto, nor could I hear the sound of gunfire or fighting. I knew better than to assume that meant we were safe. Watch the road, I said to Umbert. You too, Lorraine, Jackson. With Lena, arrow notched by my side, I headed into the station. That was the first time I'd properly seen it, and at first I thought that we'd face a far greater threat than I'd realized. Tip? Lena said. She didn't slacken her grip on the arrow, so had a gesture with her eyes. It took a moment to spot it, but around the wrists of a zombie, with black blood still oozing from the bullet hole in its head, was grey tape. A second's examination confirmed that the man hadn't been a prisoner. The tape was holding his sleeves in place. Underneath the thin jacket was a hard surface. I didn't check what the man had made his armour out of, or look for the wound, that would show where it had failed. Instead, I took another closer look around the car park. There were about fifteen zombies which Kim, Sholto, and Dean had killed. The rest had been dead for at least two months, possibly longer. Then I saw the bones, partially hidden by leaves and corpses. It wasn't a battle, I said. It was a last stand. There must have been a hundred people here. Why? Lena asked. The doors to the station swung open and Dean came out. The trains aren't here, he said. There are some more bodies, that's all. He walked over to a corpse by the door that had an arrow in its mouth. He gave it a tug. The shaft broke. Lena sighed, but I don't think it was directed at Dean. I'll get the others, I said. How many are we looking for? Dean asked as we stared at the long length of empty track. Three steam locomotives, two diesel, I said. Maybe three and two, Jackson said. The rest were in for repairs, but they might run. So where are the trains? Lorraine asked. I looked down the tracks, then up at the iron-grey sky. The clouds had been growing progressively denser since Sholto had retasked the satellites overhead. Other than the first brief glimpse of Douglas... We had photographs of nothing but the tops of the clouds. That was our second mistake, one George had warned me of. We should have waited for the clouds to clear and found where the locomotives were before we came ashore. Trains have to stay on their tracks, I said. If they weren't in Port Erin, and as they're not here, they'll be somewhere between. They must have used the trains to ferry people from Port Erin, maybe from Castletown, Jackson said. Why, though? Why not drive? Why not cycle? Why not walk? Zombies? Lena said. That's always zombies. I can't have known how many there were, Jackson continued. I can't have thought there were so many on the island. That must have been it. Unless it wasn't people they were ferrying to Douglas. Whatever it was, it was zombies the engines brought to the city. They were trapped with nowhere left to go, no boats to escape, and... Uh, and we share your grief, Umbert said. We truly do. The boilers would have had to be hot, Jackson said. And this time I was sure he hadn't heard the interruption. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been time to get up steam. Unless the trains never made it this far, Dean said. They're not here, 
Jackson continued. Not in Port Erin, not in Castletown. They'll be somewhere between. Well, you want your trains, and I want to know what happened. He started walking down the tracks. Bill? Kim asked, and I could easily fill in the rest of the question. We'd planned to be ashore for a couple of hours, no longer, but we couldn't return without something to show for our trip. That would doom Umbert's campaign. I looked up at the sky. Let's call the Admiral, I said. We might be a while. Dean's probably right, I said, as I looked at the map. The trains never made it to Douglas. I make it about ten miles from Douglas to Castletown. Another five due west will get us to Port Erin. I held out the map to Sholto. Sounds about right, he said, waving the map away. Less than fifteen miles to cover? We should manage that and to return before nightfall. But will we manage it before it rains? Humans are waterproof, little brother. Never forget it. We were at the rear of the group. Jackson and Kim were in the lead. Umbert and Lorraine followed close behind. Dean and Lena were ten yards behind them, arrows notched to bows, both seeming far more aware of their surroundings than the psychiatrist. I glanced at my brother's pack. It was far larger and obviously heavier than anyone else's. What's in there? Some tricks, he said. Kim and I were talking. After what happened in Belfast, we thought it worth coming prepared. I got some ideas from that soldier, Bran, the one who used to go into the wasteland looking for survivors. Oh. I glanced upward. I was far more interested in the clouds. Even with my leg, I'd managed thirty miles in a day before, though that was usually because I had the undead pursuing me for some of it. Even so, we almost certainly wouldn't have to travel that far. The question was how far we'd managed to get before we were forced to take shelter. Despite my brother's glib nonchalance, when the storm came, we'd have to take refuge from the rain. That begged another question. For how long would we have to shelter? We'd planned for a few hours in Douglas and had the supplies to match. We carried water bottles, a few hundred rounds or a few dozen arrows, about a quarter of which had already been expended, and whatever snacks anyone had thought to bring. The Admiral was ready to send her troops after us, but I didn't want the expedition to end in an ignominious rescue. Hasn't this a bit like old times? Sholto said. Which old times? I asked, looking up at the trees. I saw a bird take flight and fly southward. I wondered if it was an omen, but if it was, I wasn't sure of what. When we were escaping from London, he said. You remember the train tunnel in Wales? Sure, I said. Usually around 3 a.m., when I wake in a screaming sweat. It's not something I want to relive. Are you trying to find a shared experience over which we can bond? Nope. I was thinking that if the trains were used in a bit to escape the undead, the zombies would have followed. So maybe they weren't used to escape the zombies, but to lure them away. Noisy beasts, locomotives. You're into steam trains? I asked, genuinely curious. Up until now, my brother's interests all seemed to be some way connected to his lifelong quest for revenge. Nah, he said, not really. It's more that steam trains are something I associate with Britain. When I first got to the U.S., I'd sometimes feel... Homesick isn't the right word. I'd seen our home burn to the ground, so the regret I felt was due to more than just distance from familiar bricks and mortar. There was more to do with all I'd lost, and I'd often tried to assuage it by escaping into British movies. For the most part, my choice was between rom-coms, period dramas, or adaptations of Sherlock Holmes. When I had a choice, I picked the latter, and they all had at least one shot of a steam train. Must have shot a few of the films here. Probably, though there are quite a few steam railways in Britain. Maybe we should have gone to one of those. At the very least, we should have waited until we had some satellite images of this place. Maybe. We're here, he cut in. Anyway, steam trains become something I associated with England. 
As I turned towards politics, I read up on the history of the railroad in America, the westward expansion, the Civil War. He stopped, one foot half raised. What? I asked. Howl, he said. Then he shook his head. That's nothing. Just something occurred to me about a guy that's now long dead. It doesn't matter. He started walking again. Anyway, I wouldn't describe steam trains as being a hobby of mine, but a springboard into various different interests. When you start talking like this, I said, it's usually the long route to a sharp point. What is it? The gauge of the tracks, he said. It's narrower than the lines on Anglesey. We can bring the locomotives back, but we won't be able to run them. Now it was my turn to stop. I looked down at the rails. Uh, that hadn't occurred to me. I guess it didn't occur to Jackson either. I looked towards the man, but my eyes caught something in the undergrowth. An arm. There was no sign of the rest of the body. Probably a zombie. I continued walking, though I wondered if there was any point. So the trains won't work on Anglesey. If we modify the axles, they will, he said. That can't be too hard. We can machine the parts easily enough, but it'll take time. I had an idea that we'd have a steam locomotive travelling up and down the island, I said. Smoke billowing from its stack, the whistle blaring. That would be a symbol more potent than the arrival of a plane that hasn't flown since. Maybe, Shalto said, but it won't happen before the election. We can bring a train back, but let's be honest with each other. If Umbert's going to win, you're going to have to do it my way. After all, my way isn't that much different to yours. Before I could reply, Kim dropped to a crouch, a fist raised in the air. We all stopped. A moment later, a bird cawed. Kim began walking again, though a little more slowly. To our right were a series of wide industrial buildings, partially hidden by a screen of trees. To our left was a stretch of waterlogged grassland, that was more blue than green. A bird flew from the trees, swooping low over the marshy ground, but it didn't land. If we rig the election, then what's the point in holding it? I asked. Because democracy is more than just voting, you know that, he said. And democracy is only one pillar of what we're trying to build. Sure, it's an important one, and if we remove it, the whole house will collapse, but it's not the only one. At the same time, it's the one that we are focusing on to the detriment of all the rest, specifically all the rest of the people, the survivors who still might be out there. Sholto and I reached the point where Kim had stopped. There, the water had seeped onto the tracks. They'd be washed away in another season. It's probably worth checking out these warehouses, I said. You mean as an alternative to the trains? No. I said, I meant next week, next month, maybe in the spring. By then, will there be anything left? He asked. You know, I hate warehouses. Unlike private homes, there could be anything inside. It could be everything that we're looking for. Certainly somewhere on this planet, there are warehouses brimming with canned food and bottled water. How many empty buildings will we have to search before we find the ones that are full? Even so... It won't be those. If the Manx had time to turn Douglas and Port Erin into refuges, and they had time to gather the steam trains and coal, then they had time to empty every warehouse of anything of immediate use. I know, I said. I gestured at a drift of leaves deep enough to bury a horse, and with a smell that suggested something like that might be concealed within. At the edge... Partially covered in rotting mulch was a corpse. It had both arms, but its skull had been crushed. You're right, the locomotives aren't going to work on their own. When we find the trains, we'll find them surrounded by the bodies of the undead and the people who fought them. We can hardly take a photograph of Umbert surrounded by those. Sholto sighed. You should have been the candidate. I don't want to lead. Didn't we always say that was a qualification for the job? Regardless, you're leading anyway. 
This whole expedition was your idea, not Umbert's. However he wins, whether it's my way or yours, in a month's time you'll be the one telling him what to do. I was saved having to reply when Lena abruptly pivoted ninety degrees and shot an arrow into the undergrowth. She had another arrow notch before Dean had raised his bow. Zombies? I asked when we'd caught up. One, Lena said. Slowly she lowered her bow. Above us the clouds were darkening. Around us the trees were silent. Ahead, Kim had stopped. Her rifle was pointing south, but her eyes were on me. Onward, I said. Onward at least until we find those trains. We found them a mile further down the tracks. The rearmost carriage was under the bridge where the old Castle Town Road crossed the railway line. The trains were lined up on the tracks, one after another. I'd been expecting to see locomotives. I wasn't expecting that they'd have carriages as well. Kim ran ahead to the first, and almost immediately ran back, waving her arms. Stop! Stop! What is it? Jackson asked. Do you remember the Shannon Estuary? She asked. The bodies in the cars? Oh, hell, I muttered. What? Lorraine asked. In Ireland, Kim said, Bill and I came across a long string of traffic of every kind of vehicle. Those that the animals couldn't get into had corpses inside. We think they were gassed by some kind of chemical weapon. I think it's the same here. There are bodies inside the carriages, decomposed but sitting down. Not many bodies, it's not full, I mean. I think they were hauling cargo in the carriages as well. At least, they were in that one attached to the diesel locomotive. Why? Lorraine asked. Who would do that? I don't know. I said. A trough, Lena said. Who? Lorraine asked. There was this pilot from Russia, Dean said. He was over in Ireland with us. Well, with Mark, really. That was in Malin Head. Anyway, Petrov said he had orders to drop his bombs on the Isle of Man. Said he crashed in Ireland. I don't know how much of what he said to believe. But why would he lie about the Isle of Man being his target? A steam train must have been quite a target from the air, Sholto said. It doesn't explain why anyone would drop chemical weapons on them, Lorraine said. Orders, I said, the same orders that led some to launch their nuclear missiles. Let's be thankful that enough rebelled. We looked at the rear carriage. What do you want to do, Bill? Kim asked. We found the trains. We can't use them, I said. Why not? Umbert said. Surely whatever chemical agent was used won't be dangerous any more. If it's the same chemical as was used near Shannon, then no, I said. We walked through that graveyard and survived. But do you want to bet your life on it? And that's not the real issue. We'll have to get rid of the corpses, bury them, I added, as Jackson straightened. And we will, but it'll take too long for our immediate need. No, we wanted a photograph of the candidate next to a locomotive that we could airlift to Anglesey. Even if we managed to bring an engine back before the election, it wouldn't count as a victory, not considering the condition in which we found them. Not considering... Well, the gauge is wrong. They won't work on the train tracks in Anglesey without modification. Taken together, that's not the story we want to tell. And people will have to be told there's no point trying to cover it up. We've enough grim stories already, Jackson said. Leave them be. He started walking back up the tracks. Wait, that's it, Lorraine asked. We're going home. We're tilting at windmills, Jackson said. I like the idea of a last election. I thought that would have been a nice end to our species story. Duff, really, since there won't be anyone left to know. Wait a moment, I said, taking a step after him. He stopped and turned around. What? We're tilting at windmills, he said again. You and your election, him and his satellites, me coming here. The difference is that you won't accept it. Our species is dying. Most of it is undead. The rest of us will die soon enough. All that's left is how we die. Yes, a democratic election would have been a better ending than the slow attrition of one death after another. Well, that death is coming. Last week I buried a friend. I hadn't known her long. Met her a few months ago after the outbreak. Nice woman. In a different world, in a different life. 
I couldn't pronounce her name, not properly. She said we should call her Sally, came from Singapore and knew she'd never go back. She died last week. It was leukemia. A rare kind, Dr. Knight said. Rare and unusual. A one in a billion case. And it was the third the doctor had seen. Technically, that's not radiation poisoning, but it amounts to the same thing, doesn't it? No. We're all tilting at windmills, doing the same thing that we used to do because there's nothing else left. I returned to this island again and again, even though I knew that everyone is dead. You, the politician, you organise an election while the Admiral recruits for her navy. When all else is lost, we fall back on the closest to the familiar we can find. Isn't that right, Doctor? It doesn't matter, though, because we'll all be dead soon. Yeah, we're tilting at windmills, but at least it keeps us busy. So what should we do differently? Umbert asked. Give up? It's not an option for us. We are the people who could not give up. We had that chance over and over again, and many more times besides, when the undead rose, when the government told us to walk meekly into the slaughterhouse, when our friends died, when they came back and we had to do the previously unthinkable, when we were starving, when we were freezing, when we were beyond exhausted, we could have given up. We did not. We kept on. We cannot stop. We cannot give up. It is against our nature. We are not the survivors. We are the survived. There was a moment of silence that stretched almost for two heartbeats. Is that how you talk to all your patients? Jackson asked. There were a few to whom I wish I had, Humbert said. Jackson shook his head, but he took a pace towards the rest of us. Now, Humbert continued, you raised a valid point. We have found the trains, and they won't suit our immediate need. So what will? A new narrative, I said. Care to suggest one? For a moment... I thought he was going to defer the question. You want to tell a story of hope, yes? Umbert asked. But one that's true, I said. For a given value of true, Sholto added. We need farmland, Umbert said, a place where we can plant and grow. Wouldn't that make for a good picture? People surrounded by fields absent of the living dead? What's the story that goes with them? Kim asked because we've seen plenty of zombies today. Not as many as in Ireland, but too many for me to want to swap my rifle for a plough. The story is one we all know, that of hard work, Humbert said. Hard work for all of us. Those steam trains, the plane, the satellites, they are shortcuts. Old technology that makes our lives easier, but they will not last forever. No. At the heart of our species' survival is reclaiming the land and relearning how to manage it. It will involve a fight, a struggle, not just against the undead, but against nature itself. That old foe is far more deadly, but we know how to tame it. The steam trains offered a promise that could never be delivered. No, the truth is that there is nothing but hard work ahead of us. It will be less hard here than on the Welsh mainland. As you say, there are fewer undead, but we will have to clear the island before we can call it safe. He's right about that, Lorraine said. This is far safer than it's been in Banga. No, seriously, she added. We've got to have one person on guard for everyone looting. Is there anyone want to clear the Isle of Man of the undead? Jackson asked. We did it on Anglesey, Umbert said. Maybe it is time we stopped tilting at those windmills and used them to grind grain. The first step will be to convince the populace that this is something they want. So we need some fields for a photograph, not for the election, but as a visual representation of our community's new goal, to clear the Isle of Man and then to reoccupy, to plant and to thrive. Jackson took a moment to weigh Umbert's words. It might amount to the same thing he said. It'll take months, and maybe too many of us, too much of our resources, too much of ourselves. Before I worked with children, Umbert said, my work was mostly in prisons. What I learned from the experience 
is that it is always better to rage against the dying of the light, and that sometimes rage is all we have left. A farm, Mr. Jackson? Okay, Jackson said. Okay, well, it was mostly grazing in the north. Here in the south, there's some good soil for arable farming. That's what I heard. We'll need somewhere with a view, I said, because we still need that photograph. A view? Maybe west of St. Mark's, Jackson said. I think I know somewhere that'll do. He looked at the carriages. You say we'll come back and uh, bury them? We'll have to, Umbert said, if we're to turn this island into a farm. Chapter 15 A Light, Then Night We left the railway behind and headed west across the fields. They were damp, uneven, and slowed our pace. Any of the first three farms would have suited a photograph, but I felt that Dr. Umbert had taken charge of our expedition. It was up to him to decide when we stopped. He didn't hurry us, and because we were travelling so slowly, we heard the undead before we stumbled into them. There were hundreds, travelling along a road that curved northeast to southwest. Where we all quietly crouched, Jackson froze. I grabbed him by the shoulders and pulled him down into the mud. I should have learned from Dean and Colum in Belfast. Bringing Jackson back to his sparsely populated island home was a mistake, though I'm not sure if it was the third, fourth, or tenth I'd made on the expedition. It was far from the last. Breathing in as much mud as air, I couldn't help but wonder what would happen when the Admiral took her entire crew back to their devastated homeland. At least that gave me something to think about, as a straggling column lurched down a road hemmed in by hedges. The sound of branches breaking, and the occasional snap of a crushed bone told us where the living dead were, and that they weren't getting any closer. We waited. The sky darkened again, but the rain didn't fall. A storm was coming, and that was as clear a sign as any that it was time for us to give up on this expedition. Finally, the undead were gone. Slowly, we stood. Kim... Lena and Dean ran forward in a half-crouch, weapons raised, until they reached the mangled hedge at the end of the field. There was a quiet hiss as Lena fired an arrow, then another as Dean did the same. I'm not sure how photogenic I'll be now, Umbert said, his tone light and jovial. He was covered in mud, we all were. What do you think, Mr. Jackson? Would you vote for a candidate coated in dirt? Jackson frowned. Uh, I suppose. I suppose it's proof you know how to get your hands dirty. It does indeed, Umbert said, smiling warmly at him. Then I think we should take our picture and head— There was a brief pause. But I heard it, and guessed the word he'd almost used. Back to the ship, he said. There's a hill on the other side of that road which would provide an excellent backdrop, don't you think, Mr. Jackson? Jackson shrugged. Suit yourself. The road down which the undead had processed was a mass of mud, trampled leaves, and five prone bodies. As Dean and Lena retrieved the arrows they'd fired, I examined the creatures they hadn't shot. Two had their heads crushed by the milling mass of the undead. Another, though, looks unhurt, I said, nudging the creature's arm with my sword. Unless you count the wound on its wrist, Kim said. But its head looks undamaged, I said. It's not proof, Bill, Kim said, not compared to the proof represented by the zombies that just marched down this road. I know, I said. I was grasping at straws, hoping for the impossible. I speared the sword through the unmoving creature, wiped the blade clean, and followed the others into the next field. After an acre of uneven ground, we found a ditch with a track on the far side. After a hundred yards, it was clear the track curved around the hill. Even so, it was as good a spot as any for a photograph. Umbert was right. It was time to go back. For me, though, admitting that was also an admission that my brother was also right. The election had to be won by Umbert, and that meant rigging the polls. There was no way around it. 
and no point putting it off. That also meant there was no point waiting until election day to ensure our candidate's victory. I picked up my pace, aiming to catch up with Sholto so I could concede defeat and begin plotting our next move. Before I reached him, Kim raised a hand, pointing into the distance. There was a light, she said, when we'd all caught up. You sure? Dean asked. Can't see anything. It was a flash, Kim said. Might have been, I don't know. I saw something, I'm sure I did, but maybe I was wrong. Absence of proof isn't proof of absence, Umbert said. Might have been the Admiral's people, Lorraine said. Call them, Jackson said, his tone taut. Call them and ask. A brief call confirmed that the Admiral was still in the harbour, as were her people. She volunteered a group to come and look. We're closer, Jackson said. Over there, you said. He started walking. I guess we're going to investigate, Lorraine said. Northwards, Humbert said. I'm reminded of the words of King Henry, though really I'm reminded of the words that Shakespeare wrote. Of course, that is often seen as a propaganda piece now, and perhaps that's why it's at the forefront of my mind. Unto the breach, then, once more! Umbert set a good pace, easily catching up with Jackson. He's starting to act the leader, Chalto said, as we fell into step at the rear. You know what they say, if you act it long enough, you start to believe the lines. Even if the lines came from Shakespeare? I asked. There are worse sources. You're happy, I said. Aren't you? It looks like Umbert will make for an okay leader, and that's more than I can say for most of the candidates I've worked with. Clearing this land would be an achievement, I said, but as a policy, it won't win us the election. We'll have to do it your way. That's what's bothering you? The election doesn't matter. It never did. But there is an election is all that counts. We've managed that, and for once we're not down to a decision between the better of two bad choices. I think this guy might even do a half-decent job. After all we've been through, I said, I can't help think we all deserve something more. Lorraine saw it next, an erratically flashing light coming from the northwest. After another hour of backtracking to avoid undead filled roads, detouring around flooded fields and trekking through overgrown tracks, we stood at the foot of a curving driveway. The jet-black asphalt drive was in far better repair than the pock-marked pothole tarmac of the narrow country road, but the new surface extended exactly to the line of the gates. They were made of a softwood stained a deep mahogany with black-painted wrought iron hinges, and they were wide open. Even closed, they wouldn't have offered much of an impediment to the undead, but it would have given us some reassurance about what we might find in the house. It looked like a recent build, in an almost Spanish colonial style, with at least six bedrooms, and possibly twice that number depending on how far back it extended. The building squatted sixty yards directly up the hill, but at least twice that if we were to follow the new road that snaked back and forth up a stepped garden. It was hard to tell what had been planted there, but from the profusion of withered stalks it had been a high-maintenance extravagance. What I first thought was a rockery that followed the curve of the road was actually a small stream, a now dry water feature that ended in a gutter by the gate. The house had been built for the view, but my interest was in the windows. I couldn't see a light, I couldn't see any people. To the south was a double garage, to the north a wooden pagoda covered in a forest of roses. The delicate white flowers of autumn's last bloom almost masked the frame. Are we sure it was here? Cholto asked, his attention on the road. I think so, Lorraine said. Yes, Lena said. I, Umbert began. He stopped, almost looking embarrassed as every eye turned on him. I was going to say that this gate hasn't been closed for months. Do you see the weeds caught around the bolt? If someone had recently taken refuge here, they would have closed the gate. And the light was probably just something catching the sun, Jackson said. Our collective eyes went up to the cloudy sky. I'm going to check, Jackson added. 
Anyone coming with me? How far are we to Douglas? I asked. About four miles, maybe five, Jackson said. I'm not too sure where we are. He gave a shrug. I'm not used to walking across fields. Then it's an hour or two back to the ship, Umbert said. We have time before dark. He looked to me. You're the boss, I said. Then we shall investigate, Umbert said. Twenty minutes, then we continue. We walked up the drive, weapons raised, bows drawn, fingers close to triggers, but saw neither human nor the undead. Kim, Dean, and Lena went to investigate the garage. Sholto and Jackson went to the house's front door, while Umbert, Lorraine, and I headed to the building's rear. I took the lead, slowing as I walked over a narrow patio that ran between the house and the lawn. The windows were unboarded, and the curtains had been drawn back. As I leaned forward to peer inside, my foot hit a loose stone on the dusty rockery. There was a clink, followed by a familiar rustle of cloth and a sighing rasp. It wasn't from inside, but from the rear of the house. Lorraine stepped away from the building, her rifle raised. I edged forward, listening to the sound of feet dragging along gravel get closer, closer, closer. I had the sword at head height as the first of them came around the side of the house. It was a man in a tattered tartan coat from which the pockets had been ripped away. So had his ears and nose, leaving gaping holes in that hideous face. That was all I had time to register. I stabbed the sword at his eyes. The bulbous blade sliced neatly into flesh and easily into the brain beyond. Bill, you're in the way! Lorraine called. Lionel, no! Umbert had stepped in front of me, and the undead had heard Lorraine's voice. As I dragged my sword free, and Umbert raised his crowbar, four zombies staggered around the house. Their arms banged into one another as they pushed and clawed towards him. Umbert swung, and his blow had force behind it, but the milling pack moved too erratically for his aim to be true. The crowbar slammed into the zombie's shoulder. Bone broke, and the creature sagged sideways. The other three pushed on, knocking the zombie to its knees, and then into the mud. Umber tried to raise his crowbar again, but there was no way he'd manage it in time. Duck, Lionel, Lorraine called. But there wasn't time for that, either. I dived forward, sword and arm outstretched, throwing myself at the undead. My sword hit flesh, and I lost my grip as I shouldered, punched and kicked at the zombies. We fell in a tangled heap, and I kept rolling, kept moving, kept pushing and jabbing, butting and pulling myself out of that mass of grasping death. I vaguely registered a yell that wasn't mine, and then something that might have been a shot, and then there was only green grass beneath my face. One more roll, and I staggered to my knees, fists raised, in time to see Dr. Umbert slam his crowbar down onto a zombie's skull not three feet from my own. The zombie fell. Umbert swung around as Lorraine fired again. As quickly as it had begun, it was over. Yes, Umbert said, wiping his crowbar on the ragged remains of the tartan coat. We may know how to fight, but that doesn't make us soldiers. They are what we'll need if we are to reclaim the Isle of Man, an army of soldiers, not a mob of fighters. I pushed myself to my feet and retrieved my sword. I agreed with the man, but didn't think that was the time to discuss it further. The back door was locked and sealed tight, so we returned to the front. What happened to you? Dean asked. Zombies, Lena said. Zombies, I agreed. How many? Kim asked. Five, Lorraine said. The back of the house is secure. It's locked. Couldn't see anything through the windows. The garage is empty, Kim said. There's an old Aston Martin on blocks that takes up half the space. Whatever took up the rest is gone. She looked me up and down. Looks like you need some new clothes. You really do go through them, Bill. I was covered in mud and gore. I looked around for a water butt or fish pond in which I could rinse off the worst of it, but there was a shout from the house. 
Sholto stood by the front door. You better come and see, he said. There were two decomposing corpses in the living room. One lay on the floor, the other sat in a chair. On the ground next to them were two familiar one-use syringes. On the coffee table was a third syringe, the contents still inside. What happened? Dean asked. The vaccine, Jackson said. That's it? Dean asked, pointing at the syringe. Lena grabbed his arm. I wasn't going to touch it, he said. That's the vaccine, I said. Three syringes, so three people were here. One of them, Jackson sighed. The story was clear enough. One of them escaped. I'm going to look for a name, for a note, see if they left word for anyone who came after, because wherever they went, they didn't make it to Anglesey. You sure? Sholto asked. I know all who did, Jackson said, and none came from a place like this. What was causing the flashing light? Lorraine asked. It was a... Well, I'm not sure what to call it, Jackson said. It was a bit like a wind chime, but for light. Lots of prisms on a length of cord, with small mirrors behind them. It was in the window of one of the bedrooms. So there wasn't a light, Dean said. No lights, no people, no trains. This whole expedition was pointless. We didn't achieve the goals with which we set out, Umbert said. That doesn't mean we should judge our trip a failure. That is the danger of hindsight. We assess the present against targets for the future we set in the past. It is a common conceit that such targets can help us mold our future, a conceit we indulge at our peril, for experience tells us we can do little but shape it. Last year, what future did you envision for yourself? University, perhaps? Me? Dean asked. I was thinking about it. How much time did you spend thinking about it? Humbert asked. How many hours agonizing over different courses and campuses and costs? Did you consider studying in England, in the Irish Republic? Holland? Lena said. I was going to Holland. Oh, to do what? I asked, curious that the oft-silent girl had chosen to speak. Oceanography and maritime management, she said, then pursed her lips as if clamping down on any other words that might dare escape. You should talk to Heather, Lorraine said. For how long has this been an interest of yours? Umbert asked Lena. Lena's eyes darted left and right, and I could imagine her brain whirring as she tried to find a monosyllabic reply. A while, she said. I, I like watching ships. I was going to study business, Dean said, coming to Lena's rescue. Not music? I asked. I'm good at music, he said. I know how to play. I know how to write. But if you don't know how to manage the business, if you have to rely on agents and managers, then you get gouged. That's what my brother said. Interesting, Umbert said, in that frustratingly opaque manner that psychiatrists must practice in a mirror. And you, Mr. Wright, did you have your future planned until retirement? Now I look back on it, more or less, I said. My plan was to get Jen Masterton elected as mayor of London. After a five-year stint, she'd stand in her old family seat up in Northumberland, and she'd win. It would be such a massive swing to her party that the leadership would be hers, guaranteed. She'd enter number ten, and I'd follow first as her chief of staff, then as an MP who in about thirty years' time would follow her into Downing Street. That was my plan. And you know the interesting thing about it? The arrogance? Kim said. There's that, I said. But I meant the time scale. Thirty years? That's a long time to wait. Probably because that wasn't what you truly wanted to do, Umbert said. After all, in truth, how much of that plan was about you? We look back on our lives and see a straight path. But when we look to the future, it's like a maze of junctions intersections and crossroads. Having passed one, it is only natural to look back and wonder what might have been had we trod a different path. That is life. The dreams we had last year are lost to us. That doesn't mean the time we spent agonizing over those decisions is wasted. 
It helped create the people we are now, and that will help inform the people we must become. We came to this house because we thought there was a light. None of us thought there was a great chance at finding any people alive, but we came anyway, because that is what we do. As Mr. Tull often says, we are the help that comes to others. It is a simple oath we each swear to one another, but it is the most powerful one there could be. No, this trip wasn't wasted, but it is best that we return to Douglas. I want a few minutes, Jackson said. I want to find out these people's names. And I'd better look for some clothes, I said. I found clothes that almost fit in a palatial bedroom with an ensuite that consisted solely of a bathtub. There was no toilet, sink, or shower. The tub was situated in the middle of a room at the front of the house. The wide windows offered a spectacular panorama of the slooping hills beyond. I spent a long minute looking at the view, trying to spy the sea before I returned downstairs. Mr. Jackson is still searching, Dr. Umbert said. Everyone else was gathered in the hallway by the open front door. There's a bathroom upstairs, I said. That's all it contains, one bath and a wide window with a fantastic view. Someone wanted to look at the view from the bath. That was the entire purpose of the room. Why do you find that strange? Umbert asked, slipping back into his psychiatrist's persona. I was saved having to come up with an answer by Lena. Rien, she said. She and Kim stood either side of the door, looking outside. Not too heavy, Kim said. Give it a minute, it'll probably clear. It didn't. After ten minutes, we closed the front door. After twenty, I went up to the bathroom to stand watch, but there was nothing to see but the storm as visibility dropped and the sky emptied. Cholto called the Admiral, Kim said. Jackson's started a fire. What did the Admiral say? They've secured the harbour and found a few hundred candles. Other than that, not much. What is there for her to say? With the clouds like this, they can't find us on the satellites. What she can do, or someone on her crew can, is tell us that this storm is likely to last for a few hours. We're going to be here for the night. There's worse places to be, I said. Agreed. She turned around. You weren't kidding. Just a bath. Nice view, though. A very nice view, I said. I think we can use that bath again. We'll have to redirect the downpipe, of course. Tonight? No, not tonight, I said. When the rain stops, we'll dig a pair of graves near that pagoda. We'll dig them deep and add a marker and a name to each. Why? Because we were looking for somewhere to call our own, I said. Somewhere to stop fighting and to start farming. Why not here? We'll have to clear the island of the undead first. But when that's done... Why not say that so are we, done with fighting and the past? We can start a new life, a new future, right here, you, me, and the children. I... I think that I'd like that. Chapter 16 The Last Watch The 20th of October, Day 222 The Isle of Man the rain kept falling, and it soon became inevitable that we'd have to delay our return to the ship until morning. I think I was the only one happy about that. Being away from Anglesey had cleared my mind. I could see the possible futures ahead of us, and a path to something different, something better. It would be a successor to all that went before, rather than a simple continuation or regression to the basest mean. In some ways, it was a distraction from the election, but I wondered if that too was simpler than I'd thought. After spending a little time with Umbert, I was reasonably certain he would make as good a leader as anyone else. Perhaps what mattered wasn't that he won fairly, but that he thought he'd won the election fairly. Though I wasn't happy with the compromise, I could live with it for a few years. More importantly, I thought the Admiral could too. With those thoughts battling one another, there was no prospect of sleep, so I volunteered for the first watch. The bathroom window 
offered the best view of the house and the land beyond, though with the onset of rain that view had been truncated to the edge of the nearest field. The cloud-covered night sky had cut visibility to as far as my torch could reach. There was a nice house, but was it the right one for us? Midnight came and went as my mind turned to the relative merits of living closer to the coast, perhaps somewhere with a sea view. I smiled at the idea of window shopping for a new home, something I'd not done since before the outbreak, but which I'd done on many a sleepless night when living in my small flat. Here, though, we'd have our pick of any property we wished. But until the undead were gone— it was as much a fantasy as when I lived in London. The first step was ensuring that Umbert won. Deciding that I'd hear any undead approach long before I saw them, I settled into the not-too-comfortable chair. I took out my notebook and began composing an article to be published alongside the photograph of Umbert. I'd filled a page when I heard soft footsteps, followed by a light approaching the bathroom's open door. It was Dean. Can't sleep? I asked. Not really, he said. I thought I'd take over the watch, let you get some rest. I'll sleep on the ship, I said. Yeah, me too. What are you writing? Dean asked. Here, have a read. I handed him the notebook. That's a bit long, Dean said when he'd finished. That's good, he added, but I'm just not sure I'd read all of it. I laughed softly as long as you read enough of it. Do you think you'll vote for him? Umbert? I don't know. Do I get a vote? I'm not exactly from Anglesey. I tapped the last sentence on the page. He's running for leader of humanity, the standard bearer of... Uh, actually, you're right. I'll ditch that last part. It's a bit too pomp and circumstance. Dean shrugged. As a true, though, what you wrote... And what Dr. Umbert said earlier? I think so, I said. There's a binary choice ahead of us. Wherever on this earth we go, to a greater or lesser extent, we're all going to be farmers in a year or two. When the zombies are gone, we'll use our swords for plowshares, because there are too few of us for them to be weapons. We'll look back on moments like these in years to come, telling our children stories of the times we fought monsters. Kim thinks those stories will become legends, the legends myths, and those myths will become religions. Whether she's right will depend on how much we forget. The choice lies in what we do before we lay down our swords. Do we give up on the world, or do we seek to help as many as we can? If stories become myths, and those religions, do we want them to be founded on an act of selfishness, or one of sacrifice? Do we help others, or just help ourselves? That's the choice. And it's not one between the two candidates, but between our own conflicting desires. Except there are three candidates, Dean said. Bishop? Yes, he'll be a problem. But it's one for the future. There are always going to be voices who'll speak against the crowd, even when the crowd is heading in the right direction. I heard him speak. Dean said, Bishop, I mean. You did? At the docks? I left the ship because, well, that's a small ship. The Admiral's, she's okay. And she helped Callie. But she's very definitely in charge. Anyway, Bishop was given a speech. I listened. I was curious. Why not, right? Sure, I said. What do you think? I've not had a chance to hear him yet. He's insane. Dean said, I didn't really understand them. I mean, I understood the words. That was all fire and brimstone. The kind of thing politicians used to say. In school, we'll listen to some recordings. Speeches from the 1970s. It was like that, but worse. All anger and blame. Sort of reminded me a bit of Mark, except more intense. Oh? Like how the world had ended, and we could build our own utopia. Dean went silent, no doubt remembering the community in Malinhead. Mark talked about Utopia. He had a copy of the book. I read it. You know they had slaves. You have to read it in the context of its time, 
I said. Yeah, but they were still slaves, Dean said. It makes you wonder if that's the kind of world that people like Bishop want. A world with shh, I hissed. I'd heard something, and it hadn't come from inside the house. I shone the torch through the window. Despite the glare, I saw the figure outside, a solitary, ragged being I almost thought was human. Then its head jerked sideways, and it looked straight up at the light. Zombie, I said, and swept the light around the visible part of the garden. Only one, I think. Hard to tell. How did it get into the garden? You want me to wake the others? No, stay here. Shine your light outside, I said, standing up. If more appear, shout. If not, come down when it's done. We closed the gate leading up the drive, but there had been no way of sealing the property, so we'd settled for barricading the front door. I dragged the cabinet away, kicked away the wedges holding it closed, and stepped outside. I shone the torch left and right until it settled on the zombie. It hadn't moved. Sword raised, I advanced towards the creature, and it stepped towards me. The shadows added to the shapelessness of its blue-green boiler suit. I couldn't tell which of the dark stains were dirt and which were blood. It jerked forward, and I skipped sideways as it threw its arms towards me. I brought the sword up and neatly down just above its ear, cutting deep into its skull. The zombie fell. I listened. The creak of branches, the rustle of leaves, the wind chime by the garage gates. It was a veritable symphony. Dean's light stopped flashing about the trees and hedges, and settled on a moving shape. Another zombie, heading from the direction of the front gate. I took a step towards the creature, just as another stepped into the beam of light. Two became four, and I backed towards the house. There was an urgent rat-a-tat from above. I looked up, but with his light shining outward, I couldn't see Dean. As I looked down, I saw what he was trying to tell me. Three more creatures stumbled towards me from around the side of the house. The nearest was eight feet away. It staggered closer as I brought the sword up. The zombie swiped its clawed hand forward as I swung the sword left to right. The blade cut through its fingers, but the zombie didn't notice. I stabbed out, aiming the sword at its face, but the creature's head bobbed. The blade did nothing more than cut a line through flesh. I skipped back a pace, and another. With a third, my arm hit the brick wall of the house. I swiped the sword in front of me again, a reflexive move that did nothing to scare off the undead. I darted inside and slammed the door closed just as an undead hand clawed against the wood. I leaned hard against the door. Feet pounded on the stairs as Dean ran down to join me. Shoot them from above, I said, as he reached for an arrow. First, let's seal this door, quick. We hammered the wedges in and moved the cabinet in front of the door. It wasn't as heavy as I thought. As the door shook, so did the cabinet. Zombies? Kim called out from the top of the stairs. About eight, I think, I said. Must have come up the drive. Dean, come on, I need your bow, Kim said. Dean ran up the stairs. I don't think Kim did need his help, but upstairs was safer than immediately in front of the soon-to-break front door. I ran into the living room, not the one in which we'd found the two corpses, but one on the other side of the front door. It was a library, though with as much space given to old vinyl LPs as to books. I grabbed the nearest armchair and dragged it towards the door, managing two feet before Lorraine appeared. How many? she asked. I saw about eight, I said, so there's probably three times that number. They followed us? she asked. I guess, I said, chipping splinters from the frame as we dragged the chair through the door. Had the zombies followed us? Perhaps, but the garden between the house and main road was steep. Unless they were within a few hundred yards of their prey, gravity should dictate the path they'd take. The door was shaking violently. There was no more time to worry about how the undead had appeared. They were here, and could be inside in seconds. 
we shoved the chair into place and took a step back, me with my sword raised, Lorraine with her rifle held to her shoulder. The rest of the house was awake. I could hear feet upstairs running from room to room. Umbert stood on the stairs, Jackson close behind. I like being walking with a cup of tea, Lorraine said. I don't mind coffee, and I'll settle for a glass of water if that's all that's available, but... The door shook again. The bottom-most wedge flew out. Then the shaking stopped. Kim and the others must have shot the creature. I relaxed, letting my sword drop. They're at the back, Sholto called from upstairs. Stay here, I said to Lorraine. Watch the door. The front doors opened into a hall twice as wide as the stairs, and those were twice the width of a normal set. Situated behind the library was a large kitchen, with more than enough room for a table that would seat twelve. Made of pine, it was an odd contrast to the granite worktops, charcoal grey taps and wall-length window outside of which stood the undead. I shone the light back and forth, but I only counted two. My torch settled on a creature wearing a bobbled woolen hat, just before a bullet smashed through its brain. The zombie collapsed. So did the next creature, a second after my light shone on its decaying face. Only two, I said, but spoke too quickly. A light came from upstairs, illuminating a creature ten yards away. Wrapped in what looked like ski trousers and jacket, it moved slowly even for the undead and made an easy target for Sholto. The zombie fell. The table, Umbert said, let's block this window. Together, we propped it against the glass, but other than the outsized tap, there was no way of securing it in place. Five inches too short, I muttered, looking at the uncovered gap between table and wall. I doubt that's going to be our greatest problem, Umbert said. The doors are closed, the glass is triple glazed, I muttered, shining it around the kitchen. I checked the perimeter before we settled in for the night. We've got snipers in the upper windows. We're safe. I wouldn't go that far, Umbert said. I think it was the plane. It would have flown overhead on its approach to Anglesey, and that must have woken the zombies from their sedentary torpor. Though I am surprised the undead found us here. Me too. Maybe it was the wind chime above the garage. Though if it was, why weren't there more here when we arrived? Ah, it doesn't matter. We better check the other ground floor rooms, and then close all the doors. If the zombies do get inside, let's keep them contained. As we went from room to room, I replayed the events of the previous evening. While Jackson had lit a fire, I'd walked the perimeter. The windows were strong. The back door was locked and utterly immovable. I'd considered it as secure as almost anywhere we'd taken refuge in England. I wondered whether that was our mistake. Everyone else had relied on my assessment, and I had relied on the steep garden to keep the undead on the road. Umbert was right. We were fighters, not soldiers. Before I could tell him, the front door shook again. What's going on? I asked. Jackson ran upstairs to find out. That was a terrible minute, standing there with sword, crowbar and rifle raised, as the door, cabinet and chair shook and shifted, not knowing when the undead might break through, nor how many we were facing. There's twenty of them out there. Jackson said, running down the stairs. More at the back. The zombies aren't an easy target, and Kim and your brother don't want to waste the ammo. What time is it? I asked. About half two, Jackson said. How long until dawn, I meant. How long until there's enough light that we can leave? Two hours, Humbert said. There was a bang of fist against glass coming from the library. Two hours? They'll get in, Lorraine said. This reminds me of England, Umbert said, specifically of Western Supermare. We had a similar problem there. The thumping grew louder, then stopped as the zombie was shot from above. We'd taken refuge in a terrace near the sea, exhausted and depressed that we'd not found a boat. As to why we thought there would be a boat, that's a different story. As I say, we took refuge in a Victorian terrace. The undead had followed us. There were too many of them, too few of us, and far, far too many points of entry. We have the same problem here. 
We need to control their entry, lure them to one point, kill those we can reach and leave the rest to be shot. I saw there was a porch beneath a window on the north side of the house. At dawn, if they're not all dead, we can clamber down there and run across the garden, then into the fields. There was another rattle of fist against window. Dean appeared at the top of the stairs. Kem wants to know if there's a plan. We're going to break the window in the library, I said. We'll lure the zombies to it and kill those that get within reach. You shoot the rest. Tell Sholto to call the Admiral. We might need her extraction team. The library had a wide bay window that took up almost the entire exterior wall. On the inside were a series of folding shutters that looked as if they were soundproof. Taken with a thick door, the profusion of records, and the thick set of decks, I think the owners had spent more time listening than reading. As Umbert, Jackson, and Lorraine moved the other chairs out of the way, I checked that the shutters could be slid closed and we'd be able to secure the room should we need to. Lorraine wedged her torch into the bookshelf, so it shone on the window. Everyone ready? I asked, wiping my palms on the thin coat I'd found in the upstairs closet. It was thigh length, thin, designed to be worn over a suit, and had a designer label I dreamed of one day affording. What happened in Western Supermare? Jackson asked, as he raised his rifle to his shoulder. Oh, uh, we escaped, Umbert said. Of course we did, otherwise I wouldn't be here to tell you. Lorraine, perhaps you would do the honours. The... all right. She raised her rifle, tracking the barrel left and right, as the number of undead grew outside the window. Kim had stopped shooting the creatures, at least those immediately adjacent to the library, and I could now count four snarling faces outside, though only seven hands and one seeping stump beat against the glass. The rain fired three shots. The glass shattered and fell. For a moment, there were three undead outside, but then more pushed their way forward. Jackson fired, one quick shot after another. The zombies collapsed, two outside, one inside, knocking clear the last few shards of glass in the bottom of the frame. Save the bullets, I said, taking a step forward. From above, something red, arced through the air, a flare. For a moment I saw outside, and saw it properly. There were hundreds of the creatures. Then the flare landed, rolled down the hill, darkness returned. Yeah, Lorraine said, save the bullets, we're really gonna need them. I stabbed the sword at the nearest face, drew back and stabbed again. To my right, Umbert swung his crowbar up and down, with an efficiency of movement that showed he'd done this before. I focused on the undead, but not on the faces. I didn't know how many creatures I killed or how long I stabbed, lunged, speared, cut and hewed. When I missed my target for the second time in a row, the blade carving splinters from the window frame, Jackson tapped me on the shoulder. I'll take over, he said. I stepped back. He stepped forward his machete already cleaving down in a sweeping arc that cut deep into a zombie's face. Lorraine had already swapped with Umbert. The candidate was wrapping a cloth around his hand. You okay? I asked. A crowbar isn't the best weapon for this type of work, he said. Got a little graze, not to worry, he added. I've been bitten before. First time was in Weston, and I remember that vividly. Oh? I asked only half listening. There were four dead zombies lying across the broken window frame, but there was a snapping sea of mouths behind. I was glad the torchlight only extended for a few feet into the dark. Our situation was far worse than I'd thought, but knowing precisely how much worse wasn't going to improve things. Yes, an unpleasant night, Umbert said, but I survived. How did you get out? Oh, uh, we went up to the attics, he said. We broke through from one house to the next until we were at the end of the street. I escaped through the back. Can't do that here, unfortunately. No. We could retreat upstairs, breaking the stairwell as we went. I wasn't sure that would save us. The house was shaking as the undead walked into the walls. How long until dawn? An hour and a half, Humbert said. There were footsteps on the stairs. 
Dean ran down. Kem needs your ammo, he said. She's almost out. Yeah, and we've only got thirty arrows left, Dean added. Umbert pulled two magazines from his belt and handed them to Dean, along with his rifle. That's all I have. I was never a very good shot. Where did that flare come from? I asked Dean. Shalto, he said. Tell him to throw out another, I said. I'd like to see what's out there. Doesn't you see? Dean asked. I saw hundreds, but we must have killed at least half that number. No, I meant, didn't you see what happened to the flare? A zombie caught fire. The others knocked it over and they sort of trampled the flames out, Dean said. Kevin says he's not to throw another in case he sets fire to the house. Lorraine swore as she missed her swing, but she made up for it with her next blow, a ferocious hack that nearly severed the zombie's head. We better swap, I said. I tapped Jackson on the arm. I had to do it twice before he stepped back. Give Dean half your ammo, I said, taking his place at the window and turning my attention solely to the undead. There had to be at least fifty dead creatures outside the window, probably more. Their bodies created an obstacle for the undead behind, causing them to trip and slip, but they also created a ramp. As I swung my tired arm and mistimed the blow, the sword sliced a line through the creature's grey checkered shirt. The zombie lurched forward and fell inside the room. I stabbed down, spearing the sword through its brain. Bill, Jackson called, as another creature toppled forward into the house. Lorraine raised her rifle, firing at the zombies outside, as Jackson stepped into the gap I'd left, spearing his machete down. Sorry, Kate, he said as he wrenched the blade free and sliced at the next zombie. There was no time to worry that the man was killing people he knew, no time to worry about anything other than that our plan was failing. I wiped the worst of the gore from my dripping hands and ran the sword's blade down the sleeve of my jacket. Outside, the sea of faces seemed endless, but there had to be fewer. Bill, the back, Cholto called. I limped into the kitchen, but the table blocked the view outside. I went into the hall and saw Sholto halfway down the stairs. They're at the back, he said, about fifty of them, maybe more. I think they're coming from the hills, not from the road. And how many are at the front? A hundred, give or take, he said. Less than there were. That was something. They're going to get inside, Bill, he said, sounding strangely calm. We're running out of bullets. You didn't bring any in your pack? A few hundred extra rounds, but we've already used them. We're almost down to arrows. And flares? I said. How many did you bring? I have another four. And I've got some flashbangs and a few other distractions. They'll help us escape. We've just got to survive until dawn. There was a crack of breaking glass from the rear of the house. I ran into the kitchen in time to see the table shudder and move. We can't keep them out, Shalto said, so we need to let them in. Let them fill the downstairs, and we'll keep them down here. The Admiral's got people ready. At dawn, they'll leave. One hour after that, they'll be here. The table wobbled, pivoting around the tap. There was a snap as the metal broke, and the table rocked towards us, clattering onto the floor. A forest of arms took its place. I took a reflexive step back, but we had time. It would be minutes, perhaps longer, before any of them got inside. There was a grinding sound from the front door as more of the undead pushed against it. I don't think they were deliberately trying to get in so much as trying to get to the library's broken bay window, but that door was the weak point. Our crude barrier would break, and then half of us would be trapped downstairs, the rest upstairs. Open the doors to the rooms, I said. We quickly opened the other doors on the ground floor, including the one to the living room with its two corpses. I saw glass littering the carpet near where one of the windows had already broken. I went into the library. We need to fall back, I said to Lorraine, as Umbert and Jackson both hacked down at the same creature tumbling through the window. There were a dozen corpses already inside the room. To the stairs, go! Three more reached the window falling into the room at the same time. 
One managed to claw at Umbert's leg before I stabbed the sword down into its skull. Back! The stairs! Go! I said, pushing the candidate towards the door. Go on! I yelled at Jackson. The man's expression was blank, but tears had streaked lines through the dried blood on his face. Go! I yelled, pushing him on. In that moment, when there was no one defending the window, another four creatures toppled in, joining the two on the ground still trying to stand. I stabbed the sword into the thrashing mass, and then skipped out of the reach of a snapping mouth and three clawing hands. Half pushing Jackson, half watching the undead, I was wholly regretting my decision. We'd acted too early. We could have held the undead for another few minutes, and every single one counted. Mr. Jackson, please give me a hand to get upstairs, Umbert said as calmly as ever. He was leaning against the banister, his leg soaked with blood and covered in a crude bandage. There was a creak from the door. The wood cracked, splitting above the bottom hinge. Cabinet and chair rocked. I don't think we'll be moving to this house, Kim said, easing past Jackson and Umbert as they made their way upstairs. The door rocked back a few more inches. You go too, Bill, she said. You need the rest. I'm fine, I lied. I know you're not. Are you out of ammo? I asked. I've ten rounds left, she said. I'm saving those for our escape. She raised her machete. The steel shone in the dancing torchlight. Half an hour and then we can leave. Check with your brother. He's got a plan. A zombie staggered into the doorway of the library. Kim lunged. There was only room for one person to fight at a time. In theory, that meant there was only one foe to be faced at a time. But behind that enemy were a dozen others, shoving and pushing their way towards us. Kim took a step back, and I did the same, almost walking into Sholto. He had a hatchet in one hand, a bayonet in the other. I got the kids watching front and back, he said. Lorraine, go and check on them. See how many arrows they've got left. Quick now. The woman pushed past us, pausing halfway up the stairs, as if realizing that it was a ploy to get her out of immediate danger. Kim swung again. Sholto positioned himself close behind her. Yes, in theory this was safer. Only one of us was in danger at any one time. Theory is meaningless when that one is someone you love. I brought a helicopter. Chalto said. What? I asked as Kim hacked her machete at an undead face. The blade stuck. She let go, and Chalto pushed himself past her. The zombie had fallen, but his arms still moved. As Chalto jabbed the bayonet into the next creature's eyes, he stabbed his foot down on the machete still embedded in the zombie's skull. The blade dug deep, splitting the creature's head in two. A helicopter! Chalto roared swinging the hatchet to the next zombie. Remote controlled. Attached speakers underneath. Didn't work. Wasn't louder than the undead. He swung, stabbed, and the zombie fell. He scooped up Kim's machete, passing it to her just as there was a loud crack of splintering wood. The door split from its hinges. Cholto jumped back, forcing Kim and I up the stairs as he took station on the bottom step. Got the idea from Bran, he said. They have this scheme with helium balloons. Thought a helicopter would work better. Should have brought more ammo instead. You live and learn. The zombie scrummed at the broken door, pushing at the cabinet and chair. The only ray of light in that dark moment was that the furniture was being pushed towards the library's door. The kitchen, Kim called. A zombie lurched through the door to the kitchen. There was only one, but others would follow. Back up the stairs, Chalto said. Let's see how well they can climb. He went up and stood, waiting, as the undead pushed and pummeled their way into the house. There was an open alcove underneath the stairs, with no obvious pillar supporting them. Bars running through the steps embedded in the wall must hold them up. I couldn't decide if that would make it easier or more difficult to break them down. Either way, the time was swiftly approaching when we'd have to try. But I did bring flashbangs. Sholto continued. Only his slightly laboured breathing gave the lie to his blithe tone. I figure we can throw them out the back while we make our escape to the north, 
I don't know if Umba can run, I said. Then we'll carry him, Sholto said. You know what they say, leave no Canada behind. His tone finally changed, as the first of the undead reached the stairs and staggered up two before losing its footing. It slipped, falling to its knees. It didn't stop moving, however, but began to claw its way up. Get everyone ready. I'll hold them here. Kim unslung her rifle. Go on, Bill. I've got his back. Douglas is due east? I asked Jackson. He sighed. Aye. You recognize some of the undead? I asked. Aye, I do. He sighed again. This isn't the time to mourn them. No, that will be later, Umbert said. Do we have a plan? Cholto has some flashbangs. I'll throw them out a window to the west. We'll go out the window to the north, the one with a porch underneath, and then we'll run. Jackson, you lead the way. Dean, you help Dr. Umbert. Lena and Lorraine, you watch their backs. Cholto, Kim, and I will be right behind. When? Lena asked. Soon, I said. I took the flashbangs and the sat phone from Sholto's pack and went to look outside. The sky was lightening when I called the Admiral. She'd dispatched the rescue party, but we couldn't wait. There were close to a hundred undead outside, but most were gathered around the kitchen window and the front of the house. Soon more would get inside, though, and the rest would spill around to the north side of the building. If we stayed, we'd die. Escape didn't offer much better odds, but if we could get away from the house and into the fields, we only had to keep ahead of the zombies until rescue reached us. There were no good choices, and no way to turn back time. I put the sat phone away, opened the window, and then returned to the stairs. Cholto was at the top, flexing his hand. He'd lost his bayonet. Kim was two steps below, slashing the machete at an upturned face. The blow missed, and she had to jump out of reach of the creature's clawing hands. This isn't working, she said, hacking down again. This time the machete slammed into the zombie's skull. The creature toppled backwards, knocking down the three that had been climbing the stairs behind it. Time to go, little brother, Sholto said. On the count of thirty, I said. I ran along the corridor to the room above the porch, counting under my breath. When you hear the bang... Go, I said to the gathered group, then ran down to the other end of the hall and into the most marvellous bedroom I'd seen. Most of the roof had been replaced with a skylight. The bed was positioned so that it lay underneath the stars. It would have been a fantastic house to live in, to watch the children grow up in while we grew old. But that was another fantasy, an unattainable dream like so many others we'd had out in the wasteland. Like those others, it had proven fatally dangerous. I threw the flashbang outside and turned away as there was an explosion of noise and sound. I readied the second, uncertain how long I should wait before throwing it. Five seconds passed. Ten. Twenty. Bill! Kim called. We're waiting! I threw the second flashbang and limped out of the room as it detonated outside. I don't know if those helped us at all. When I reached the stairs, there were more creatures in the doorway, another four milling their way up the stairs. Sholto hacked down with his hatchet. It lodged in a zombie's skull, but the creature toppled down the stairs, dislodging those that followed. Sholto pulled two flares from his pocket, lit both, and dropped them into the undulating mass of the undead. The hallway turned a hellish red. Let them burn, Sholto said and give the Marines something to aim for. Kim ran, I limped, and Sholto followed along the corridor and into the small bedroom above the porch. Umbert was still there, Dean by his side. He won't go, Dean said. I should be the last, shouldn't I? Umbert said. You were meant to be the excuse to make sure that Dean got out, I barked. Go, Dean, go, Kim, get him out of here. Kim hustled Dean out of the window. You next! I said. I really should be last, Umbert said. There was something in his tone, a hint of desperation that made me wonder what happened to those other people he'd been with in Western Supermare. But it was Lorraine who was helping him with his campaign, 
and that there had been no one else by his side, told me their fate, but not how it had come to pass. This wasn't the time to find out. I dragged him to the window as Sholto shoved the bedroom door closed. They're coming, Sholto said, as I pushed Umbert outside. When he was half outside, Umbert stopped resisting. He began climbing. Dawn was on its way. I saw Kim raise her rifle and fire one of her last shots into a zombie staggering towards Dean. Then I turned back to my brother. He was leaning against the door, a strange smile on his lips. He wanted a new narrative, he said, a story that would win you the election. I think you found it. Make sure you get a photo of the house as we leave. Go. I'm right behind. I climbed out of the window, balanced on the edge, glanced down and saw Umbert waiting below. Come on! I yelled at my brother. He ran, diving from the doors it split open. I nearly fell from the shallow roof as he threw himself out of the window, but turned it into a drop and roll, picking himself up as he landed neatly a foot away. Lean on me, he said to Umbert. Let's get away from here. We limped away. I saw Kim ahead, waving an arm, in what I hoped was a signal that the others were safe. We gave a suspiciously dark screen of trees a wide berth, angling towards the rose-covered pagoda and the empty garden beyond. Dawn slowly swept across the fields. There were a few thick clouds scudding across the sky, but the previous night's storm had blown itself out. I turned around to look at the house. A zombie toppled out of the window through which we'd climbed, but the rest were still angling towards the front of the building. We'd made it. We'd survived. We'd escaped. I would take a photograph, but not yet. Smoke followed that zombie out of the window. The house was burning, and we were too close. I turned around and limped after Umbert and my brother. They were level with the pagoda. I saw the roses move, the branches twisted and broke, petals fell. Perhaps it had been trapped in there since the outbreak. Perhaps this was the third occupant of the house. Perhaps it was only one of the many creatures that had attacked us during the night. It hardly matters now. The zombie staggered out of the rose-covered pagoda. Thorny runners snagged its clothing, tore at its skin, and ripped into its flesh. That would have caused a human to stop, to scream. The zombie didn't flinch, but launched itself at Umbert and my brother. Sholto turned, but Umbert was in the way, and he moved too slowly. As my brother bawled his fists, the zombie clawed at the candidate. Its teeth sunk into Dr. Umbert's neck. Sholto grabbed at the creature, hauled it off, threw it to the ground and stamped on its face, all in a scant few seconds as I limped over to Umbert. The doctor had collapsed. Blood bubbled from his neck. I clamped my fingers to the wound. But it was too late. Dr. Umbert was dead. Chapter 17 All at Sea As the Amundsen sailed back to Anglesey, I found an isolated perch on the corner of the helipad. I didn't want to watch the Isle of Man disappear beyond the horizon, nor wait for whales to appear. Instead, I ran wire wool over the sword. The blade had acquired a few more nicks to its edge, though I couldn't remember which creatures had caused them. The weapon would need some work with a sharpening stone, and perhaps a lathe when we got back to the island, and that was work that would have to be done. Whatever came next... It would be a long time before I traded it in for a plowshare. It had taken us an hour and a half to reach Douglas. The first half hour was spent fighting our way through a long, thin line of the undead, all heading towards the burning house. The last half hour was made in company of a group of marines and sailors from the Amundsen. Even then, the trip was made in near silence. Beyond that Umbert was dead, what was there to say? I'd had little more to add when I climbed aboard and spoke to the Admiral. She'd wasted no time, recalled the remainder of her troops, and we pulled anchor while the sun was still low on the horizon. While the Admiral hadn't shared her plans with me, they were clear enough. 
she wanted to return to Anglesey and secure the rest of her crew. No doubt along with as many supplies as they could smuggle aboard before election day. And then? And then I didn't know. Instead, I ran the wire wool over the sword's blade and tried to come to terms with the reality of our new situation. Hey, Kim said. She sat down next to me. It's over, isn't it? Maybe, maybe not, I said. Dead candidates have been elected before. Is that what you're going to do? You'll still run Dr. Umbert in the election? No, I sighed. No, there's no point. Marcus would win anyway. For it to work, Dr. Umbert would have to be popular, his opponent unpopular. In this case, it'll be seen for what it is, me running against Marcus, and thus against the rules I created. No, Umbert can't stand. The least we can do for the dignity of his memory is remove his name from the ballot. It's a shame, Kim said. I was going to like him. Me too, I said. He'd have made a good leader. He... he had his demons. We all do, she said. I think I saw a glimpse of them during the battle, I said. It had something to do with Western Supermare, but now we'll never know. I regret not asking him about them. But if I'm going to regret something, it's that we ever went to the Isle of Man. It was a foolish trip. Like Dr. Umbert said, we don't know what the future holds, and we didn't know what it held before we set out. That doesn't make it any less self-indulgent. In this cold light of a harsh new day, I see that's what it was. Locomotives? Madness. We hardly needed them except as a symbol more potent than a plane landing, and there were plenty of other symbols that we could have found, plenty of other ways we could have achieved the same ends without taking such a monumentally stupid risk. What was I trying to prove? Who was I trying to prove it to? Sholto? That I could run an election fairly, was that it? Or was it like Jackson said, that I was reverting to what I knew, tilting at windmills the only way I knew how? You can't blame yourself, Kim said. I can. But I also blame the Admiral and Sholto if it comes to it. Too many people plotting their own little schemes. We should have planned it together, rather than all acting according to our own best interests, always with the best of intentions, but against our better instincts. Fine, you can blame yourself if you want, but that doesn't change the facts. We're down to two candidates. Marcus and Bishop, two bad candidates, and it's hard to tell which is worse, I said. Whoever wins, humanity will lose, Kim said, except that we know Marcus will win, yes? So the Admiral will leave, Mr. Mills will shut down the power plant before taking his submarine out into deep water, hopefully to sink her. George and Mary will go to Ireland, Francois will go to Paris, Dr. Knight might go with him or she'll join the Admiral. One by one, everyone will scatter. If any survive long enough to see the last of the undead die, they'll create a new nation based on some memory of the old. Ireland, France, the United States. How many generations will it take before there are enough people for one nation to send an army against the other? Except Marcus will attack Elysium first, won't he? I don't think the Admiral will let it get that far, I said. She'll let it get far enough so that history will record that she had no choice. Then she'll destroy Marcus before he can hurt any of her people. We can't stop her? Kim asked. Should we try? If Marcus has half an ounce of sense, he'll know not to send an untrained militia against a professional army. But the Admiral's going to push his hand by shutting down the power plant, Kim said. I know it's Mr. Mills's people who'll do that, but it comes to the same thing. However this plays out, whatever the details, people will die. That means we can't give up, not yet. Not until we've tried everything. I want to know that we have, that you have. Have you? There are two options, then, I said. The first is to let Marcus win, but in such a way as to reduce his power. We've still got all those people standing for cabinet positions. 
will let them run the island. But let Marcus call himself leader. It's possible that's all he wants. You think that could work? They often say that the worst candidates make the best leaders, I said. I've never believed it. Most candidates are people who have spent a good portion of their adult life trying to achieve power. That makes the leaders we usually get the least unpopular of a self-selecting group. But they also say that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's what we're offering Marcus, absolute and total power. Control not just over people, but also over the destiny of our species. Marcus might agree to any terms we set out, but whether he'll hold to them once he's in office and for how long is a very different matter. There's the question of his people, too. Who knows what promises he's privately made to them? Realistically, at best, we'll push the crisis a few months down the road. You said there were two options, she said. Sure, we can kill Marcus. We'll have to kill Bishop as well. Kill them both and in such a way as the death of one implicates the other. Without any candidates, we can't hold an election. The question is whether that's preferable to the alternative. We couldn't do it alone, not the two of us. We'd need help, maybe from the Admiral, maybe from Mr. Mills or Francois. Assuming they went along with it, then how many people would be involved? How many would know that what we created began with murder, what is a life worth? What price do we pay for our species' future? I don't just mean figuratively, but if we get Francois to help us with this, he will ask for something in return. What do we say when he demands half the island's resources so we can reoccupy Paris? If it begins with murder, where would it end? It wouldn't only be Bishop and Marcus, it would be all their hangers-on as well, Kim said. What was it the politicians called it? Collateral damage. Dozens of people murdered without trial or even evidence to suggest they were guilty except by association. At least dozens, I said. I don't know how innocent any of them are, but no, it's not an option. There's still an alternative, Kim said, at least for us. We wash our hands of this whole affair. I wanted to... She stopped, because Lorraine approached. Lorraine sat down heavily on the step next to us. Four hours ago, everything made sense, she said. Okay, maybe not four hours, but yesterday, it all seemed so straightforward. Now, now I don't know. What happens next? We were just talking about that, I said. Can someone else stand in the election? I mean, can I? Lorraine asked. I'd like to say yes. I said, but no, not really. Not unless we could get Marcus and Bishop to agree. Well, that's not going to happen, Lorraine said. So it's over. Marcus is going to win. Probably, I said. I know your brother was planning something, Lorraine said. Lionel knew as well. He wanted to win fairly. He was quite angry about it. He was? I asked. Then I really didn't know the man. I wish I'd had time. He had two faces, Lorraine said. There was the public persona of a psychiatrist, and then there was the lone survivor, the man who'd lost everything but hadn't given up. And now he's dead. What are you two going to do now? Sleep, Kim said. You should come to Menai Bridge, Lorraine said. There's some good people there. Is that where you're going now? Kim asked. I guess, Lorraine said. What's the alternative? Chapter 18 Angels and Devils It's a bad business, George said. Mary said nothing, though her mouth moved as if she was barely holding back the words. I felt duty-bound to come and report in person, but I'd nothing to add to what I'd radioed in. Only Lorraine had come with me to see the old couple, mostly because, without a candidate, she was out of a job and uncertain where else to go. What happens with the election now? Lorraine asked. I could ask you much the same, 
George said. Bill, did you plan for this? For the death of a candidate? No, I said. Then it's over, George asked. I'm going to speak to Marcus, I said, and then to Bishop. He's a candidate too, after all. Maybe we can reach a compromise. I'll see if we can enshrine most of the powers in the cabinet and arrange a new election for some time early next year. Beyond that, I shrugged. I'd already made up my mind, but decided it best not to share it with anyone. A compromise? George asked. Why would Marcus want a compromise? He's won. You've handed him the election first by George, Mary said warningly. What's done is done, and it was done without malicious intent. Go then, Mr. Wright. See what you can salvage. An election was a bad idea, Lorraine said. As we walked down the road leading towards the town, agreed. I said, "A really bad idea," she said. "Hm? You think Marcus will compromise?" she asked. "I think he might say he will," I said. "He might agree to everything I ask, just to ensure as large a victory as possible. Whether he keeps to any agreement after that, I don't know. But you have to try, don't you?" she said. "We all do, right?" We、we'll、have to keep trying, because what's the alternative? That hit too close to home. You're going to Menai Bridge, aye. Later, she said. First, I want to see Captain Devine. Oh, why? You remember those people? The four I saw in the pub. I want to see if she's found out who they were. She really didn't want to give up. For her, that's what returning to Menai Bridge meant. It would be the start of her new life, the same life of farming that awaited us all, and she clearly wasn't ready for it. Maybe you could see if the captain needs a new constable. I said, "We'll need police in this little world of ours." Not me, Lorraine said. No, not for me. If the admiral's leaving, I bet the captain's going with her. I do not want to be the only cop on this island. Then, you know about the admiral's plans. I heard the sailors on the ship talking," Lorraine said. "I bet they didn't stop talking when they came ashore," I said. "Well, if word has reached Marcus, that might make my task easier. I don't suppose it can make it harder," Lorraine said. Lorraine left me at the pub, though within sight of the large crowd gathered outside. There were at least two hundred facing an empty stage. I saw a few familiar faces. Though none I could put a name to, everyone else was a stranger. In some ways, more than anything else, that brought home the significance of Umbert's death and my own failure of the people of Anglesey. I treated the election like a game, almost exactly as I'd have treated a contest a year before. I walked towards the pub, hoping to speak to Marcus before he addressed his supporters, but was still near the back of the crowd when the man appeared. Marcus walked alone onto the stage. There was no introduction, and he didn't give himself one, but simply launched into a speech. Another man is dead. Another life has been lost. Another tragedy has befallen us. This time, it was avoidable. His death was unnecessary. It served no purpose. Yet, what have we lost? Doctor Umbert is irreplaceable. And his knowledge is lost forever. How many of our friends, our families, would have benefited from a trained psychiatrist on this island? I'm sure we all know someone. We only have to remember all those who died by their own hands to know how many more will die for lack of a trained professional to talk to. That is the consequence of Doctor Umbert's death. That is the consequence of every death. We here. We are the only resource that matters. All these expeditions, this adventurism—it is a waste of time and of lives. Each death lessens us and lessens our chance for survival. That is the lesson we must learn from Doctor Umbert's death. At first, I thought that Marcus was ad-libbing his speech, but then I realized he was reading it. One of his close supporters. A bearded man I'd never seen unarmed stood in the front row, discreetly holding up a screen. The words 
probably looked good on paper, but aloud they didn't suit the audience. They were too flowery, with too many inaudible alliterations and indistinguishable homonyms. And I realized the broader implication. Marcus knew about Umbert's death, and with enough time to write out a speech. Lorraine and I had gone straight from the docks to Mary and George, and then I'd come to his pub. There had been time for word of what had happened to reach Marcus, but not for him to write a speech. That meant he knew about Umbert's death before the ship arrived. He had an informer, probably among the Admiral's crew. If he knew about Umbert, then did he, like Lorraine, know about the Admiral's plans? As Marcus continued talking, claiming to have predicted the recent past, I made my way around the back of the crowd towards the rear of the pub. I found Rachel sitting on a broken trestle table, whistling an oddly familiar tune. A book lay open in front of her, which she closed it when she heard me approach. The book looked like an accounts ledger, though there were a number of loose sheets sticking out from it. The corner of one looked like a map. I took that as my opening. Thinking of going somewhere? I asked. Planning me holidays, she said, pushing the loose sheets further into the book. I tried something different. That tune you were whistling, I've heard it before. Was it in that spy thriller that came out last summer? You want to talk about music and movies? She asked. How about we talk about business? I said. How's that going? The election must be good for the pub. It'll be better after Marcus wins, she said. Hickson wouldn't give me the yeast for my brewery. In a few weeks, I'll have it up and running. That's your future, is it? The life of a small business owner selling truly small beer. It's better than the alternative, she said. Isn't that what life is? Finding the best of the possible alternatives? I suppose. I sat on a bench opposite. She shifted uneasily. I got the sense she wanted to be alone, but I thought she might be able to help bridge the gap between Marcus and I. We never talked, I said, after Paul died. No, she said. You're right, we didn't talk. You arrested me. You held me for trial. That was self-defense. Me defending you, in fact, and you arrested me. Not me personally, I said. You know what I mean. Do you know what your problem is? You don't realize that nothing has changed. People only help others when it helps themselves. That's human nature. One group is played off against another. And you know what I say when I see that? I say look for the guy pulling the strings. I wanted to ask more, but there was a cheer from the crowd. Marcus had finished his speech. A moment later, he bounded into sight. When did you— Bartholomew Wright, he said, stopping when he saw me. Behind him came the older bearded man, and two men barely older than Dean. All three looked more like bodyguards than body men. It's a shame what happened to Dr. Umbert, Marcus said. How did you hear? I asked. Oh, why, yeah. Uh, he glanced at Rachel, then behind him. I hear things. That's a bad business. Yes, it was. Dr. Umbert gave his life to save everyone else, I said. He did? Marcus asked. You didn't hear that? Yes, that's how he died. We'll have to get a plaque made, Marcus said. Is that what you came here to tell me? To inform you of his death, yes, I said. And to tell me what you're going to do next? What do you mean? I asked. Oh, come on he said. Your candidate's dead. You're going to say there's some rule we didn't notice, something that means that you can stand or put forward someone else. No. Then you're still running Umbert? No, I said. I don't know if we can spare the ink to reprint the ballot papers, but we're not running a dead candidate. So, what? The election's off? No, it's still on, I said. You're bowing out. Marcus asked, and he seemed genuinely surprised. You're actually conceding defeat. You're not the only candidate left, I said. Ah, so you're trying to decide whether I'm worse than Bishop, he asked. 
clearly determined to find my angle. No, not really. I'm here to decide if you're worthy of leading us. Worthy? That's a quaint idea. What are you actually going to do if you win? I asked. I'd like us to enjoy what we have and to bring back all that we've lost, he said. Sure, who wouldn't? But what are your policies? I always thought a manifesto was a bit of a wish list, he said. None of it ever came to pass. Events always dictated policy, not the other way around. So, if you're going to wish for anything, why not wish for the stars? I looked at the three bodyguards, and then at Rachel, then at Marcus. I wasn't sure if he was being serious, or if he was continuing his act for their benefit. What about food and farming, I asked. Do you see anyone going hungry? Law and order? Where's the disorder? Health care? We've got plenty of doctors. What more do we need? The undead? They're dying. By Christmas this will all be over. What will you do when the food runs out? I asked. What about when we get our first major flu outbreak? When that leads to riots? When it turns out that in February the undead are still as big a threat as ever? Now there's one thing I've learned over this last year, Marcus said. It's that we should eat, drink and be merry, because if we don't die tomorrow, we will all die. After what we've been through, people deserve something more than scrabbling in the fields. Mary O'Leary understands this. That's why she hasn't pushed more people into labouring on the farms. No, if the soldiers want to leave and fight a war against the undead, let them. We have all we need. Let us enjoy it. And then what? What comes next? I asked. You may well win the election, but leading is different from campaigning. I can help. It's not your place to tell me what to do, and it's not mine to tell anyone else. Not now. Not after all that happened. I'll be the angel by your ear, the devil at your back, I said. That's what every politician needs. To keep me honest. <laughs> That's a very kind offer, Mr. Wright. But I've come this far without you. I think I can make it to the finish line. You get some rest. Enjoy your family. Write another journal. Learn to fish or just enjoy this beautiful island. Enjoy this last moment of the sun, Mr. Wright. I almost let him have the last word. Looks cloudy to me, I said, and walked away. He has no plan, I said. In fact, I think he was expecting to lose. He was setting himself up to be the leader of the opposition, not the leader of humanity. Now, when he wins, this is all going to fall apart. The Admiral was right. This man will destroy everything. Probably not intentionally, but through inaction and an inability to govern. He doesn't want your help? Kim asked. Doesn't seem like it, I said. He knew about Dr. Umbert's death, though not the manner of it. Someone told him that. Lorraine knew about the Admiral's plans to leave. Now, I don't know how much Lorraine knew, but she overheard the sailors talking. I imagine that some of the same sailors are keeping Marcus informed. Selling information for beer, you mean? Kim asked. That's a problem for the Admiral, though. True. But what's interesting is that I think Marcus is aware the Admiral is going to leave, but not that so many are planning to go with her. Either his informant doesn't know everything, or they're deliberately keeping some things from him. There's an older chap that's always with him. He's got a very military bearing. I wonder if he's the one getting information from the ship, and if he's the one who'll remove Marcus when the time comes. I don't, Kim said, because it's over, yes? Marcus doesn't want your help, so you can't influence him or tame him once he's in office. I don't think he'd listen. I don't think he knows how bad the food situation is. Maybe he doesn't care. When he's elected, people will die, maybe not immediately, but there will be starvation. There will be disease and no attempt to stop either. There won't even be cake to eat, though there's probably going to be beer to drink. Sure, I can hope that he might rise to the occasion, that he'll become the best possible leader, the one that we need. 
But it isn't just that he's a bad candidate. He's indifferent, not simply unaware of our situation, but unconcerned by it. People will die, and others will leave, and that's the best-case scenario. You've tried, Bill, Kim said. You spoke to him, and he doesn't want your help. You tried, yes? It's time for us to look to our own future. You agree? I looked around our small attic room. It didn't seem like a just prize after all we'd been through. It wasn't much different to the small flat I'd had in London. The only principal difference, other than the lower roof and better view, was that our bags were packed and ready by the door. Not yet. Oh, seriously, Bill, what's left to do? What's left to try? You're not thinking about killing Marcus? No. You can't build a democracy on an assassination. Better we start afresh, somewhere new. But like you said, if we're doing that, if we're going to abandon Anglesey and everyone here, that I want to know that I tried everything. I haven't spoken to Bishop yet. It's possible he's not as bad as everyone says. But everyone says it, Kim said. Sholto, Lorraine, Dr. Umbert. When a psychiatrist describes someone as unhinged, you really should listen. I looked over at the bags. When's the Admiral leaving? I asked. Soon? She wouldn't give me an exact date, not until we told her our plans. But she told Colum and Siobhan to move the children back onto the ship. Bishop's holding a rally tomorrow morning, I said. I'll go and listen, and, well, it's a few more hours, and one last night in a proper bed under a proper roof. Until we get to Elysium, Kim said. Until we get to America, I said. Maybe not even then. We'll see some of the world like you wanted, and when we're sure the undead are finished, we'll find a farm. I smiled, and hoped Kim believed me. My mind was made up. A democracy couldn't be founded on assassination and murder. But the result of this election wasn't going to be democratic. I couldn't leave Lorraine... Heather and all the others to Marcus's scant mercy. I would stay. I had to. A democracy couldn't be founded on an assassination, but they were often founded on revolutions against an unjust ruler. That was what Marcus would become. But that didn't mean we had to accept everything that came next. Marcus could be overthrown once he'd shown his true colours. Someone had to stay behind to organise it, and though there were better candidates for that role, it was my duty. George was right. Going to Ireland had been my way of running away from responsibility. I wouldn't do it again. As a foundation of a new state, a mostly peaceful revolution would be better than a certainly bloody war. It might even be possible to get the power station turned back on. We'd lose a few months, of course, but we'd lose fewer lives, and that was what mattered above all else. Chapter 19 Bishop, the 21st of October, Day 223, Anglesey It wasn't a restful night. The evening before had been spent in gloomy silence, we didn't want to discuss our plans with Annette, but it was obvious she knew that something was wrong. My brother had sat by the window, watching people walk by in the street. When Kim and I came down to make breakfast, he was still there. For the first time since Lenham Hill he seemed old. Or perhaps it was that for the first time he seemed his true age. He was a man contemplating that two-thirds of his life lay behind rather than one still in the height of vigour, looking towards a future yet to come. There's some porridge and some coffee. I packed the tea, he said. On the table next to him were maps. All of them were maps of the U.S. They were an odd assortment of road maps and tourist guides that someone had brought back from holiday, rather than ones that offered any real detail about an area. I made some coffee. You always wanted to return to the States, I said. Not like this, he said. You saw the satellite images before we repositioned them. 
America is the same as Britain. We're going to be taking our problems with us. Except wherever we go, we won't have a power station. We won't find another fuel supply for the ships. It'll be March before we can plant anything. No. You know what? This is exactly how I thought I'd return. A dangerous sea voyage to a land of unknown danger with no known sanctuary. Eh. You know what they say? You can only miss the things that you had, and you only miss them when they're gone. At least we'll be traveling together, that's something. I was glad for the knock at the door. It was Heather Jones. Have you seen Lorraine? She asked. Not since yesterday, I said. After we came back, she was heading to the police station to speak to Captain Devine. After that, she was going to Menai Bridge. I saw her at the police station, Heather said. We, uh, after that, she didn't come home. I've got to go out, I said, but ask Sholto, see if he might know. I left them to it. I would have to speak to Heather later, and to Lorraine. For that matter, I'd have to speak to Sholto and make sure that at least one of the satellites stayed overhead. If I was remaining in Anglesey, it would be useful to be in touch with them. And then I'd have to speak to the Admiral, and to George and Mary, not to mention Kim and Annette. I had a long day ahead. But first, I had to listen to Bishop speak, just so I could tell myself that I had. The sky was cloudy, the air chill, the streets as close to bustling as they ever would be. There were more hats, scarves and long coats around than I'd seen before, and fewer weapons. I imagined a lot of people still carried knives or handguns under their coats. A new normality was beginning to exert itself on the island, as recent customs gave way to an older model of life. People grew sparse, the roads grew worse. No one else seemed to be heading towards Bishop's Rally, and by the time I reached it, it had already begun. The rally was being held in a field with a crude stage at one end. It really did consist of a barn door laid across three trestles with a stack of boxes as steps. It was overly crude, as if someone had gone to great trouble to make it look ramshackle. The crowd were an almost uniform group of around fifty people. They were a little dirtier than those in Hollyhead, and more poorly armed. There were some clubs, some knives, but no firearms that I could see. I stopped by the gate into the field, and got a few suspicious glances from a trio of two men and a woman standing by the stage. They didn't approach me, perhaps because Bishop was already in full flow. He stood on the stage, an open book in his left hand. I don't think he was reading from it, but his free hand would occasionally jab at the page, as if that proved the truth of his words. He was dressed in a suit that had once been white, but which was now smeared with mud. There were no weapons on his belt. The only edge was in his words. The slit was wiped clean, he said with a jab at the open book. Do you know what that means? Do you understand? We say it often enough, that phrase and so many others. We say it so often that we forget the meaning behind the words. There is a slate. He jabbed the book again, and then pointed at the crowd. Each of you carries it around your necks. The slate is invisible to normal eyes, yet it is still there. Our sins are inscribed upon it, and the weight of them bears us down until in old age our backs are bowed with the crimes of the past. In death we are judged. Who here? if you were judged nine months ago, would not have been found wanting. Who here is pure? None of us. None of us here or on this island. We are all sinners, and yet our sins were expunged. The slate was wiped clean when the old world burned. That great conflagration erased the record of our transgressions. We were born anew. This is not paradise. This is not hell. This is a second chance. A second attempt at life for us all. It is a rare gift. And yet you squander it. And so it went on, 
and on, and on. There was no policy, no promises, but plenty of guilt. His inspiration came from a mixture of religions, not learned from books, but from movies. A little Judeo-Christianity, a little Islam, and almost as much Hinduism, all tempered with a fourth-hand interpretation of early Roman theology. It wasn't fire and brimstone, but snow and ice, with the ever-present threat that the flames might return. After five minutes I'd heard enough, but I listened for an hour before I gave the gate a push. It creaked loudly enough to cause Bishop to falter mid-sentence. It was a petty victory, but it was the only one I'd get. The lane was empty as I made my way towards Hollyhead. I was grateful for the distance I had to walk. It would give me time to think. Only fifty people in his crowd, and he's meant to have a few hundred followers, I murmured. He's already losing support. That was something. If Bishop wasn't an alternative to Marcus, nor was he a real threat, he wouldn't be someone for Marcus to rally support against. And that's the ray of sunshine on this overly cloudy day, I said. Those clouds had descended into a fine mist that utterly suited my mood. I turned my attention to the fields, half ploughed into erratic furrows. I was saying goodbye, not to the island because I was more determined to stay than ever, but to all the plans we'd had. They were dreams, fantasies, where I'd thought I'd had the indulgence of being able to choose my own future. The election could be delayed. A crisis at the power plant could push it back a few weeks, but it wouldn't change the candidates, nor alter the outcome. This nightmare would have to be played out to the bitter end, so better it was played out quickly. Marcus would be elected, and he would fall when the food ran out. A popular rising would remove him, and then something better could be put into place. Either it would be the system I should have organized from the beginning, or I would stay completely out of it. That, I decided, might be better for everyone. A methodical squeaking brought me back to the present. A middle-aged woman was laboriously pedaling a heavy bicycle along the road behind me. She didn't look like one of Bishop's followers. Her clothing was too clean, and somehow too bright for that. I raised my hand in greeting as she drew near. She did the same, and almost fell from her bike. Her face was vaguely familiar, but I couldn't place from where. She weaved her way past and towards Hollyhead. Had I seen her in Marcus's pub, or Dr. Knight's clinic, or at Scott Hickson's bakery? I pondered that as I followed the bike towards Hollyhead. I wondered if she, like me, had gone to listen to Bishop speak, though I didn't recall seeing her in the crowd. Another two hundred yards further on, I found her sitting on the road, both hands clutching her ankle. She'd fallen from her bike, which lay a little further on. Are you okay? I asked, hurrying over to her. It's only a graze, she said. It was the chain. It came off. I offered a hand and helped her to her feet and then I went to pick the bike up. The chain was still attached. As I turned around, something bit into my side. There was a moment of excruciating agony, and then nothing but darkness. Chapter 20 The Last Trial The roar ebbed and flowed, slowly fading until it was entirely inside my head. As the sound dropped, nausea replaced it. I sat up on reflex, and as I did, realized I'd been lying down. I tried to move my right hand and found my left hand moved with it. I was handcuffed. Cautiously, awkwardly, I searched around. I was on a floor of chipped concrete covered in a thin layer of dust. I blinked my eyes and felt them move but I still couldn't see anything. For a moment I thought I was blindfolded, but when I raised my hands to my face, I found nothing in front of my eyes. I thought I was blind, but as I moved my head, I caught a faint line of light two meters away. 
Are you awake? A familiar Scottish voice said. Lorraine? I asked. Hey, Bill. Where am I? I don't know, she said. Anglesey, I think. What happened? Is anyone else here? That's just us, she said. Memories returned in a disordered jumble. There was a woman with a broken bicycle, I said. I stopped to help her, then... I don't know. I tried to reach around to my back, but the cuffs stopped me. There was a dull ache running down my body. I think she must have had a stun gun, or maybe she drugged me. No, there was too much pain. I, I'm not sure. Here, Lorraine said. There was a scuffling along the floor as she moved closer. It's water. Drink. I did. Only after I'd swallowed a mouthful did I realize the danger in that. They gave you water? I asked. They've been quite hospitable, Lorraine said bitterly. They even let me out to use the bathroom. There was food, too. I ate it. Sorry, but that was before they brought you in here. When was that? I... I don't know, she said. After you went to see Marcus... I went to speak to Captain Devine. After that, I went to the pub. I was looking for you, but I... Well, I got asked to leave. I was on my way to Menai Bridge when a woman stopped me and asked for directions. Next thing I knew, I was here. Her voice was completely absent of a usually cheery exuberance. This woman, I said, was she middle-aged, hawk-nosed, her hair held back in a tight bun. That's her, Lorraine said. And she's the same one who got me, I said. From the sound of it, you've been here at least a day. Heather came to the house this morning, looking for you. At least, I think it was this morning. The cuffs clinked as I moved a hand to my wrist. My watch is gone. So's mine, Lorraine said. They took everything useful. Not that there's an easy way out. The doors held closed with a bolt on the other side. There's a lip to the door. That means you can't get anything through to slide the bolt back. My weapons were gone. My pockets were empty. They'd left my belt and boot laces, but other than my clothes, that was about it. You said they let you go to the bathroom. What did you see? I asked. Not much. All the windows are boarded up. Like I said... The stores held closed with a bolt. Outside, there are stairs that lead up. I think this room's below ground, but I can't be certain. There's a door marked private, and a corridor with a bathroom. It's a single cubicle marked disabled. There were some other doors off that corridor, but I don't know what's beyond them. Hmm. So there's flushing water? No. A bucket. But the drains work, I asked. I guess. Does that mean something? Not to me, I said, but every little piece of information helps. I wasn't sure that was true, but I was trying to stop my spirits descending into a pit of despair. What about people? How many did you see? Only two. Both men. Big men, too. They're armed. Knives and guns. Right. What else? You saw their faces? Aye, Lorraine said. I've seen enough movies to know what that means. Hmm. What about light? It was mains? No. Torches, hanging on straps from the ceiling. Then this has to be a property to which electricity wasn't restored, I said. So it's not in Hollyhead or Menai Bridge. But still leaves about five thousand buildings it could be, Lorraine said. I think this was a storeroom once, but they've taken out the shelves and the screws that held them to the walls. You can feel the holes. They really did empty everything out. And you know what that means. We're probably not the first people to be held in this cell. Well, that's a cheery thought. Aye, well, I've been in a situation like this before, she said. I know what comes next. I was automatically curious but now wasn't the time. You said the toilet had a disabled sign on it. Do you think this is a pub? 
Maybe. But not a busy one. Not Marcus's. But he's behind this. You think so? Is that a gut instinct? When I went to speak to Captain Devine, that Irish police officer Siobhan was there. So was Heather. We talked about those bodies we found in Bangor, and how I'd seen the victims in Marcus's pub. Anyway, that's why I went looking for you. Well, sort of. Heather and I had a row about the future. I guess... Ugh, I, it doesn't matter. But I wasn't in the best of moods when I left. She gave a bitter laugh. I was looking for trouble when I went to that pub. I had that photograph, the one you brought back from Ireland, that had Lisa Kempton in it. I asked everyone there if they recognised anyone in the picture. And I did it too loudly. That's no wonder they threw me out. I mean, they actually picked me up and carried me outside. About twenty minutes later, I was stopped by that woman. The two events are linked. Okay, probably. So what did you say? What was it that triggered all of this? I told them that people who worked for Kempton had gone through that pub. I said that they'd known about the impending apocalypse and done nothing to stop it. Their people hid in their bunkers until the world had died, and then they came to Anglesey. But did you know? Well, at least one of them did. While we were on the Isle of Man, Heather handed out copies of that photograph around Minai Bridge. A woman there recognised one of the two men in the picture. Which one? The man at the back, staring at Kempton's head. When did this woman see him? I asked. In May. But when isn't so important as where, Lorraine said, and that was in Marcus's pub, where he was helping to sort through stacks of suitcases. Nicola Bellows is her name. She couldn't remember exactly when in May this was. The power station hadn't been turned back on. She remembered that much. Nicola was looking for a pedal-powered sewing machine. She was still living on the boat in which she was rescued. But the couple who'd saved her, who knew how to sail it, had died. Nicola didn't know how to fish, but she knew how to sew. Anyway, that was around the time Marcus was stockpiling whatever he could find from empty houses. Nicola went to ask if they had a sewing machine. That's when she saw this man. She was sure it was him. They talked, Lorraine said. She was certain. She went looking for him a week later. But he wasn't there. That's interesting. So Kempton's people reached Anglesey. Or one of them did. That's not surprising. But I don't see why that should lead to us being abducted. I, uh, I might have said that you found a computer with lots of information on it, Lorraine said. I, uh, I was upset. Ah, so Marcus thinks we have something on him. That's what I think. We're being kept alive so we can find out what we know, and who else knows it. That's as good an explanation as we need, I said. Slowly I eased myself up, with my hands cuffed in front of me, and my head still feeling like cotton wool. It was a chore, but I managed it. I reached above my head, my fingers brushed against rough and flaking plaster. The ceiling was around eight feet high. Are your hands cuffed? I asked. Yes. And I didn't even take them off when I went to the loo. Like I said, I think they've done this before. Hmm. Okay. My hands raised. I walked across the room until I found a wall. The two guards outside, they're armed. Pistols and knives, Lorraine said. Do you recognize them? No. I brushed my hands against the dry, crumbling plaster. I found a few screw holes, but no screws or other handy pieces of metal that could be used to pick the cuffs. Not that I had much experience in that regard, but I had to search. I had to feel like I was doing something. The woman, she must have followed me, I said. I went to hear Bishop speak. I was curious. I thought... I hoped that maybe he wasn't as bad as everyone had made out. I wondered if he might be a potential alternative to Marcus. I reached a corner and continued searching the next wall. 
and then the other two. I confirmed the room was empty, and that the door was sealed fast. There was a length of pipe running along the floor, and we could probably break a section off it, but we'd still be in a dark and locked room. Marcus wanted us alive, that was obvious. Thus it was better to bide our time until we were outside. I sat down on the floor next to Lorraine. What's your favourite food? I asked. My what? Your favourite food. Ice cream, I suppose. Why? Then when either of us says, ice cream, that's when we act, I said. Until then we wait. Not to worry. I've been in worse situations. Aye, me too, she said. Except usually it's zombies on the other side of the door. More than seconds, but less than hours later, the dim light at the bottom of the door grew stronger. A moment after that, a fist banged on metal. Get down! Get back! A man said. Try anything and we'll shoot you. Next to me, I could feel Lorraine tense. We won't, I called out. The door opened. All I could see was light as a torch was shone at us both. I raised my hands to cover my eyes. The sight of my handcuffed wrists must have been what the jailer was looking for. The light was lowered to shine on the ground. Up, both of you, he said, up and outside. I was still blinded, but I heard his footsteps backing out of the doorway. Lorraine and I helped one another up. The jailer was outside, his light pointing at the ground, but another light was pointing at him. It cast odd shadows on his face, but I was sure I didn't recognize him. He was bordering on overweight, though his clothes hung loose. His eyes were beady and close-set, his head shaved at the sides, though long on top. It's a look that's not attractive on anyone, and made him look like he had a dead raven on his skull. He was broad-shouldered and broad-armed, and the revolver in his hand almost looked like a toy. Almost. I'd ask how much Marcus is paying you, I said, but if you haven't realized that money is worthless by now, there wouldn't be much point. Get out, he said. The woman first. I took a step forward. He shone the light straight in my eyes. The woman first, he said, or I'll put a bullet in your good leg. Lorraine stepped forward. As she did, the guard backed away and out of sight. I followed Lorraine out of the door. It was made of metal over an inch thick, and had a bolt that could be held closed by a currently open padlock. The door opened onto a small landing about five feet square that sloped to a dusty drain in the corner furthest from the stairs. The stairs were steep, each riser over a foot tall, but each step only eight inches wide. The jailer was awkwardly walking up them, his revolver waving left and right as his head darted between us and the steps beneath his feet. The gun held by the man at the top of the stairs didn't waver. It was a submachine gun, not an MP5, but looked a little similar. It reminded me of the weapons that police armed response units carried, and I suspected that was where it had originally come from. The man hadn't been a police officer not with a spiderweb tattoo on his throat. He'd even shaved his beard in such a way as to emphasize the pattern. Up, spiderweb said. Watch where you put your feet, Greg. I've got him. His accent was English, as was Greg's. I tried to decide if that meant anything, letting my mind be distracted by theory and observation as I followed Lorraine up the steps. They didn't look military, but perhaps that meant Marcus was keeping the real professionals on watch. So, he's Greg, Lorraine said, as I reached the top of the stairs. Who are you? That way, Spiderweb said, gesturing with his rifle. They're waiting. Greg had taken a step back, as had Spiderweb. The odds of successfully grappling the guns from them were closer to none than slim. Now wasn't the time to fight, but that time would be soon. There were two doors at the top of the landing, one opposite the stairs, the other to the left, 
and that one was open. I stepped through and into a hallway, illuminated by a large flashlight hanging from a strap nailed to the ceiling. There were two doors off that corridor. Both were closed, but both had signs on them. There were small signs, about two inches tall, two feet wide, with black lettering on a brass background. The one to the left read, Laundry Room. The one to the right was marked, Private. Beyond them was the end of the corridor, with another open door and another guard standing in front of it. He held a shotgun, a double-barreled farmer's tool. He stepped aside, but brought his gun to bear. Sit them down, he said. His accent was English, possibly, Somerset. We're ready to start. It was a large room, and if I had to guess at the name it had a year ago, I'd pick dining room. We weren't in a pub and certainly not in Marcus's Inn of Equity. Taken with a sign for a laundry room, I guessed the building had been a bed and breakfast or a small hotel. I glanced at Lorraine. She was looking around with as much interest as me. I hoped she might recognize something that would give a clue as to where on the island we were. Sit, Greg said, directing us to a pair of chairs in the middle of the room. If it had once been a dining room, I wasn't sure what it was now, except that it was mostly empty. Two chairs had been placed in the middle of the room. Against the wall near a pair of swing doors were more chairs, seven in total, and all were occupied. Three men and four women sat watching us. A heavy hand at my back pushed me forward. I sat. So did Lorraine. I looked again at the seven people sitting by the wall. Like in the hallway, light came from torches hung from the ceiling. They swung a little, making the shadows move. Even so, I was sure I didn't recognize any of the people. What are we waiting for? I asked. A fist cuffed the back of my neck. It was painful, but done in such a way as to suggest the man could hit a lot harder if he wanted. Quiet, he said. It all felt wrong. Marcus liked to grandstand. He liked to show off. But this was too much. It involved too many people. The shotgun, the revolver, the submachine gun. Marcus's people were better armed than that. Then the candidate walked in. It wasn't Marcus. It was Bishop. You, I said. Bishop didn't reply. He stopped four paces in front of my chair. Behind me, I sensed the jailer moving closer, ready to grab me if I leaped at the zealot. I heard you speak. I said. Soon all shall hear the triumphant word, Bishop said, and I actually wished Marcus had been the one behind all of this. Are the charges prepared? Bishop asked, addressing his words over our heads. Charges? What charges? I asked. Are we on trial? Nor you are on trial. She is a witness, Bishop snapped. Now quiet. You shall have your chance to speak. Until then, hold your tongue. A witness to what? Lorraine asked. Want me to gag them? Spiderweb asked. Quiet! Bishop screamed. Spittle flew from the side of his mouth. Quiet! This is a solemn occasion. You shall show respect for the book, all of you. The room went still. I was tempted to break the silence just for the sake of defiance, but thought it better to wait until I knew precisely what I was defying. The charges! Bishop barked. M murder A woman stammered. She stood behind me. I craned around, causing the chair to creak. One of the jailers pushed me back to face the front, but I'd seen the woman's face. It was the same middle-aged woman who'd had the broken bicycle. That, I decided, was good. It suggested that Bishop had a limited number of followers he could trust for this particular piece of theatrics. Murder and, Bishop prompted, and genocide, the woman said. And, Bishop asked, and the planned destruction of all promise and purpose of, of, she stammered, as if she'd forgotten her lines, of 
plotting to bring ruin to all that is good. And what does that mean? I asked. Silence, Bishop said, his voice low now, almost calm. You shall have your chance to speak. Everyone does. Everyone? I almost asked it out loud, but there was something in the man's tone, a triumphant glee that told me I'd know soon enough. Do we have the evidence? Bishop prompted. His own words, the woman said, confidence blossoming in her voice. She stepped forward, holding something out to the seven people sat at the side of the room. His own words, written and printed, distributed across the island. All lies! Bishop interrupted, clearly unable to contain himself. But even in the greatest of falsehoods, the serpent cannot hide the truth. And, he added, the other evidence, his deeds and this woman's actions, this woman's words, she said, pointing at Lorraine. Hang on, I said, deciding I'd stayed silent long enough. If this is a trial, shouldn't the procedures be established first? Who's the prosecutor? Who's the defense? I take it you're the judge, but from where do you derive your authority? It is not I who sit in judgment, Bishop said. It is these seven, for seven shall sit, and seven shall judge, and seven shall stand before the gate. If that's from your book, it's one I've never read, I said. There! Bishop exclaimed, almost with glee, from his very own lips, the denial of the truth that I told you he would make. Now I really was lost, but I knew enough not to bother trying to reason with him, so I addressed the seven jurors in a bid to gain time. This isn't the first time that someone's tried to hold me responsible for the evacuation, I said. It's in the evidence there. I suggest you read it in full before this trial continues. This isn't about the evacuation, Bishop said. That was the walk unto judgment, where so many were found wanting. In that, you were the instrument of divine grace, yet it is not enough to cleanse you of the evil of your past sins. We shall judge you as we judge the others. We shall root out all the agents of evil. What evil? Lorraine asked. What did he do? Thus does the snake hide in plain sight, his sins unknown to those who come to his aid, Bishop said. Though there were a few nods from his jury, I couldn't tell if he was quoting from his book or making it up as he went along. I'll say this for the madman. He knew how to play to his crowd. He's a murderer, Bishop continued. A cold-blooded killer. Who, who did I kill? I asked. Who did I murder? Bishop smiled. Did I not foretell it? Did I not say that he would kill those who went with him? He wasn't speaking to me. Who are you talking about? Do you mean Dr. Umbert on the Isle of Man? I mean Ireland, Bishop said. Wait, are you talking about Rob? He was the last, Bishop said, but he wasn't the first. Wright, Kempton, Quigley, Masterton, they are the names we knew. Now we know more. We root them out. O'Brien, Garvey, McAllister, Locke. Locke? As in Sorica Locke, I asked unable to stop myself. You see? He knows, Bishop crowed with delight. By his very own words, he has condemned himself. I wished I hadn't interrupted. Not because it apparently confirmed my guilt in this macabre travesty, but because I might have learned some of the other names of the so-called accused. Clearly, Bishop had memorized them. You've not told me precisely what I'm accused of, I said. Who are these other people? What did they do? In one breath he admits his guilt, but the next he pleads innocence, Bishop said. Does it not say that the serpent shall try to walk back his words? If that's a quote from your book, Lorraine said, then I doubt the ink is even dry. Silence! Bishop screamed. Though you may have been an unwitting accomplice, you are his accomplice nonetheless. Your guilt can be judged here, too. What does it matter? Lorraine asked. You're going to kill me anyway. Kill? Kill? Bishop crowed. We do not kill. 
We're not like you. We are the chosen, the selectors, the future. We are the path yet to be walked. Your path is very different. The guilty are released into the wilderness, there to suffer the trials and tribulation of our tormented world. Those who prove themselves worthy find their way back to salvation. Is that what happened to Locke and the others? I asked. You released them into the wasteland. You let them go in Wales, right? Bishop faltered. He seemed uncertain. The evidence! He barked at the woman. Read the confessions of the guilty. Yes, since you seem so concerned with their feet, you shall hear their own words. Before the woman could begin, the swing doors opened. A younger man hurried in and ran straight over to Bishop. Before the door shut, I saw the steel countertops of a kitchen, though there was no sign of food being prepared. I couldn't hear what the young man said to Bishop, but the man's expression darkened. Take them back to their cell. We shall reconvene later, Bishop said. He stalked to the kitchen. The young man hurried after him, as did the woman who presented the evidence, and then the seven jurors. Up, the guard with a spiderweb tattoo said. Get up! I stood, stretched, and took my time about it, turning slowly around, gauging our chances. They weren't great. The man with a shotgun was by the door, both barrels pointing our way. But the other two guards would be caught in the blast probably didn't worry him. I was more concerned by the submachine gun pointing at my chest and the revolver pointing at Lorraine's head. Lead the way, I said. Oh, no, he said. You first. Chapter 21 Gunshots Within two minutes, and without an obvious chance to escape, we were back in our dark cell. I stayed by the door, watching the line of light at the bottom slowly fade as footsteps retreated upstairs. Soon, all was quiet. What was that about? Lorraine asked. Bishop's mad, I said. I know that, Lorraine said. So does everyone else except you, apparently. I mean, there's no point trying to read too much into it. The voices in his head are speaking too loudly for us to be heard. Now you're talking like him, she said. I meant those questions you were asking about Sarah Halak. She was one of the people in that photograph, wasn't she? One of Kempton's followers. I was asking around about a man in that photograph, and then I was kidnapped. Not Sholto, not Kim, me. That's why, isn't it? It's that photograph. That man I was asking about has to be one of the people that Bishop mentioned. Probably. Sarah Halak, she's important? Lorraine asked. Didn't I tell you? We found a note in Kempton's mansion, Elysium. It mentioned Locke as being Kempton's right hand in Ireland. Kim and I were sort of tracking the woman across Ireland, though six months after the fact... We know Locke made it to the ship on the Shannon Estuary, and from there to Belfast. At first I thought the woman who shot Callie was Locke, it wasn't. Locke was in Belfast. I thought she'd died, but if she'd survived that long, then why not long enough to get to Anglesey? If she found a boat and made it out to sea, perhaps she got picked up. And she arrived on Anglesey with that man I was looking for, and maybe with some others. Maybe. I said, who knows? It hardly matters, she's dead now. They all are. But Bishop said that they let them go, that they were released to the mainland. Right, but remember the corpse at Bangor University? That's what letting them go means. Whatever Bishop's orders, the guilty are killed. Wouldn't that be going against Bishop's wishes? Yes, but not against whoever is really pulling the strings, I said. Bishop didn't come up with this idea on his own. He certainly didn't decide to run as a candidate without someone else suggesting it. Let's not forget where you were when you were asking those questions. No. I think I can put a name to who's behind this, but I'm more interested in the names of the people that they put on trial. You mean Kempton's people? No. At best a handful made it out of Belfast. More likely it was only two of them. 
I meant the others. All of those people who disappeared from the island. We thought they'd taken their boats and simply sailed away. I wonder if that's true. Then there are Bishop's followers. Sholto told me they were claiming rations for two hundred, but that they said they had five hundred supporters on Willow Farm and the food to feed them. At Bishop's rally I counted fifty. Where are the others? I think that they're dead, and while there's no rational reason for Bishop to have killed them, I do wonder about that food. What is money but a representation of what we need? What do people need but food? And what are they prepared to do in exchange for it? Anyway, we can work out all of that after we work out where we are and how we're going to escape. Did you see anything you recognized? Outside of Menai Bridge and Hollyhead, I don't think there's anywhere on the island I'd recognize, she said. But it's a hotel, isn't it? Probably a small one. Or a large guest house, I said. There are a... She stopped. Did you hear that? I was about to say no, but then I heard it. Gunfire. Unsilenced, I said, grinning. That's Bishop's people returning fire. Sholto's come. Heather too, no doubt. And they brought the Marines. Best to step back from the door. The muffled roar grew sporadic. After a few minutes, it stopped completely. About time, I said. I could do with a decent meal and a wash. And then we'll get to the bottom of this. I'll tell you one good thing. I think we can now officially declare the election null and void. Aye, maybe, Lorraine said. We waited for the sound of boots running down the stairs. We kept waiting. No one came. Perhaps they don't know where we are, I said. I kicked the door. Lorraine did the same. We kicked and slapped, shouted and yelled. The light at the bottom of the door grew stronger as footsteps slowly descended the stairs. What? A voice called. It was Greg. My heart sank. Our jailer wasn't busy forlornly fighting the Marines. Whatever the cause of the gunfire, it wasn't our rescue. Still, we had got his attention. I, uh, I stammered, uncertain what to say. He wants to use the bathroom, Lorraine said. So? Greg replied. So, I thought it was a witness, not a suspect, Lorraine said. I shouldn't be expected to stay down here if you're going to let him turn it into a cesspit. He wants the toilet. Greg called out. He wasn't talking to us. Does he? The muffled voice of Spiderweb replied. Take him outside. Step back, Greg said. I didn't like the sound of being taken outside and found myself looking in Lorraine's direction. The time to act was approaching. I hoped I recognized it before it was too late. Stand back, Greg called again, as the bolt ground in its fitment. He pushed the door inward. The light came in first, brighter than day and blinding. Involuntarily, I stepped backwards, raising my hands to shield my face. Outside! Greg barked. Move! Squinting against the glare, I took a step forward. Greg took one back, but his gun was raised, not pointing at me, but at Lorraine. That was why they had kept us together where I might throw my own life away on a suicidal attack, I was less likely to sacrifice hers. Careful, Greg said softly. Slowly, don't make me do it. I walked outside and passed him. Spiderweb was at the top of the stairs. His submachine gun was pointing straight down at us both. There was something about his expression that told me he wouldn't hesitate gunning down his comrade. Greg pressed his revolver into the small of my back. Go on, up, he said. I climbed the stairs, not looking around, as I heard the cell door clang closed. Spiderweb stepped back from the top of the stairs as I climbed, staying beyond a grabbing arm's reach. What was the shooting? I asked. Were those executions? Executions? Spiderweb replied. Unlike you, we're not killers. And you won't shoot me if I run? I asked. If you run, it'll save us the bother of the trial, Greg said. You'll be doing all of us a favour. 
That way. It ain't locked. He gestured towards the other door, the one that didn't lead to the dining hall courtroom. I opened the door. It was one of those rural changing rooms where outdoor clothing could be removed. Another torch hung from the ceiling. Benches lined one wall, a coat rack the other. A heavy boot scraper was by the room's other door. It was a one-foot-long, six-inch-wide, unsharpened blade of wrought iron. If I could get Greg close enough to fall over and onto it— I half turned round, but he was ten feet away. He gestured at the other door. Go on, he said. Open it. I did. Outside, it was daytime and seemed brighter than any midday I'd ever witnessed. As my eyes adjusted, I saw the clouds blanketing the sky. It could be an hour after dawn, an hour before dusk, I couldn't tell. Then I lowered my head and looked straight ahead. I stopped caring about the time. A few dozen yards from the building were a trio of static caravans. Truly mobile homes had been dragged into the larger gaps between them, with a mass of chicken and razor wire completing the barrier. Beyond were the undead. You still want to run? Greg asked. Where are we? I asked, because I seriously doubted it was Anglesey. It ain't Kansas, Greg said. It had to be North Wales, near Anglesey and near the coast, precisely where I wasn't sure, though the site didn't look like the one near Carnarfon, in which I'd first met Marcus. You were shooting the undead? I asked. You know how it is, Greg said. I took a more careful look at the ground beyond the barbed wire. I could only see four of the creatures, two of which had snagged themselves on razor wire. There would be more of them out there. Dozens. Hundreds. It didn't matter, because another thing had occurred to me. Greg wasn't speaking like Bishop. Nor had he or Spiderweb done so during that mockery of a trial. Unlike the woman who'd stunned Lorraine and I, and who'd been presenting the evidence, he wasn't a believer. I picked my words with care. Did you know Paul well? You're full of questions, aren't you? Greg said. What you need to consider is that if you get released into the wasteland, the zombies will tear you apart. Your only hope is telling Bishop everything, absolutely everything. Otherwise you and that girl will be dead before dusk. You said you wanted the loo. Pick a wall. I didn't need to go but I made a show of it, using the opportunity to get a better look at the building. I was hoping for a sign, not the serendipitous kind, but a name that Lorraine might recognize or a clue as to how far away the sea was. I couldn't smell the salt, but then all I could smell was the unwashed aroma of too many people gathered in too small a space without adequate soap. I can't, I said. Never could when people were watching. I gestured at the undead. Funny, Greg said. Back inside. Have you been here long, then? I asked, looking around for an absently discarded shovel or axe. There were none. Long enough. Now get inside, he said. I had no choice but to comply. I walked slowly, trying to think of an alternative but there was only one course open to me, to us. Whatever Bishop might think of a walk in the wasteland, Greg would make sure it ended with a bullet. I went through the door to the changing room first, and made a point of cleaning my shoes. Greg kept his distance. I would have to wait until we reached the stairs. Then I'd push Greg down while wrestling Spiderweb's gun from him. The man was far larger than me, and I didn't fancy my chances, but I wasn't sure I'd get a better one. Move! Greg barked. I did, heading back through the door, towards the cell. Spiderweb was gone from the top of the stairs. Down you go, Greg said. Think about what you've seen. When Bishop calls you back, answer his questions honestly. If you want your friend to live, Make yourself useful to us. 
I knew that would make no difference to our fate. I began descending the stairs. You know, there's something you haven't considered, I said, something Bishop hasn't thought through. I half turned round, and as I did, deliberately missed the next step. I fell into a crouch, my left knee on a step, my right foot on the step below, my hands in front, my head down. I groaned. Get up! Greg barked. I heard him descend towards me. I reared up and grabbed his right ankle with both of my cuffed hands. I pulled. He slipped, letting go of his torch, but he kept hold of his revolver. As he fell, he managed to pull the trigger. The gun went off, but the bullet went high. His back slammed into the stairs. I grabbed his legs and pulled myself up him, pulling him down in the process. I had hoped that he'd tumble over my head, down the stairs, breaking his neck in the process. Instead, I pulled and grappled, desperately trying to prevent him from bringing his revolver to bear. I was almost too late. He got the barrel almost in front of him as I grabbed it with both of my cuffed hands. I pushed the barrel down as he pulled the trigger. The shot was muffled by our bodies, but his face was inches from mine. I saw his expression change from anger to confusion. I felt his grip loosen on the gun and snatched the weapon from him, almost slipping on the stairs as I pulled myself to my feet. There was a growing red stain across his stomach. Slowly, still looking bewildered, he lowered his hand to the wound. He opened his mouth, perhaps to scream, but only blood bubbled out of his lips. The bullet must have passed through and ricocheted back into his chest. That was the theory I came up with as I watched him cough, heave, shudder, and die. Remembering Lorraine, and that Spiderweb could return at any moment, brought me back to the present. I stumbled up to Greg's corpse, fished through his pockets until I found a bundle of keys, and practically threw myself down the stairs fumbling with one key after another until I found one that fit the padlock, I wrenched the door open. The cell was empty. The rain, I whispered, though there was enough light from Greg's dropped torch to be sure that she wasn't there. I grabbed the light and headed up the stairs. Easing past Greg's corpse, I tried to not look in the man's eyes. It wasn't the first time I killed someone but it didn't get easier. At the top of the stairs, I crouched, sorted through the keys, and found one for the handcuffs. As I undid one wrist and then the other, I told myself to think. The only thought that came to mind was that Spiderweb and Lorraine were both missing. There was only one direction to search, that which led to the dining hall. I doubted he'd taken her there but there were the two doors in the corridor leading off it, the one marked private and the other to the laundry room. With no mains electricity, it was easier to guess where he'd gone. I managed one step before I saw a shadow in the doorway. I barely leveled the pistol before I saw that it was Lorraine. She had the submachine gun in her handcuffed hands, a knife in her belt, and blood covering her almost from head to toe. None of it's mine, she said simply. Spiderweb? Aye. Where's Greg? I gestured at the stairs. Dead. You have the keys? I hurried over to her. We're not on Anglesey, I said, as I undid her cuffs. Must be North Wales. It's a caravan site ringed by barbed wire. There are zombies out there. We'll get outside, find the sea, Follow the coast to Menai Bridge. We can't be far. Did you... The doors to the dining hall swung open. A figure ran through. It was the man with the shotgun. Lorraine moved quicker than either him or me. While he was still bringing his weapon to bear, she swung the submachine gun around and opened fire. A dozen rounds hit the man before he fell lifeless to the floor. So much for a quiet getaway, I said, running to his corpse. I grabbed the blood-covered shotgun and a handful of cartridges from the man's pockets. They'll have heard your gunshot, Lorraine said. I did. That's when I... She trailed off. The gun's barrel dropped a few inches, before rising again, pointing 
unwaveringly at the doors. We get outside, we get away, I said. We headed back down the corridor. We'd almost come level with the stairs to the basement when a bullet whistled through the air, thumping into the plasterwork an inch from my head. I swung around, leveled the shotgun, and pulled the trigger. A cloud of buckshot swept along the corridor as I emptied both barrels at whoever had fired. The swinging torches hanging from the ceiling cast weird shadows, making it hard to see the shooter. But I heard screaming as the pellets hit. Bill! Lorraine prompted. I followed her into the changing room and pushed the door closed. Read Lord, Lorraine said. What? Oh, yes. I broke the gun open. A bullet thumped into the door's thick timbers. Another bullet followed, and this one passed straight through, hitting the wall on the room's far side. Outside, I said. We have to get outside and away from here before they come around the side of the building. Ready? Ready. She opened the door and stuck her head outside. Looks okay. There was another gunshot, another bullet passed through the door. I limped outside, pushing Lorraine in front. With our backs flush against the exterior wall, we blinked in the daylight as someone emptied a magazine into the room we'd just left. Zombies, Lorraine said, her eyes adjusting faster than mine. They were gathering by the wire near the caravans, and there were more than four. Behind us came the sound of wood splintering. I swung the shotgun around the side of the door and fired. This time, there was no screaming, nor was there any return fire. They're going to circle around us, I said. You see that caravan? The one with the blue door? The front's this side of the wire, the rear of it's outside. That's how we get out. Which? Oh, got it. Go. We ran. I kept my eyes on the target, not thinking about the guns that might be aimed at my back. The caravan was small, the front half mostly white, the rear mostly blue, parked end-on in a large gap between two static caravans. The wide rear window was outside the barbed wire. If we got inside, we'd just have to break the window and clamber out. Then we'd only have the undead to worry about. Before we reached it, I saw the obvious floor. There were too many zombies out there. I stopped counting at a dozen. We'll have to find a gate, I said. This is the gate, Lorraine said, or it's one of them, look. There were wooden wedges either side of the wheels, and deep ruts showing where they'd been pulled out of the way and pushed back into place. The front prop had an odd assortment of leather straps that could be attached to a harness. Before I could work out how the barbed wire was detached from the static caravan a few feet to the right, a bullet smacked into the mobile home's metal frame. Lorraine grabbed the nearest wedge and dragged it free. We don't have time, I said. We can't fight the undead. No, we let them in, Lorraine said. Let the zombies in and let Bishop's people fight them. Then we escape. Another bullet hit metal. I ducked and looked towards the house. I couldn't see the shooter. I grabbed the other wedge and tossed it away. The undead were gathering beyond the wire. Some were already caught in its barbed strands as they struggled to reach us. Others pushed and beat against the caravan's frame. It rocked as Lorraine and I ran around to the other side. Another shot came from the house, shattering a window in the static caravan next door. They're not good shots, I said. A stray can kill as well as an aimed shot, Lorraine said, as she dragged the wedge free. Heather taught me that. The caravan rocked forward, then back. One of the zombies lost its footing and fell into the mud. Others pushed their way into the gap, trampling the creature before slamming into the caravan. It rolled forward a foot. The wire grew taut. I looked at the house. I saw the shooter in the first-floor window of the house. I raised the shotgun. The figure ducked without firing a shot. Come on! I yelled at the zombies, only a mass of razor wire away. Come on, push! The caravan rolled forward another foot. The figure reappeared in the window. I raised the shotgun again. This time, the figure didn't disappear. There was a shot, and then the sound of metal tearing, and it was close. 
Lorraine raised the submachine gun and fired three shots. A puff of brick dust plumed an inch from the window's frame. The figure ducked out of sight. The caravan slowly inched forward. The wire grew taut. There, Lorraine yelled. She pointed, though I wasn't sure at what. But followed her, she ran back into the campsite. As I did, I got a better feel for the house where we'd been held prisoner. It was a house, not a mansion or a hotel. It was just an ordinary country house around which the campsite had grown. They'd added an extension, easily identifiable as the kitchens from the extractor fans on the low roof. I thought I could make out the edge of a conservatory on the far side. On this side of the building were static caravans. Visible on a hill beyond the wall of barbed wire was a cluster of wooden cabins. Between us and them was a row of trees, and about fifty of the undead slowly slouching our way. There was a metallic snap behind us, followed by a creak. The caravan toppled forward onto the tow bar as the smaller front wheel collapsed. In doing so, it ripped away the upper two thirds of the razor wire, leaving a gap large enough for the undead to tumble through. A barrage of shots came from our left, not from the house, but from around its side. I swung the shotgun around and fired, hoping to scare the shooter with a sound more than in expectation I'd hit them. Then I dived forward, following Lorraine into the cover of a three-foot-high brick wall that ringed a trio of bare-branched trees. I paused to catch my breath. Chapter Twenty-Two: Hard Rocks and Harder Places. But I only got a second's breather before another barrage of bullets hit the low wall. You're right, Lorraine said. They cannot shoot. How much ammo do you have? I asked. She ejected the magazine. One bullet and one spare magazine. You? Five cartridges for the shotgun and five in the revolver. I double-checked. Four in the revolver. Bullets smacked into brick and the bark of the three trees. The undead were pushing their way through the gap between the caravans. From that angle, it was hard to be sure, but it looked like they were heading towards us. I think we've got a minute before the zombies reach us, I said. Do you have any bright ideas? Lorraine said. Not really. I said, I'll draw their fire. You try to shoot them before they get me. There was a shout, a shot, but it didn't come from the side of the house. It came from the door out of which we'd exited. Knowing that the twin barrels of a shotgun weren't waiting outside, Bishop's people had entered the changing room. Two of them stood in the doorway. Before, I'd only seen their faces in shadow and now they were partially obscured by the weapons they inexpertly held. But I think they were two of the jurors. A bald man held a hunting rifle. A woman with auburn hair hacked into a pageboy cut carried a submachine gun. I saw them shoot. I saw the man stagger backward at the unfamiliar kick of the hunting rifle. I saw the barrel of the submachine gun arc upwards and the recoil of a magazine emptied on fully automatic. With the undead near us blocking from view those closer to the house, I couldn't tell if any of the shots hit. Above them, more measured gunfire came from the first floor window, but none of those bullets were aimed at us. As the sound of gunfire filled the countryside, the thin lurching line of the undead shuddered and shifted and turned towards the noise. I couldn't believe our luck, but it was almost complete. Another bullet fired from the side of the house, hit the low brick wall, but only one of the undead was still heading towards Lorraine and me. Move your arm, Lorraine said. I can shoot that zombie. No, don't. The others will hear the shots, I said. With the increasing volume of fire from the house, it was possible that they wouldn't. I didn't want to risk it. It's getting closer, Bill, Lorraine said. Don't worry, I said. I've got it. As if to belie my bravado, another solitary bullet hit the wall. The zombie was ten feet away. I rolled onto my side, bringing my knees up while keeping my head below the wall. It was an easy target for the zombie. I'd only get one chance. 
but the undead were a foe I knew how to beat. Eight feet. Six. Its mouth snapped up and down, its jacket hung in ragged strands where it had ripped on the barbed wire. As it clawed at the air between us, the tattered threads from its ripped jacket flapped almost in time with its snapping mouth. Five feet, and it lurched forward as I speared the shotgun at its left knee. The twin barrels connected with a dull crack. The zombie kept moving, momentum turning its lurch into a spinning, thrashing fall. It landed on its back, its head a foot from me, its mouth still snapped as its arms reached up and its legs beat against the ground. I already had the shotgun above my head, one hand around the trigger guard, the other clutching the barrels. I brought the weapon down, slamming the stock into the creature's skull. There was a dull thwack as wood met bone. For a moment, its mouth stopped moving. I brought the shotgun up and down a second time. This time, I heard a crack. The zombie's arms and legs thrashed more violently, as if it was trying to get out of the way. As its clawed hand caught around the hem of my jacket, I raised the shotgun up for a third time. Lorraine's hand appeared, stabbing the knife she'd taken from Spiderweb into the creature's eye socket. She leaned forward, putting her weight into it, sinking the blade deep into the zombie's brain. Its thrashing ceased. Done, Lorraine said. I think he stopped shooting at us. Cautiously, I eased myself up and over the oozing corpse. I could make out the shadow of the shooter, and a submachine gun's barrel propped against the side of the house. I couldn't make out the figure's features, but I saw the shot aimed at the long line of the undead slowly drifting towards the changing room door. The two jurors in that room were now hidden by the lurching pack, but I could hear them shooting. A few of the undead shook and shuddered as bullets hit them, but I didn't see any of the undead collapse. About fifty had made it inside the broken barricade, with more scrumming and shoving their way through the gap between the caravans. None were heading towards us, at least not right then. It's time to move, I said. We need to find another way out of the campsite. That must be inland, Lorraine said, gesturing towards the wooden chalets on the hill from where the undead came. The sea will be in the other direction, and they brought us here by boat, right? Find the sea, find the boat, find our way back to Menai Bridge. I eased myself up and peered over the wall. Two of the zombies had detached themselves from the main group and were heading towards the shooter at the side of the house. As I watched, I saw the figure fire a short burst. The bullets went low, almost at waist height. One of the zombies crumpled, the other shuddered, but kept moving forward. There was another shot. From a range of ten feet the bullet found its target. The zombie collapsed, and the figure by the house ran. I think it's now or never, I said. Count to five, then we run. Ready? Okay, Lorraine said. One, two. I pushed myself up and limped as fast as I could towards the house. No shots came, at least not towards me. Gunfire still came from the house, aimed at the growing number of the undead, but it was increasingly sporadic. I didn't turn to look, but kept my eyes alternating between the building and the crawling zombie. I'd have liked to stop and kill it but I didn't want to make myself too easy a target for Bishop's people. Giving the creature a wide berth, I limped on and was overtaken by Lorraine just as we reached the house's wall. A litter of spent cartridges and discarded magazines told us where the shooter had been. You didn't wait until five, she said. I was never good at counting, I said. Those are nine-millimeter casings, she said. Oh, I wasn't really listening. I'd been so focused on the hail of bullets and the approaching undead that while we were in cover, I'd not taken in what lay beyond the house. Adjacent to the building's side wall was a square of lawn slightly lower than the surrounding area, ringed by a narrow ditch and faced by a line of wooden benches. It had probably been a bowl's pitch, though it was now flooded, covered in a thin layer of leaves and lilies. Beyond that, was a row of concrete barbecues, 
a cluster of trestle tables, and sun-faded recycling bins that stretched down to a narrow road that led from the house into the main site. I'd thought that the campsite consisted mainly of the chalets on the hill and the static caravans near the house, but that was only a fraction of the accommodation available. Below us, sloping down to a still invisible sea, were the roofs of hundreds of static caravans, more wooden chalets, and at least two dozen mobile homes. I cannot see any signs, Lorraine said. Do you think they put barbed wire around the entire caravan site? Maybe, but it wasn't Bishop's people, I said. It was done by whoever drove those vehicles here. On the road that ran up to the house was a line of cars. Grime covered the windows, and half of the tires were flat, but they were close enough together that they'd been parked, not simply abandoned. Probably one of his people made it here with a group of others. They built the barricades before they learned there were people on Anglesey. That's how they knew of this place. Even as I said it, I knew there was something wrong with that theory, something that kicked to the edge of memory. There was a loud burst of gunfire from near the changing room. Time to run, and keep running, Lorraine said. I didn't disagree, though we walked along the wall of the house, ducking low as we eased under a boarded-up window. We were ten feet from the end of the wall, with the front of the property more clearly in view, when a figure ran around the side of the building. It was a woman, another one of the jurors, and she held a submachine gun in her hands. I swung the shotgun around as she tried to bring it to bear. I fired. The pellets from two cartridges ripped into her, almost tearing her apart. The cars, Lorraine said, as she ran to the twitching corpse and searched it for ammo. I'd turned my attention to the front of the house. The door was ajar, but there was no sign of anyone else. Bell, the cars! The two at the front! I turned to look. Unlike the rest, the two front vehicles had clean windows, and the tires, at least those I could see, were properly inflated. Between us and them was a concrete blockhouse with a thick wooden door held closed with a new padlock. The roof was of red tile in a faux colonial style the stonework matching the silent fountain in front of the house. There was a gasp from behind us. The zombie that Bishop's guard had shot in the legs had kept crawling after us. Now it was ten feet away. I ran back to it. Gripping the shotgun by the barrel, I slammed the wooden stock down onto its skull. Once. Twice. There was a snap of bone, and a softer crack of wood as the gun's stock fractured. Go! I said to Lorraine. We ran to the concrete blockhouse. I paused to check the lock and quickly hammer on the door. I heard nothing. I slammed the butt of the shotgun into the lock. The wooden stock which had cracked when I'd used it as a club on that prone zombie splintered. The weapon was useless, so I rammed the barrel between the lock and bolt and levered until the fitting came free. There was no prisoner inside. Only five jerry cans. I picked up the nearest. It was a quarter full. I recognize those, Lorraine said. Those containers came from a garage near Menai Bridge. They're the ones Heather left up and down the coast for people who followed the maps left in the safe houses. We thought they'd all been used up the last time we... A fountain of paint sprayed from thick concrete wall. I swung around. As I dragged the revolver free... There was a figure in the doorway of the house, the middle-aged woman who'd stunned me. She had a hunting rifle in her hands and was fumbling with a bolt. Lorraine raised the submachine gun and fired a single shot. The woman disappeared, though I don't think Lorraine had hit her. Still carrying the fuel can, we ran around the blockhouse and towards the two clean cars. They were planning to escape, Lorraine said. Look at the stuff in the back. The car's rear was filled with bags. Do you have any matches? I asked. No. I smashed the rear window and grabbed a bag just as another shot came from the house. The bullet hit the car behind me. I ignored it, emptying the bag on the ground. It only contained clothes. Another shot came from the house. This one hit glass. Ignoring poorly aimed shots, I searched the bags, dumping their contents on the ground. 
Underneath one, I saw a tire iron. I grabbed it, though it wasn't what I was looking for. Why two cars? Why only two? Where did they think they'd go? I said, as I tore open another bag. What are you looking for? Lorraine asked, firing a shot at the house. I'm mindful of Rob, I said. He thought we were setting him up to die, and I'm sure he had a plan of escape. Or he thought he did. Then there's that boat they used to get over here from Anglesey. Someone planned to flee here. And right now I'm more interested in where they're going than who they are. Can we drive away? Lorraine asked. No, no keys. Can you see any keys? Another shot came from the house. This bullet hit the car's side window, but I'd found what I was looking for, a bag that contained a camping stove, saucepans, and a tin of rainproof matches. No keys, I said, finally ducking down behind the car. I tore a strip from my coat and ripped the top off the plastic fuel can. Besides, where would we drive? No, what I want is someone to answer some questions and some time to search the house. But we can't take the risk. There was another shot from the house. The front windscreen shattered. Even then, I hesitated. Objectively, the result of what I planned was no different to shooting these people, yet it felt different. But they had two cars ready to aid in escape. Some of them, probably those who didn't subscribe to Bishop's new religion, had prepared a way out, and so must have a destination in mind. They couldn't be allowed to reach it. They couldn't be allowed to live and so remain a threat to our future. No, we can't take the risk. I struck a match and lit the rag. Cover me. Tire iron in one hand, jerry can in the other, I limped across the open ground towards the house. I heard Lorraine fire, then I heard a scream from inside and realized the gunfire from the rear of the house had slackened. The undead had reached the building. It didn't matter. A bullet whistled past my head. I held the fuel can with its burning rag towards the house. The container hit the wall. The burning rag fell out, but the can fell close to it. The vapor caught. It wasn't quite the inferno I'd wanted, but it would have to do. Another bullet sung through the air, too close for comfort. Lorraine returned fire, and I turned around, running back to the cars. By the time I was in cover, the fire had spread to the wooden boards covering the nearest windows. Do we wait? Lorraine asked. I don't know, I said. Just then, I noticed the zombies at the side of the house. When the gunfire from inside had stopped, the creatures had begun drifting away from the changing room door. There were three making their slow way towards the line of cars. No, we don't wait. We get out of here and get back to Anglesey. Leaving the house to burn, and its occupants to the undead, we ran. Chapter 23 The Steep Stairs But after less than a minute, we slowed the run to a quick walk. The undead wouldn't catch us, and the caravan site ahead of us appeared completely deserted. Adrenaline was wearing off. Exhaustion, thirst, and hunger were setting in, along with a self-doubt that was their ever-constant companion. Setting fire to the house with its occupants inside had not been done in a moment of mad revenge. It had been a calculated act, and I wasn't regretting it so much as what it meant about the person I'd become. I tried to focus on the present as a distraction from introspective recrimination. We passed a signpost for a camping site, another for a wash block, one for a shop. I almost stopped in my tracks when I saw the sign for a beachfront walk. Instead, I picked up my pace and Lorraine did the same. We saw no undead. From the broken doors, the caravans had long since been searched and left empty. The road curved inland. There was another sign directing us down an alley between two sets of wooden chalets. At the end, Razor wire glinted in the dim sunlight peeking through the thinning clouds, but there was a gap in the wire, and in that gap were two figures, Bishop, and a man I thought was another one of the jurors. Lorraine raised her submachine gun, but I pushed the barrel down. Not yet. 
not until we're outside. We don't want the zombies to know where we are. Even as I spoke, it became moot. The juror saw us, raised his weapon, and fired. I recognized the loud blast of a shotgun, but we were a hundred yards away. Lorraine fired a single shot that did just as little damage. Bishop and the juror ducked out of sight. Lorraine and I ran once more. The gap in the wire was at a wooden stile with a trio of boards lying loose on the ground. The boards slotted together, covering the gap when the entrance wasn't in use. There was no sign of Bishop, but there was a well-worn trail in the grass outside. Then came a shot, and another, and both from further down the trail. Bishop, Lorraine said. Shooting at zombies, I said. I hefted the tire iron. I'd have preferred my sword. It had been a well-balanced weapon, and among the best I've found since I left London, but the tire iron had the comfort of familiarity. Against a shotgun, however, I wished I had more than the half-loaded revolver digging into my side. Lorraine went first, submachine gun raised. No more shots came, and we didn't see Bishop or the juror before we reached the spot where they'd fired. A zombie lay on the ground. It had taken a shotgun blast to the groin. The creature still thrashed its arms and snapped its mouth, but its legs were useless. It raised a languid hand, clawing at Lorraine. I stepped forward, battered its arm out of the way, and swung the tire iron down on its skull. I bet they left it like that deliberately, Lorraine said. I wasn't sure. I'm still not. Bishop's mantra was of peace though of a particularly violent kind. Perhaps the man hadn't originally intended for anyone to die, and perhaps he'd not known what Paul and the others were doing. It hardly mattered now. We continued following the track as it bent and twisted, heading away from the campsite and downhill. I heard the sea before I saw it, but the bay came into sight a moment later. It was a shallow inlet with an eighty-foot stretch of beach, but you'd have to move a ton of rocks before you found the sand underneath. The track ended at the top of a steep cliff. A few dozen feet from us was a winding staircase, but only the top and bottom were visible among the craggy rocks. The stairs ended at a concrete pier that stretched out into the sea. The tide was out, but the boat tied halfway along floated on water. It was a sailing craft with a small outboard motor, not too dissimilar to the boat in which Kim and I had taken to Elysium. Can you see them? Lorraine asked. I can hear them. I said, there, the stairs. There was the sound of feet slipping on rough-cut spray-covered steps. Before I reached the first, a shotgun's blast rent the air and pellets flew up in front of me. The angle of the stairs, taken with the steep cliffs into which they were cut, meant the bishop and his juror couldn't see us. Nor could we see them, not without risk of getting blown apart. Lorraine inched forward. The submachine gun's barrel almost came to bear when there was another blast from the shotgun. Stone chips flew from the topmost step. I grabbed Lorraine's arm and pulled her back. We've got to stop them, she said. Shoot the boat, I said. Can you manage it? From here? Probably. But that boat's our way home. Shoot it, sink it. If they get to it, they'll get away. They'll disappear into a Welsh valley or an English city. A year from now, they'll return seeking revenge. We have to stop them. That means stopping them from escaping. Lorraine raised the gun, aiming down its length. She fired a single shot that went into the sea. She crouched down, took aim again. This time, she hit the boat. She fired one measured shot after another, and almost all hit their target. Another blast came from the shotgun, but it didn't come close. I thought Bishop had two choices, wait for us to run out of ammo, and then run for the boat, or charge up the stairs. I was wrong. All he had to do was wait. As Lorraine fired, I looked back the way we'd come. Two of the undead had appeared on the track. I don't know whether they'd followed us from the caravan side, or had followed the sound of the shotgun blast that had nearly cut that creature in two, but they were now heading towards the sound of Lorraine's submachine gun. 
Is it sinking? I asked, taking a step away from her. Probably, she said. She looked up at me, and then along the track of the undead. Oh, watch for Bishop to come up those stairs, I said. We were trapped between the undead and the cliffs. Without the boat, our only way out was down the stairs and across the beach, towards what had to be a road access point on the other side. We couldn't do that until Bishop was dead. I raised the tire iron and waited for the creatures to draw near. They hadn't been undead for long. Their clothing still had shape. The color on the thin blue scarf around the nearest zombie's head was still discernible. I wondered if Paul or Greg had fed the living to the undead, saving the bullet to trade for a pint at Marcus's pub. Other than the scarf, the woman had died wearing thin trousers and a long-sleeved T-shirt. There were no shoes on her feet. Had they fallen off, or had she been abducted at night, from somewhere indoors, somewhere she thought she was safe? The zombie twisted its head, and I thought I saw a flash of gold on that blue scarf. Was that woman Sorica Locke? Though her clothing was still discernible, her features weren't. The lower jaw was missing, her face a ruin of scar and ragged skin. She staggered closer, and I ducked, swinging low, knocking her from her feet. I stepped in and stabbed the chisel point down through her eye. It might have been Sorica Locke, but I'll never know for sure. The other zombie lurched closer. Its face was still almost human, but utterly unknown to me. Its arms hung by its sides, but rarely moved as I swung the tire iron down on its skull. It collapsed. We were alone. All was suddenly silent. Silent? I turned around. The rain still crouched by the stairs, the submachine gun shifting between the bottom of the steps and the boat. I'm down to ten rounds, she hissed as I approached, but the boat's sinking. I leaned forward so I could see. The craft looked a little lower on the water. If they run for the boat, I see we should let them, Moraine said. They'll get a mile out to sea before they sink. Worth a try, I said. Give up, Bishop, it's over, I called. The righteous never, he began, but a bird called drowning out the rest. I looked up and around for the bird. It was an automatic reflex that ended up with me looking back along the track. Another three of the undead were at the far end. From the way the bushes rustled, I thought there were more behind. Bell, they're moving, Lorraine said. But Bishop wasn't running towards the boat. He and the juror had edged along the cliff wall with their backs flat against it. Now, they were jogging along the uneven stone beach. Lorraine shifted aim. She fired. She missed. She fired again. Another miss. Save the ammo until we're closer, I said. After them. Down the steps. Go. She went first, and I counted a ten before I followed, having counted another eight of the undead appear on the track. The steps were steep, slick and treacherous, Knowing that if the undead attempted to descend them, they'd slip, fall, and hopefully die, was no consolation for the fact that same fate awaited us. It took an age to reach the bottom. By the time we did, waves were crashing over the boat's gunnels. Bishop and his juror had reached the far side of the beach and were clambering up a narrow track that ended in a pair of multicolored bins. Bins meant a car park. A car park meant a road and that meant far easier going for them as well as us. Lorraine fired. The shot missed, but it got the juror's attention. He swung around, pointing his shotgun at us over an impossible distance. Bishop pushed the barrel down and then pulled the man on towards their escape. The beach was damp, the pebbles and rocks as hard to walk over as the stairs had been to climb down. When I next looked up, Bishop and the juror were gone. When I was halfway across, I heard a rolling thump as the first of the undead reached the stairs, lost its footing, and tumbled down to the rocky beach. That was scant comfort. Lorraine made easier going of the beach than I, 
and reached the far end long before me. She didn't stop, but ran up the other side and disappeared between the bins. Half a minute later, I reached them and found myself in a packed dirt car park filled with signs forbidding barbecues, fly-tipping, and overnight parking. There was no sign of Bishop and the juror. The rain stood in the road just beyond the car park. Her submachine gun was raised, but a forlorn look was on her face. They've gone, she said. They haven't gone far, I said, and they won't have returned to the caravan site. We go after them. I'm not giving up, not yet. Chapter 24 The Middle of the Road On the road about a mile from the beach, it looked like two columns of vehicles had collided. It was hard to tell if that was exactly what had happened, as in a field near the middle of the long line of traffic was a crater at least twenty feet wide. The blast had blown half of the cars and trucks onto their sides, and a quarter onto their backs. Broken glass, twisted metal, and burned rubber carpeted the road and the verge either side. I think I know where we are, Lorraine said. Heather mentioned something like this. She said she saw the crash, the crater, and came ashore to check for radiation. If this is the same place, then Lindudno is that way. She pointed beyond the stalled vehicles. Banga is behind us. Ah, then we're going the wrong way, I said. But Bishop's going the right one. Lorraine said, except he wouldn't have gone to Lindidno. He'd have gone inland. We both turned to look at the sweep of fields, the verdant hills beyond them. Were there any boats and fuel left in Lindidno? I asked. Not since August, Lorraine said. We collected all that was left. There wasn't much. I guess because Bishop had been taking it. We'll find bicycles, though. Maybe we'll find them before we get to the town. We'll have to head inland to avoid the caravan site. Maybe we'll catch up with them. From her tone, she didn't think it was likely, nor did I. Maybe, I said. We continued walking, but neither of us made any effort to hurry. I wonder if the survivors of this column made it to the caravan site. If any made it to Anglesey, they didn't say, Lorraine said. That's the problem, isn't it? that were still all strangers to one another. Glass crunched loudly underfoot, and then came an echo of the sound from ahead. I stopped, listened, and heard it again. Beyond a dented Land Rover and an upturned two-seater whose engine had been shoved almost into the boot was a white panel van skewed at seventy degrees to the road. I couldn't see what lay beyond, but I could hear the sound of the undead shifting and moving. Our approach had woken the creature from its sedentary torpor, and now it waited for us on the other side of the van. It? Or they? I wasn't sure, but was certain there would be more further along the column of wrecked vehicles. If anything other than the caravan site lay behind us, I would have insisted we turn around. We'd lost Bishop, that was clear, but he was no longer the most immediate danger to Anglesey. I gestured to Lorraine, indicating she should go to the right and that I'd go to the left around the van. As there was no way of walking quietly across the carpet of broken glass, I hoped that sounds coming from different sides would confuse the creature. Lorraine nodded, slung the submachine, and drew the knife from her belt. I edged forward, around the Land Rover, then around the partially crushed ruin of the sports car. It was one of those seven-figure models I'd occasionally seen in London, but which wouldn't be left unattended even in Mayfair. With a slight pang of regret that I'd never get to sit behind its wheel, I eased past it and towards the van's cab. I couldn't hear the zombie. I glanced around, saw Lorraine at the van's rear. I gave her a nod and moved around the cab. I'd taken four steps before I remembered that zombies don't lie in wait. I looked up and saw Bishop's juror. He'd been on the roof of the van. He launched himself at me. I didn't have time to step out of the way, let alone swing the tire iron. The man hit me hard. The force of the impact knocked me from my feet. I managed to grab a fistful of his coat as we fell, 
but took the brunt of the impact as we hit the ground. For a moment I was stunned. Either I let go of his coat, or he pulled himself free. But in the second it took me to regain my senses, to roll to my knees, he'd grabbed the revolver from my belt and stood up. The barrel was six inches from my eye. Why are you doing this? I asked. Why do you follow him? It's written, the juror said. Seven shall judge. It was written by Bishop, I said. I wouldn't place your personal salvation on anything that man taught you. No, the juror said. It's written that the kingdom shall fall, the fires will cleanse, out of the ashes a new world shall begin, but only for the righteous, and they shall be judged by the— His words were cut short by a single, short, sharp retort as Lorraine fired. The bullet passed straight through the man's head, spraying me with blood and brain as his lifeless corpse collapsed. Are you all right? Lorraine asked. Fine, I said, wiping my eyes. I stood up and winced. My back would be bruised for weeks. Why didn't he take to the fields? Lorraine asked. If it was anyone else, I'd say they wanted our guns, I said, as I bent to pick up my tire iron. As I straightened, I got another wave of pain from my lower back. With them, who can say? Lorraine picked up the revolver and held it out. No, keep it, I said. I'm a terrible shot anyway. I looked at the corpse, then at the almost mile-long line of wrecked traffic ahead of us. Bishop's probably out there, waiting for us. I'm not giving up now, Lorraine said. We walked more slowly, more cautiously, eyeing each car in turn as a possible hiding place for the man, watching the roof of every tall vehicle we saw. There were a few vans and lorries where the grime around the handles had been smeared, suggesting someone had recently opened them to see what treasures lay inside. We checked each one, and after we found each one empty, I spared a glance back along the road. The undead would come. I was sure of it. A column of smoke billowed upward in the west, betraying where the house burned. The sound of Lorraine's last shot would have carried. There was another possibility, that not all Bishop's followers had died, and that they had heard that shot. Even now they could be heading towards us. We had no choice but to go on, into what was clearly a trap. A fist slammed against the closed rear window of a green hybrid. We both jumped. Lorraine brought her submachine gun to bear as the creature's palms slammed into the window again. Don't fire, I said, just as a gunshot rent the air. It wasn't fired by Lorraine. The front windshield of the car shattered. The bullet thumped into a seat. The zombie beat on the window more furiously as we both ducked behind the rear of the car. Another shot came. The bullet hit metal. Bishop, I said. I guess they didn't want our guns, Lorraine said. The car rocked as the zombie shifted inside, pushing and clawing at glass. There were about six more cars, I said. Then a big rig, the trailer partially on its side, then a mass of traffic right near that crater. That's right, isn't it? Five cars before the juggernaut, I think, Lorraine said. The zombie inside the car had managed to turn around. It slammed its head into the rear windscreen. There was a soft pop as the top right-hand corner slid out of its seal. Another blow and the window came free. The zombie sprawled after it. I reared up and slammed the tire iron down in its skull. There was another shot. I ducked down, uncertain where the bullet had gone. I looked towards the hills. I thought I could see movement, but it might have been bushes moving with the wind. He can't stay here, I said. Fire a shot, keep his attention. I'm going to try to get closer. You want the revolver? Honestly. If I'm close enough to hit him, I'm close enough to use my hands. Keep him occupied, his attention on you. On three. One, two, three. She stood, and I limped across the road towards the line of cars on the other side. 
I heard a shot and heard another in reply as I reached the rear of the first vehicle. Lorraine was right. There were five cars, stopped bumper to broken bumper. The rear wheels of the big rig's trailer were balanced precariously on the car at the front of that truncated line. There was another shot. I think it came from Bishop. Your juror's dead, Lorraine called out. He's dead, Bishop. They're all dead. Bishop fired another wild shot, and I eased forward, moving in a slow crouch. They're dead, Bishop, Lorraine called. What does that say about the verdict? What does that say about your book? The words that are written can never be erased, Bishop called back, adding another shot as punctuation. He was behind or possibly inside the cab of the big rig, and that was another sixty yards down the road. I had to drop to my hands and knees as I passed a mini whose roof had been crushed into the seats. Glass and gravel bit into my flesh, but I ignored it, focusing on the sound of the next shot. Seconds that felt like hours later, I reached the final car, half buried underneath the rig's rear wheels. We're erasing the words now, Lorraine said. No one will remember them. No one will remember you. I shall be remembered for eternity, Bishop yelled. He fired again. He had to be running low on ammo, but so was Lorraine. I sidled quickly along the side of the rig, tire iron raised, wondering whether I should try to take Bishop prisoner. There were plenty of questions to ask him. But would we believe the answers? I eased past the dented chrome, once lovingly polished, now mottled and pitted by months of exposure to the wind-carried sea spray. I heard the man muttering. Most of it was unintelligible, a litany of books, words, seals and serpents. But it told me he was outside, not in the cab. Bishop was eight feet away, shock on his face, but a gun was in his hand, and that was pivoting around to point at me. My arm was still arcing around in a blow that would only hit the truck. I let go of the tire iron, hurling it at his head. He tried to move out of the way, but the tool hit him in the shoulder. The gun, a semi-automatic pistol, went off. The bullet went wide, and I dived the last few feet grappling with the man. He bucked his head forward and brought his knee up. He was surprisingly strong, and I was unused to fighting people. His forehead hit my nose. A wave of pain washed over me, but I kept my grip on his wrist, trying to turn and twist and force him to drop the gun. He got a hand around my throat, but I twisted free, jabbed my left hand into his side. I hit something soft, vital. He tried to take a step back. It was my turn to butt my forehead into his face. It was a mistake. I saw stars, and he finally remembered a gun in his hand. He pulled the trigger. The bullet missed, but the recoil meant I lost my grip. Bishop staggered free, stumbling towards the mass of wrecked cars. As he brought the gun up, I charged into him, slamming him into the crushed vehicle. I swear I hadn't seen it. I hadn't noticed. I hadn't even considered why Bishop had stopped at that particular spot, why he hadn't gone any further. As I rammed him into the car, arms reached through the crushed frame. The opening was less than a foot wide. The zombies inside were trapped. But they weren't dead. They grabbed at his coat, four arms from at least three different creatures. They tried to grab me, but I backed away. Hands tugged at his chest at his arms pulling and twisting his gun hand down. He screamed, and before I could do anything, before I had time to decide whether I should do anything, a face appeared in the window, a hideous, twisted ruin of a face, missing eyes and nose, but still with that snapping, rending mouth. It bit into his arm. He screamed again. I reached for his shoulder, an automatic reflex to pull him free but he dropped to his knees. The zombie bit again, this time into his neck. The screaming stopped.
Bishop died. Chapter 25 A Welcome Patrol Is it what he deserved? I asked as I picked up the tire iron. Ask me that in a month's time, Lorraine said. Do we kill them? As Bishop's corpse had fallen to the ground, the undead face had disappeared, and the arms had returned, grasping and clawing. The creatures were trapped in their car, at least for now, though it was rocking back and forth as they attempted to reach the oh-so-close prey. I'm down to four bullets, Lorraine added. I'm not going to try to search his body for more. Bishop's gun had fallen out of the flat wheel at the rear of the vehicle. Home, I said, or Anglesey at least. This isn't over. It isn't? Lorraine asked. Bishop didn't come up with the idea of standing in the election, I said. He was put up to it. That woman and the jurors might have been true believers, but Greg and that guy with a spiderweb tattoo weren't. Someone else is behind this, and they decided to abduct us because he went to that pub on the same day. No, this isn't over, not yet. So we have to get to Anglesey, and that means getting to Bangor. Well, for now, that means continuing down this road, heading towards Landidno, she said. Oh, maybe not. Heeding the siren song of screams and gunshots came the undead. Eighteen lurching figures strung out in a line along the road, the nearest now at the furthest end of the wrecked convoy. The fields, then, I said, will loop around the caravan site. It wasn't an easy journey. The fields meant that we were able to see the undead coming, and come they did. Lorraine saved the last of the bullets, and that meant it was work for knife and tire iron, hacking and cutting through the creatures that had been heading towards the vehicles and which now were following us. We reached a road and found bicycles in the third house we looked in. That helped, but even then the journey was almost a fatal one. Both of us dehydrated, wounded, and utterly exhausted. We pushed on, cycling through the undead when we could, but twice we had to stop and fight. Darkness was falling when we saw a sign for Bangor, and it had almost settled when we cycled straight into an armed patrol. I'm thankful we were cycling, because otherwise they would surely have thought we were undead. Lorraine, is that you? a woman asked. Gloria, Lorraine said. Where's Heather? Looking for you, the woman said. Where have you been? Long story, Lorraine said and not one with a happy ending. I took the proffered water bottle. Zombies are following, I said, after I'd swallowed the entire bottle, about an hour behind. Call everyone back to Garth Point, Gloria said, to another of the patrol. We'd better call Heather. With an armed escort surrounding us, I finally began to feel safe. So what happened? Gloria asked. It was... Lorraine began... We can't say, I said. We won't say, not yet. Not until it's over, and it's not. Not yet. Trust me, trust us. I don't think Heather's going to settle for that, Gloria said. But she didn't ask any more questions. Garth Point, at the utter northwest of the city of Bangor, had become a fortress since my first visit. The roads were barricaded. The ground floor windows had been boarded up. I counted a dozen people but didn't recognize a single face. Lorraine did, but said nothing until we were inside the pub that had become a command center for this odd little outpost. From the assortment of equipment inside the pub, they were making a concerted effort to strip the university and city of anything useful and irreplaceable. Heather's on her way across, a man next to a radio said. Where have you been? I only want to tell the story once. I said. We'll wait for Heather. I don't think we waited for long, but I actually fell asleep. Lorraine! Heather called from the door, waking me from my shallow slumber. She ran across the room, stumbling to a halt when she saw the state of Lorraine. Someone get us some new clothes, Heather said. And some soap, Lorraine said. What happened? Heather asked. That's a long story, 
I said. I'll tell you on the boat ride to Anglesey. Bill? Heather asked, finally noticing I was there, too. I stepped in close so only Heather Jones could hear. I need to get to Anglesey, to Marcus's pub, and I need everyone that you're sure you can utterly trust with your life, with Lorraine's life, too, I added. Oh, and I need a gun. Chapter 26 The Last Candidate The 22nd of October, Day 224, Anglesey It was almost 3 a.m. when I hammered on the inn of Equity's door. The lights were still on, but it took almost two full minutes before I heard footsteps. What? A gruff voice asked. It's Bill Wright, I said. I need to speak to the candidate. It's urgent. I waited and as I did I took a moment to look behind me at the dark and apparently empty streets. I resisted the urge to wave. Fine, the man said. I heard bolts being pulled. The door opened, and I saw the older bearded man who was never far from Marcus's side. What's this? The man stopped speaking, as he properly saw me. Unlike Lorraine, I hadn't changed. My clothes were travel-stained, brain-smeared and blood-coated from the battle in Wales. What happened to you? he asked. That's a long story, I said, and as I have to tell Marcus, I'd rather only tell it once. Then you better come in, he said. You alone? Yes, I lied. I was let inside. The pub wasn't like when I'd first seen it. In fact, it didn't look like a pub at all. The bar was still there, and there were a few bottles on the shelves, but half the room was filled with placards and posters. The other half was taken up with recently asleep people. I couldn't tell if they were election workers, bodyguards, or something halfway between the two. Take a seat, the bearded man said to me. What's going on? a young woman asked. The bearded man didn't reply. Nor did I. I sat at a table in the middle of the room, moving the chair close to the table so my hands couldn't be seen. There were a few lamps by the window, another two were plugged into the main socket by the bar, but the room was otherwise dark. Certainly, it was dark enough for what I planned. The bearded man was gone only for a few minutes. He returned with Marcus. The candidate was still pulling on a jumper though he'd had time to strap a holster around his waist. A few seconds behind them came Rachel. She was fully dressed and looked wide awake. I nodded to her, and she frowned as she took me in. She stood behind the bar, hands folded across her chest. "'What's going on, Mr. Wright?' Marcus asked. "'You look like you've been in the wars.' "'Please call me Bill,' I said. As to what's going on, it all comes down to trust. So, Marcus, who here can you trust? Everyone, he said. Really? I asked. I raised my left hand to wave at the now awake group, standing uncertainly by the wall. There were nine of them, a mixture of men and women. All were young, in their early twenties. A few had knives at their belts, and two had picked up rifles. Both were SA-80 assault rifles, though without the silencers that were commonly used by expeditions to the mainland. Put those down, the bearded man said. The two men lowered their guns, though with evident reluctance. I trust him, he said. That's good enough for me, Marcus said. Good. So we all trust each other. Now, why have you come? Bishop is dead, I said. Marcus was literally speechless. He pulled out a chair and sat down opposite me. The bearded man chose a chair at a different table sitting almost behind me. I ignored him. Unless I'd completely misjudged the events of the previous few hours and what they told me about the events of the last few months, he wasn't a threat. Is that Bishop's blood? Marcus finally asked. I looked down. No? Well... Maybe some. Most of it belonged to its followers. They abducted me and Lorraine. You remember her? 
She was in here a couple of days ago asking questions about people in a photograph. Yeah, vaguely, Marcus said. Immediately afterwards she was taken by Bishop's people. They got me yesterday, after I went to one of his rallies. Did you hear him speak? Sure, Marcus said. Once. I wanted to see what I was up against. What did you think? I asked. A bishop? I'd lost it somewhere in the wasteland. Wasn't going to find it again either. Dr. Umbert should have been taking care of people like that, not getting involved in politics. I raised my left hand. I'll stop you there. The election's over so you can ditch the candidate routine. That was an interesting photograph that Lorraine had. You know where I found it? Marcus shrugged. It was in a bunker in Belfast, I said, a fallout shelter that had been hastily built, situated beneath a warehouse in an otherwise unassuming district. You know who built it? Lisa Kempton. She knew about the conspiracy, about Quigley's plot, and knew that it might end in nuclear war. Kempton had a ship, did you know that? Best place to survive a nuclear war, out on the empty ocean. That begs the question of whether the bunker was for her, or for her employees. I've picked up a few rumours and clues along the way, but what she told her followers wasn't necessarily true. What's your point? Marcus asked. I'm coming to it, I said. One of the women in the photograph was named Soraka Locke. I thought she'd died in Belfast, and I was wrong. She escaped Belfast, and didn't escape alone. I think she travelled in the company of a man who was the live-in guardian of a house in a village south of the Shannon Estuary. I don't know his name, so I wouldn't ever be able to prove it. But I know Soraka Locke made it this far. I know that a man in that photograph was seen in this very same pub months ago, before Quigley died. So? So I'm laying out the proof, I said. I'm showing you that there is proof. This isn't supposition, inference, or guesswork. There are photographs and witnesses. I turned to look at the nine people, and then at the bearded man. There's proof, I said. Proof of what? Marcus asked. You know that people have been disappearing. The ones we thought were taking their boats and sailing away, well, some of them might have been. Bishop was responsible for the deaths of all the others. He held a trial, you see. And that's what I was abducted for. I was going to be tried. I'm still not sure for what crime, but like you said, the man wasn't sane. So perhaps even he didn't know. He told us the names of some of the others that had been tried. Soraka Locke was one of them. She escaped Elysium, made it to Belfast, and escaped from there. It's no great leap to assume that she escaped from Ireland by sea. And if she did that, and if she headed south, she would have stumbled across someone fishing near here. It's no surprise that she and at least one of her comrades ended up on Anglesey. It is a surprise that Bishop found out who she was. How did he know? Because he did know who she was. And how did he know about Kempton's involvement in the conspiracy? What happened to her? Marcus asked. Bishop killed her? Not quite, I said. He thought he was releasing these people into the wasteland. There they would face trial by ordeal. If they made it back to Anglesey, their souls would be deemed pure or something like that. No one made it back, because if they had, they'd have told everyone they could about what was going on. Instead, we assume those people who went missing had taken a boat to search for their lost loved ones. Perhaps some did, but not all. Bishop didn't kill them, but some of those people with him did. People like Paul. Paul? Marcus asked. Which is why I'm here, I said. Bishop was being driven by his own demons. His true followers were the same, but not everyone with him believed in his cause. So that brings me to the wider question of why was he doing any of it? Why did he stand as a candidate, and why didn't he drop out when all the others did? I asked him to, Marcus said. 
To drop out, I mean. He did? But you personally? I asked. Marcus frowned, but didn't say anything. Did you attack Donny? I asked. Me? No. Surely that was Bishop, Marcus said. It's not his style, I said. If he wanted to get rid of someone, he'd take them for trial. Then again, standing to be leader of our little community doesn't really seem like your style. You had a good thing going on here, a trading post and bar, bit of influence, and then the chance to get more. Why did you want responsibility for all those lives? You didn't, did you? You didn't want to win. You wanted the power that comes with being the opponent, not the hard work that comes with leadership. Again, Marcus said nothing, but I could see he was thinking furiously. I decided the game had been played out long enough. I turned my head towards Rachel, still standing behind the bar. Yes, Bishop was being driven by his own demons, I said, but someone was guiding them. You wanted Marcus to stand, and you wanted Bishop as his opponent. I'm right? I asked, turning to Marcus. You asked Rachel to get Bishop to drop out? Marcus gave a fraction of a nod. I turned to Rachel. You shot Paul because you couldn't risk him being arrested. That man was a sadist and a butcher, but the prospect of a noose might have loosened his tongue. That's why you shot him. To prevent him from talking to us, from trading the one thing he had, the one thing he knew for his life. Rachel, I don't, Marcus stammered. Why? Except you didn't just shoot Paul, did you? I said. You set him up. Did you ask him to kill Llewellyn? We only suspected Paul in that man's murder and only brought our suspicions to this pub because someone in Willow Farm said they saw a figure that matched Paul's description entering Llewellyn's home. We found beer next to Llewellyn's body, bottles of the same stuff you sell here. Did that witness really see anything? Or did you tell her to say that she'd seen Paul there? Was Llewellyn chosen as a victim because of how close his house was to Willow Farm? You knew what would happen, how Paul would react when confronted. You knew he'd go for his gun. Yes, it was all quite neat, until we didn't shoot Paul on sight. When we tried to arrest Paul, you had no choice but to kill him. And that brings us back to Sorica Locke. When she arrived on Anglesey, someone had to have recognized her, her and the man she was with, someone who worked for Kempton, someone who wanted their own secrets to stay hidden. You. I waited. She'd not reacted to any of my accusations, nor made any move to answer any of my questions. I thought she might say nothing. The moment stretched. Finally, she spoke. Oh, Brian, Rachel said. That was his name. The man Sorica was with was Sean O'Brien. You did this? Marcus asked. You really did all of it? Rachel ignored Marcus. So did I. You worked for Kempton? I asked her. Rachel smiled, but it wasn't a happy expression. Oh, yeah, she said. But I wasn't one of the chosen. There wasn't room on her ark for me. That's the reason for all this death. She laughed. No. Locke knew Kempton's secrets. Those secrets even now, especially now, are more valuable than bullets, electricity, or even safety. They are the future. You killed her to find them out, Marcus asked. You would have done the same, Rachel said, turning to face him. What about everyone else? I asked. Why did they have to die? They had to die because I needed Bishop alive, Rachel said. I felt like each question was taking me further from the truth, and I could sense that there wasn't going to be time for many more. Why did you need Bishop? Marcus asked. For the same reason I needed you, Rachel said. There has to be an enemy, otherwise how do you know who is on your side? But Bishop had outrun his usefulness, hadn't he? I said. You had Lorraine and I abducted because you wanted Bishop to be destroyed. 
When the search for us began, one of your people would have remembered seeing me at his rally or seeing a boat heading for Wales. Some clue would be found. Perhaps you would simply have overheard some of your customers talking. That would be plausible, or just plausible enough. The Marines would have descended on that campsite. Of course, Lorraine and I would be dead. But then so would Bishop, and any other inconveniently loose tongues. Your people would already have killed them. Without Bishop, Marcus would be the only candidate left. His victory was assured. And you controlled Marcus, didn't you? If you wanted people dead, why did it have to be so elaborate? Marcus asked. Why bother with Paul and Bishop? Why not kill them and dump their bodies in the sea? There's only one punishment for murder, Rachel said. But how do you define murder? How should we define it after all that's happened, after all that we've done? Are we all guilty? Are we all innocent? She turned to the shelf behind the bar. Who wants a drink? I think I could do with one. Killing people is easy, I said. Getting rid of the bodies is hard, at least here on Anglesey. A shallow grave might be discovered when the land is ploughed. If you dump them at sea, you risk the corpse being washed ashore. On the mainland, you just have to crush someone's skull. Anyone discovering the corpse would assume it's one of the undead. But that means... You have to get the victims to the mainland. That requires help, right? Of course, people require payment. And at least some of that was coming from the grain ration that Willow Farm was claiming for all the people that Paul and the others had already killed. That wouldn't have been enough. Not on its own. So what else did you pay them with? Promises to be delivered after Marcus was elected when you knew you would really be in charge. Rachel placed the bottle on the counter. You set this up? Marcus asked, and he sounded genuinely aggrieved. You wanted me to run for office just so you could... could... what? What did you want? The same thing I've always wanted. The same thing every one of us wants, Rachel said. Though right now, I want a drink. She reached down behind the bar. When she brought her hand back up, it didn't contain a glass, but a sawn-off shotgun. Before she could bring it to bear, three shots rent the air. Two of those were mine. One hit the shelf behind her, shattering a glass bottle. The second hit her chest. The third shot was fired by the bearded man, and it took her right between the eyes. I put your gun on the table, I said as Rachel's corpse collapsed on the bar. The rest of you, raise your hands above your heads. Quick now, unless you want to be the next to be shot. The bearded man did, but a few of the younger people were still uncertainly reaching for their rifles when the doors burst open. The French soldier, Francois, was first through the door, but Sholto was second. It's over, I said, as the room filled with armed figures. I thought you said she'd run. Sholto said, more than accusingly. I thought she would, I said. I turned to the room at large. Rachel lived here. We need to search the place for anything she left behind. Any notes that might give an indication as to how many people died. That kind of thing. Like the secret she got out of Sorrichel Lock? Marcus asked. I felt suddenly tired, utterly spent. It won't be the location of the Holy Grail, I said. Locke died months ago, and she was Kempton's representative in Ireland. You know what secret she had? The location of Elysium, the ship in the Shannon Estuary, and how to access the satellites that we've been using these last few months. That's all she knew, and we already know it. This is now a crime scene, Captain Devine said, taking a far more practiced control of the situation. Everyone out! Move! Not you, Marcus. I said, as the man made to leave. You and I need to talk. Alone. The bar slowly emptied of everyone except me, Marcus, Sholto, and Captain Devine. I thought you said alone, Marcus said. I think we should have a witness or two, I said, if not for legal reasons, perhaps for historical ones. 
and this is where you shoot me and claim self-defense? He asked. If my brother wanted you dead, Shalto said in a tone that suggested that he did, then it would have been me who knocked at the door. I waved a hand at Shalto. I was too tired for posturing. We've sent a hundred sailors and soldiers to Willow Farm to arrest everyone there, I said. I don't know how many people that is, but come the morning, we're going to have to figure out what to do with them. Some of them would have been complicit in Bishop's horror show. The rest? I don't know. Nor do I know how we distinguish complicity from coercion. But we'll have to find a way. The same goes with your people, Marcus. I don't know who among them might have knowingly helped Rachel, but I'm sure Paul wasn't the only one. Who can you trust, Marcus? Who can you really trust? No one, it seems, he said. The election is off, I said. You're the last candidate. You can insist that the contest is run, but if you do that, then I'm going to imply that you knew all about this. In court? Wouldn't that defy the purpose of having laws? He asked. Not in court. I said, in print. You saw how popular my first set of journals became. I've got some notes that I made while in Ireland. Tomorrow, I'm going to write them up. The question is whether Rob... Remember Rob? Someone told him that we'd taken him to Ireland so that we could kill him. The question is whether I print that he told us that someone was you. If I do that, your reputation will be ruined. You'll be lucky if anyone will trust you to dig a ditch, let alone draw a pint. Marcus laughed, a brief guffaw of surprise. That's it! You just want me to drop out? We'll hold a new contest in the new year, I said. You can stand then if you want. But later this morning, you're going to give a speech. Bow out in the name of democracy. You do that, and I'll print something that says you had nothing to do with any of this. You don't. And I'll print the opposite. Personally, Chalto said, I'd finish this here and now. But my little brother thinks you might actually be innocent in all of this. I am, Marcus said. I swear, I didn't know. You want me to drop out, give a statement? Fine, agreed. Good. I headed to the door. We're in the captain's crime scene, I said to Marcus. You have to leave. And spend the rest of the night in the cold? Well, why not? I've slept in worse places. Have one last question, I said, one hand on the door. When did you guess? I'm sorry, Marcus asked. We first met you in a caravan site near Carnarfon. I couldn't figure out why you'd gone there. But you were looking for Bishop's place, weren't you? I'd heard Paul and Rachel talking about some caravan site and something hidden there. I wasn't sure what or where, he said. I'm not sure I believed him. But then again, I was unlikely to believe anything the man said. I'll ask you again, I said. Who can you really trust? Good night. I left the pub. It would be better if he was dead, Sholto said, as we walked through the thin crowd. About half of those present were soldiers or sailors of one nationality or another. A quarter were volunteers from Menai Bridge. The rest were curious onlookers from the houses nearby. I'm not sure, I said. I think this way's better, for now at least. One death is better than a bloodbath. The election for those cabinet posts can go ahead, so we'll have the appearance of democracy even if we've not quite got the reality. When we do hold the mayoral election, Marcus won't stand a chance. Not that I think he'll run. Not again. Not after this. Kim, a rifle over her shoulder, fell into step. Was it like you thought? She asked. More or less, I said. I don't know when Rachel first got to Bishop but she was using his followers to take people across to the mainland where they could be killed, and where the discovery of their bodies wouldn't arouse suspicion. Not all of them could be paid with Bishop's version of an afterlife, hence the inflation of the number of believers he had. 
that enabled them to claim more grain than they needed, and that was used as payment to the others. I'm not sure who all of the victims were, nor why they were chosen, but some died simply so that there would be more grain with which to pay the murderers. A down payment might be a better term for it. The balance would be paid when Marcus won. Considering everything else she did, I suspect that balance would have been paid with a bullet. Not that Marcus expected to win, but Rachel had arranged it so that he couldn't lose. She was running his campaign and was probably responsible for Donnie's injury. I think she'd have killed Dr. Umbert if he hadn't died on the Isle of Man. If Lorraine and I hadn't escaped, her people would have killed us and then killed Bishop and his followers. After Marcus was elected, no more questions would have been asked. Paul was the weak link, since he wasn't just killing people but taking pleasure in it. Leaving those bodies inside the university was a mistake, and one for which he paid with his life. Quite why Paul did it, I don't know. Precisely why Rachel did any of it, I'm not entirely sure, though I think it might have started when Sorrowful Locke arrived on this island. What was it you said about the people Kempton employed? That they weren't waifs and strays looking for a second chance, but criminals on their last one. Well, Rachel had something in her past, something she didn't want the world to know. Add that to bitterness that she wasn't allocated a place in one of Kempton's refuges, and it was enough to send her well and truly over the edge. As to who the rest of the victims were, well, we'll have to work that out over the next few days. But I think it all came down to revenge, power, and at least partly that Rachel never thought she'd get caught. Hmm. I have a few questions, Kim said. Save them, I said, at least until after I've told George and Mary, because I expect they've got some questions too. After that, I'm going to wash, change, and sleep for a year. Epilogue Leaks But I only managed to sleep for a few hours before Kim woke me. There are people here, Bill, a lot of people. Did Marcus give a speech? He did. Sholto and I went to listen. Marcus withdrew from the race gracefully, more or less. He finished by saying that Mary should continue to lead until this immediate crisis has been resolved. And he sent you a message. He's looking forward to reading your new book. It was meant to stand aside in favour of democracy, though I don't suppose it matters. I'd not really thought who was going to run the place. I guess I should start writing something and keep my end of the bargain. That will have to wait a few more hours, because everyone wants to know what's happening. There's about sixty of them outside the house. Do you have a plan? The beginnings of one, I said. It's not too far different from the idea that Dr. Umbert had. We've got to create something new out of the ashes of the old. Something better, rather than simply regressing back to the past. Do you know how we can achieve it? I think I've got the first few steps, I said. Great, because George, Mary, Captain Devine, and the Admiral are downstairs. I think you better tell them. They had gathered in the small kitchen of the terrace's ground floor, George to the left of Mary's wheelchair, the Admiral and Captain to the right. Sholto sat opposite, his expression as taut as the others. Relax, I said as I walked in. Who wants some tea? I walked to the wall and put the kettle on. We need to talk, George said. About last night, it came down to power and revenge, I said. I'd summarized my confrontation with Marcus and Rachel to an extended version of the group before going to sleep, but it's in the past. Which brings us to the future, the Admiral said, and that's of more immediate concern. Agreed, I said. We should have known that the outbreak would create someone like Bishop, and we should have been watching out for it. How we deal with the people on Willow Farm will determine how our society develops. We've got to view this as an opportunity— a chance to create laws and administer justice. That's a more lasting symbol of democracy than the election would have been. Certainly more than it'll be right now. 
were still too disparate a group, too concerned with our differences rather than that which binds us together. People need to know how bad the food situation is. There's no point hiding the truth from them. No, Umbert said that we were fighters, not soldiers, and he's right. We are fighters who need to become farmers. I'm sorry, Admiral, but we're going to need that oil, and we're going to need Elysium and Belfast, the Isle of Man too, though for the next few months we're going to need your sailors and soldiers to properly train us in how to wage war. We might all soon be farmers, but there's still a fight ahead of us. We need to clear enough land to plant a proper, proper, what? What is it? Tell them, the Admiral said. You better sit down, George said. Why? I asked. What's Marcus done now? It's not him, Mary said. There's something you don't know. Something very few outside the room know. Please, sit down. I looked at Sholto and Kim, but they were as nonplussed as me. I sat. A few weeks after the nuclear power plant was turned back on, Mary said, there was a leak from a steam pipe. It wasn't radioactive, but we couldn't repair it. We had to reduce the plant's output. With so few of us on the island, it hardly mattered. The night after the Harper's Ferry arrived, the fire suppression system broke. Neither of those was critical, at least not to keeping the plant running. While you were in Ireland, during a storm, an alarm rang. We thought that a crack had developed in the reactor. Fortunately, it was only a malfunction in the detection system, and fortunately, that system is now offline. While the plant was being inspected, another leak was found. This time, it was radioactive. We lost two people sealing it. We said that it was a rare type of leukemia. I thought that was better than the panic that would come from sharing the truth. The power plant is breaking, I asked. More or less, George said. I'd go so far to say as it's broken. I thought, or Chief Watts did, that if it could survive the winter, it could last for a couple of years. Well, winter's almost upon us, and the power station's failing. The problem is a lack of spares. We've got some from the critical systems, but it's the precision everyday stuff like the high-pressure pipes that we don't have and can't make. Before the outbreak, no doubt we could get it from any of a dozen factories in Britain. Now, we don't even know where to look. How... how long do we have? Kim asked. Eighteen months, Mary said. I breathed out. That's not... Eighteen months if we shut it down now, Mary continued. We've no way of properly decommissioning the reactor. We can't dispose of the radioactive material inside, nor can we seal the pile. Within 18 months, containment will fail. And if we don't shut it down now? Kim asked. And it might be tomorrow, George said. It might be next week. It'll most likely be after the next big storm, the Admiral said. If we don't shut it down, we'll be lucky to have a month's grace before we have to leave. We might only have a matter of days. Maybe only hours, George added. Who knows about this? I asked. The four of us, Mary said, Mr. Mills and some of his engineers, and the chief from the Harper's Ferry and a few of his team. We've kept the news close because no one else has the knowledge to help. The kettle boiled and automatically clicked off. I found my gaze caught by the plume of steam coming from the spout. People should have been told, I said. We should have been told. We always knew that the power plant would have to be shut down some day, George said. It was why we were looking for wind turbines and so much more. I had high hopes for that expedition to Hull, and the ones that went elsewhere, too high as it turns out. We all did, Mary said. High hopes and grand plans. I thought we might be able to relocate across the Irish Sea. It's why I encourage people to look at those satellite images of Ireland, rather than pushing them to work on the farms. 
There's no point ploughing this island's fields if we'll never grow anything in them. Though I wanted people to learn how to plough for wherever they end up next. The work they've been doing in Menai Bridge will provide us with the seeds to take with us. Wherever we go, once we've cleared the land, we'll have something to sow. If we've time, we can even dismantle some of the greenhouses they've built, so we'll have fresh food next winter, and in all the winters to come. If we've time. So the election was, was what, a distraction? I asked. You mean you had no intention of stepping aside? The opposite, Mary said. When the election was first announced, I really did think that this would become humanity's new home. As it became clear that we would all have to leave this island, I thought the election would play out in one of two ways. Either we'd become united behind a single candidate, or it would further reinforce the groups in which people had arrived here. From that, we'd know whether we were leaving as one community or as separate groups. I thought, I had hoped, that the election would become a debate on the possible futures our species could have and the directions it could take. I didn't expect Marcus. I was never the leader this community needed, but I was the one it got. It is time for me to step aside, but not for the likes of him. Had Marcus not been the candidate, had this been a race between Dr. Umbert and other, more rational people, we would have told everyone about the reactor. But Marcus, Bishop, they would have used this as a stick to beat their way to victory. Then you must have had a plan to win the election, Kim said, a way of defeating Marcus. A few, George said, a few that changed as the circumstances have. Most recently we settled on the idea of a write-in candidate. That was the Admiral's idea. Something borrowed from America. We'd have handed out stickers with a name printed on them to everyone entering the polling station. It wouldn't have worked, I said. Whose name? Kim asked. Bill's, George said. That hardly matters now, the Admiral said. There's the issue of Willow Farm to be addressed. Half of my crew are guarding them and I'll need all my personnel for our voyage. To America? I asked. Do you understand why it's so important? The Admiral replied. Elysium might be a temporary refuge, a place to which we can run if we have to leave tomorrow. But until the undead die, it won't become our home. And if America is as bad as those few satellite images we took implied? I asked. If it's as bad as Britain and Ireland? What then? Then we disperse, the Admiral said. Elysium, Svalbard, wherever we can reach, with whoever will travel with us. We set out in the hope that enough of us will outlast the undead. What were you doing in Belfast? I asked. I mean the sailors digging up that playing field. Taking soil samples, the Admiral said, checking radiation and other contaminants. It all comes down to the undead. Without them, Belfast could be habitable again. The Isle of Man, too, though I would be concerned about radiation leaking from the power plant into the Irish Sea. Those places could be the answer for those who can't reach America, and for those who don't wish to travel with us. It's not just the undead, the captain added. It's Bishop's people, and Marcus, and, and his followers. Do you want to bring them with us, too? If we disperse... I said, we're giving up on the species. We have to stick together. Which is easier said than done, Mary said. Silence settled for a long minute. It was Kim who finally broke it. When will you shut the power plant down? She asked. We won't, Mary said. Not until we have to. And hope that we don't leave it too late. It's ammunition, George said, or the lack of it. We don't have enough to hold Belfast or Elysium, for that matter. If we're forced to flee, most people will be living in their boats again, and that's not a pleasant prospect during the winter. If we can hold out until the spring, the Admiral might have found a safe harbor in America, or the undead might have died. What if she hasn't? What if they haven't? I asked. I stood 
and walked back over to the kettle. I flipped the switch, listening to the water boil. You know, you have a spy on your ship, Admiral, I said. Someone informed Marcus that Dr. Umbert was dead before we docked. Sergeant Conrad, she said. I thought it best to have someone inside Marcus's camp so it would be easier to deal with him if the time came. By deal, do you mean kill him? Kim asked. For a moment, I thought she wasn't going to answer. My duty is to humanity and to my crew, she said. I still hold that oath, dear. Had Marcus won, then the island would have been divided. Thus, it would have been simpler to work out who to take with us and who to leave behind. You weren't planning on invading? I asked. Of course not. What would be the point? That's what I thought, you see, that you were setting up Marcus for failure and that you come sailing in to rescue the survivors on the island. I promised my crew I would take them home, she said. That promise is what holds us together. It has to be fulfilled. What about the plane? I asked. Are you really aiming to fly it between Maine and Newfoundland? If we still have fuel, the Admiral said, the best case scenario is that we have eighteen months on this island, though that requires us shutting down the power plant today. Eighteen months without light, refrigeration, mains water, and all the other luxuries that turn drudgery into life. If we don't shut it down now, we'll be forced to before the end of winter. If we're lucky, we might have a month of grace before we have to flee, though that month will be spent in darkness. Those are the best-case scenarios. The worst case is that we've already left it too late. When that plan fails, we'll have hours to flee, perhaps only minutes. Most of the smaller craft, those now dragged up above the high water mark, were on the verge of sinking. The rest were in danger of being lost in the next storm. If we leave them in the water, we may lose them before they are needed. If the disaster comes while our larger ships are at sea, those who escape by plane might be the only people who survive. There isn't room on that plane for all the children on this island, but there is room for all who would make it to the airfield in time. At present, the only other clear runway we know of is in Belfast. The people I left in the city are preparing for its arrival and for their rescue. But Belfast would only be a temporary refuge. Whoever survived, whether by ship, plane, or luck, would have to carve out an existence on Svalbard or at Elysium, and we would just have to pray that they can outlast the undead. Yeah, we can hope that we have months, but I have to prepare for the worst case in which we only have minutes. That plane represents the least we can do to give our species some chance at existence. I hope that we can do more. I hope that I can fly it to Canada and then home and that I can use it to find more survivors and perhaps even a refuge for us all. Hope won't save us. Planning might. This is too big a secret, Shalto said. Like a Prometheus, an archangel at the world those two delivered. The apocalypse was the product of secrets and lies and schemes. You're hardly innocent on that score, George said. Mary tutted. Sorry. We shall tell people, Mary said. It was never my intention to keep this from them. But whether we scatter to the four winds or depart together, if we do so as individuals now, at the beginning of winter, then most will die. How long will you wait before you tell everyone? Kim asked. No more than a week, I said. Maybe we shouldn't tell them how long you've known about this. It might get Marcus to change his mind about stepping aside. On which note, there's no point delaying the election any further. It's been brought forward once. Let's do it again and get it over with. We'll get some legitimacy for those cabinet posts. When we announce the results, we can also announce that there'll be a public meeting to formally discuss Bishop and his flock. Instead, you can reveal the problems with the reactor. If nothing else, this new crisis should get Marcus to stay off his soapbox for a while. That leaves the question of who will lead us, Mary said. Haven't you heard? I asked. Marcus said he was stepping down in favor of you. You're to be a steady hand on the tiller as we navigate this sea of troubles, Kim said. 
That's what Marcus told everyone. Mary sighed. I had heard, she said. I was hoping. She trailed off and met my eyes. There was a genuine longing in her face an aching tiredness for which I'd have felt sympathy if it hadn't been for the revelations of a moment before. Until we hold another election, a proper election, you're it, I said. The contest for the cabinet posts can still go ahead, and that should give the illusion of legitimacy until we find something more permanent. We'll have to deal with Marcus too, but first, there are other people on Willow Farm. Dust off those judges, George. There'll have to be a trial. Captain? You'll need to hunt for evidence, at the pub at Willow Farm and at that caravan site. There was a middle-aged woman there, the one who was responsible for abducting both me and Lorraine. She was presenting evidence, and she had that evidence written down, I think. It might have the names of all those who died. I regret setting fire to that building now, but what's done is done. But we will need evidence because there is only one punishment for those complicit in that particular crime. And if the evidence has all been destroyed? Devine asked. Because I haven't found anything in that pub. Unless you want to press gang some into the Navy, Admiral, we'll move them to Menai Bridge. Some, at least, went to Willow Farm seeking an agricultural life. Heather Jones can provide it, and her modular indoor farm should make it easy to keep them under watch and apart from one another. That still leaves Marcus, the Admiral said. Leave him to me, Kim said. Everyone turned to look at her. She shrugged. What matters now is where we go and how we get there. Marcus is a distraction until we have a crime to pin on him and the evidence to prove his guilt. Until then, we have to contain him, yes? Make sure he doesn't create a new power base. I think I know how. Oh? Mary asked and I was just as curious. In an investigation you ask for known associates, yes? Kim asked, looking at the captain. Devine nodded. Then that's what we do. We write down the name of everyone who speaks to Marcus, everyone who goes to his pub, and for how long they're there. We do it publicly and meticulously, and we say it's for his own safety. After all, our other two candidates died, didn't they? That's how I'll start, anyway. That should stem the immediate crisis, I said. We can reconvene this evening to discuss the power plant and where we're to move to. You raised a valid point, Admiral. We don't have enough ships. I hate to even suggest it, but finding survivors is no longer as important as finding more boats in which we can save the people here. Large ones. Ones like the New World, I, uh... I stopped. When Rob fled Elysium, he took two sheets of paper with him. One had the address of that house in Palace Kenry, the other was a list of numbers. We've no idea what they mean. Captain Keynes of the New World said something about a woman who came from Elysium, someone who got bitten, but who was bringing a file to the ship. The file was left somewhere out in the wasteland near the ship. Keynes said it was evidence that proved Quigley's guilt, Kim said. What if it was something more? I said. Before she died, Rachel said something about a secret that Soraka Locke knew. Well, what if there was one? Kempton prepared for a nuclear war and planned to survive after it. Not just her, but her people. She had a ship, these readouts dotted around the world, and a fallout shelter in Belfast. They would help her survive the first year, but surely she made plans for what came next. We should investigate Elysium properly. See if there's a clue as to where she might have stockpiled other resources. Then we should consider locating the other redoubts. It all comes down to the undead, the Admiral said. If they are dying, then the world is ours. We could relocate to a coal-fired mining town in Virginia. We're not going to pick a destination out of a hat, George said. Bill's right. First we're going to need the ships. Before that, we've got to address the people. There's got to be at least a hundred outside now. That's a task for you, Mary, I said. Me, I have an account to write. And I did tell Marcus I wouldn't implicate him in Bishop's madness, but I didn't say I'd exonerate him from his own crimes. And that is what I did.
I wrote an account of what happened. If you read it, then what you read was true. But it wasn't the complete truth, and that is why I wrote this. I don't know if this account will be read, who will read it, or where, when it is read, humanity will call its home. I'm mindful of what Dr. Umbert said about the future and the past. We are at a crossroads now, with a million different branches at our feet, most of which will take our species to its doom. In a hundred years, if there are people alive who can debate whether we chose the correct path, it will look like a straight line. To me, now, it's anything but. We could go almost anywhere. But here on Anglesey, we have survivors from almost everywhere on the globe. We've seen recent satellite images of New York. We've traveled to the Arctic and have the accounts of the Admiral's escape from North Africa. Yes, we could go almost anywhere. But we know of nowhere that we will be safe. Yet there is no safety in remaining here. We have to leave. And so we shall. Under very different circumstances, when I was a very different person, I planned the evacuation of a nation. It failed. This next one can't, for well, that is what it is. That is the task ahead of me. Except, this time, it is not the fate of a nation at stake. It is the fate of our entire species. We need ships, we need the oil from Svalbard, we need a destination. When we leave, we will have to take everything we need with us for we don't know whether we'll find them again. There are some things we should leave behind, some ideas that we could do without, but not people, not even Marcus or those from Willow Farm. The outbreak and our survival since has taught us that the road to redemption is a long one, but it is one that we all deserve a chance to walk. That is the account of the events leading up to our election, and I will end it here, though I won't put down my pen. I must plan another evacuation. This time, it can't fail. To be continued. This has been Surviving the Evacuation, Book 10, The Last Candidate, written by Frank Tail, narrated by Tim Bruce. Copyright 2017 by Frank Tail. Production copyright 2017 by Frank Tail. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.